house. We could grow enough food to feed everybody in a six-block radius year-round. You could do almost that well on top of your apartment building. You wouldn't need to haul a lot of heavy soil up there either. Tomatoes will grow like weeds in shredded wet newspaper. I can't make Porsche payments with tomatoes. True, and you can't drive a Porsche underwater. What is this underwater stuff? My accounts are underwater. That's all I care about. His club soda arrives. You expecting a great flood or something? If I'm not mistaken, the Bible says it'll be fire next time. The martini is tasty, but this conversation seems to be constantly veering off track. So it does, and so it shall. But fire is the flip side of water, and a big back has a big front. Yeah, I know. Still, it beguiles you in ways that most of the conversations you've had in the bull and bear have not. Listen, my little hop toad, I'm about to make you a proposition. I thought you already had. I'm going to the men's room. Not with me, you're not. I'm going to the restroom. You just got back. In my absence, I'd like you to do two things. First, order us some dinner. The kitchen will be closing soon, and we can't live on love alone. Then I want you to make a decision. When I come back, I'll talk with you about your ill-chosen and ill-fated career. I'll pass along any and every tedious tidbit at my disposal that might be of use to a desperate soul who screwed up royally in a profession that screwed up royally. Or, or, I'll expend the same amount of time and energy to tell you a few things that are really interesting and really important. Knowledge that may turn out to be considerably more empowering to you than an MBA. Or maybe not. In any case, it's your choice. One or the other. It's up to you. With that, he rises and long hair swinging, hobbles, lurches, and weaves away. Like an animal who's been stung in the hams with a tranquilizer dart. 9.04 p.m. I'll have the vegetable stir-fry, but without asparagus. Repeat, no asparagus. I get the picture, says Brian, a, a bit too snippishly for an underling. And what will Mr. D be having this evening? Uh, Mr. D will have, um, I think Mr. D would like... This is wicked, but you can't help yourself. Bring Mr. D the frog legs. 9.05 p.m. There is an exaltation about the bull and bear that is due not only to its decor, darkly warm, weighty, polished, aged, and its clientele, well-groomed, smartly tailored, educated, savvy, but also to its function as a refuge from chaos, the controlled chaos of the financial markets and increasingly the far less predictable chaos of the streets. In the outside world, civilization is frequently and perhaps accurately perceived as a thin veneer over the rant and scrabble of an essentially savage species. In the bull and bear, conversely, the slosh and bluster seems a thin veneer of atavism over a bedrock of refinement and order. That part of America that remains affluent, that is neither on fire nor on sale, neither shot full of holes nor rusting away, that affluent part appears many places to be tricky and dazed. Here in this citadel, however, no matter how noisy, smoky, or unruly it may at certain hours of the day become, the stability and calm traditionally bestowed by Buddha the banker somehow has prevailed. Ever since you discovered the establishment while on lunch break from the ski department at Nordstrom a half dozen years ago, the bull and bear's mystique has had a powerful hold on you. Tonight, you feel it slipping away. You sense an odd, almost poignant alienation from the knot of brokers across the lounge. They are unusually restrained this evening. Their concentration focused on their anesthetic beakers of booze and on the screen of the bar TV. There is a silent communion among them, however, in which you suspect you would not share 
even were you to press your taut little belly to the bar. They are watching the financial channel, no doubt, and you wonder if you might be missing something of import. All you can see from your table is a dancing miasma of red and green, like an atomized Christmas wreath. You simply must get your eyes examined. Stock quotations, like the scriptures, are a common source of optic erosion. Those tiny names and numbers, so difficult to read, so fraught with secret salvations, if only the eye muscles could pry them loose. Some portion of the poignancy that is seizing you may be attributed to the fact that your bladder is brimming. You hadn't wished to go to the bathroom at the same time as Larry Diamond, lest he perceive and celebrate a repulsive intimacy in the synchronized discharge of wastes. But you can delay no longer. Passing the bar as unobtrusively as possible, you steal a look at the TV screen. What your colleagues are watching, it turns out, is a Latino horror movie about a vampire mariachi band. No wonder there is an excess of green and red. When these musicians stroll through the plazas of nighttime Tijuana, they give a whole new dimension to Besame Mucho. 9.08 p.m. There is an electrical problem in the women's room. It is as black as outer space in there, and the light switch flips up and down uselessly like the lips of the president. Oh well, pity the woman who cannot pee in the dark. Having grown up in a household where the power was routinely shut off due to non-payment, you are practiced in the art of locating toilet seats by touch and feel. Once the target has been locked in, the compact urinary jet of the female, unlike the helter-skelter garden hose of its male counterpart, can fire with almost pinpoint precision. It is appropriate, you are forced to admit, to be sitting in literal darkness since, after all, you have been in the figurative dark for about three days. Were it not for its overtones of outsider ignorance, or is it the masses who usually are left in the dark, a certain cheery comfort might be derived from the blackout. Darkness can protect as well as threaten. Of course, there is a limit to how long you can enjoy asylum in the ladies' room. And when at last you leave, you must take a decision with you. Not that there is really much to decide. Or is there? When the last note of water music has subsided, you dab your little valve with tissue and, still seated, lean against the right panel of the stall. Of the many bat-like rumors circling the ruins of the market, the one that seems to want to hang upside down from the rafters of your cranium is a scenario that has the Arabs reducing the ruins to rubble by further raising the price of oil. Then, when the market has sustained all the damage it can endure without being obliterated, the sheiks will come in with the vault loads of petrodollars they've been hoarding and buy out the store. Then they will lower oil prices to today's levels or below and stand at the top of the stairs to watch the indexes climb to greet them, oozing megabucks from every pore. It makes sense. And there has to be a way for a smart cookie like you to grab a little bitty piece of that bonanza by going long on oil futures, for example. But you would have to buy on margin, and you would probably have to buy in London, preferably late tomorrow night, as soon as trading reopens in Europe. You lack the faculty to buy without resources. You lack the skills to buy abroad on short notice. Larry Diamond, on the other hand, if he is the wizard he is cracked up to be. Diamond, unfortunately, has a different agenda. He wants to fuck you. Were it not for the wine and gin, you could not even think that word. The word that leaves a salty ring around your brain like the scum line in a bathtub. But that's only part of it. He is challenging you in areas that have little or nothing to do with sex. Your daddy used to tell you bedtime stories, accompanying himself on the bongo drums. His favorite story, though not necessarily yours, was Jack and the Beanstalk. It was really something the way he could make those drums say, Fee-fi-fo-fum. As you grew older, the bedtime entertainment petered out, but one night when you were nine, or maybe ten, he told Jack and the Beanstalk one last time. You listened dutifully although you were somewhat embarrassed. 
When he ended the tale with a loud, squashed, giant blop on a drumhead, he said, This a smart story, Squeak. This a lesson story. Person learn righteous things from this story, man. You keep it with you. He slapped you a high five and left the room, off to a club or a party. In the morning, you asked your mother what he might have meant. I think, she replied, that he means that you should never hesitate to trade your cow for a handful of magic beans. On the way to school, you considered and rejected the fatherly advice. Why not milk the cow, you reasoned, and exchange a pail of milk for just one or two of the beans? That way you get to keep the cow. And how many magic beans does a person really need? Well, you have left the barn door unlatched, and a storm has blown it open. Your cow has run away. You want to chase after it, to entice it home, or force it home. Larry Diamond is urging you to let it go. Cows are of no consequence, he is saying. Here, forget the cow and accept these magic beans. Diamond is daring you to become a part of something totally unfamiliar, to move outside the realm of normal expectations. It intrigues you, primarily because he doesn't want a cow in return. But he obviously wants. Is it merely sex he wants or something other? And how can you be sure his beans will grow? They might be jelly beans or jumping beans or pellets of poison. On the toilet seat, you shift your weight from your right to your left buttock. Now your head and shoulder are resting against the left panel of the stall. In your bloodstream, molecules of wine and gin wander cartwheeling, singing like a troop of minstrels. A few more drops dribble out of your urethra. Your challenge, as you see it, is to convince Diamond to lasso your cow, plus fork over a bean or two without your having to sleep with him. An alcohol bubble bumps against your libido and bounces impishly along its unguarded surface. Sleeping with Diamond might be, well, a consideration at least, if... If you could be assured, he wasn't responsible in some dire way for Cujo's hiatus. A sudden finger of light juts into the restroom. Two fingers. Three fingers. Widening. Four fingers. Five. A creak follows. And finger by finger, the hand of illumination balls up with a click into a fist. The door has opened and shut. You sense someone standing just inside the room, perhaps futilely flicking the wall switch. Undoubtedly, it is Anne Louise, or the single other woman from the group at the bar. You clear your throat and rattle the toilet paper dispenser to signal that the stall is occupied. How awful if Anne Louise were to back into the dark and plop her wanton fanny down on top of you. The person walks farther into the room, and you realize, with a chill that the footsteps, heavy, flat, wide-spaced, spikeless, are those of a man. 9.13 p.m. The steps advance to the stall door, latchless and none too snug, and stop. There is no sound beyond breathing. Yours. His. Slowly you pull up your panties, realizing with a shock and a tingle that were the man to speak, were it Diamond's voice, and were that voice tender and reassuring, you might leave them down. He does not whisper your name, nor does he move. He only breathes. You can no longer hear your own breath. It is corked, like a ferment of oxygen, like a distilled scream in the jug of your lungs. His breathing is slow and even, and the ordinariness of its rhythms, the absence of rasp or rush or thickness, makes it all the more menacing. Minutes pass. Panic throbs in you like a gypsy guitar. From the purse at your feet, which are only inches from his feet, you withdraw your canister of mace. What kind of world is this, you think? What kind of world? Then, without a word... He turns, walks leisurely to the door, and exits. 
leaving behind a faint smell of burnt sugar. You take several minutes to compose yourself before following him out. Once your eyes have reaccustomed themselves to the light, you scan the lounge. Nothing has changed. The bartender tends bar. The waiter waits. The bookies, absorbed in the movie, mariachi vampires are serenading a honeymoon couple from Brooklyn, don't so much as blink as you wobble by. Larry Diamond is at the table. Started without you, he says. Hope you don't mind. He is eating the vegetable stir-fry. 9.23 p.m. Onions with their pearl-skin layers, like the pages of newspapers published by oysters. Baby carrots, orange and droopy, imitating the mustachios of Yosemite Sam. Green pea pods, the detached spines of elves. Broccoli boutonnieres, plucked from the mildewed lapels of dandified swamp things. Sliced sweet peppers, yellow and red, vaulted and naved, like the cross-sections of Caribbean cathedrals. Zucchini, poor Italian, wearing its envy of eggplant on its sleeve. Button mushrooms, but what do they button? Dirt's clown suit, the meadows fly. One thinks of Satan undressing his bride. Beats as intense as serial killers, celery as stringy as soundtrack orchestras, sesame seeds as blank as the eyes of termite queens. One by one, Diamond forks vegetable pieces into his mouth while you avert your gaze from the plate you have inherited and try to get a grip on yourself. From time to time, Diamond looks at you quizzically, but he doesn't ask for your decision or why you haven't bitten into the leg of a frog. If it was he who terrorized you in the ladies' room, he certainly isn't gloating over it. He forks, he chews, he glances at you quizzically until eventually... Because you feel pressured by the silence, you sigh and say, Larry, do you think George Washington flossed with an awl? Diamond doesn't miss a beat. Guiding a broccoli floret towards his chops, he says, If the father of our country was reduced to such a thing, he had only Christianity to blame. Sorry? Christianity, he says. The enemy of the teeth as well as the clitoris and the brain. Enemy of the teeth, you ask, hoping he will drop the clitoris part. Dentistry was already a fairly sophisticated science in ancient Egypt. There are mummies with fillings in their teeth, with root canals and bridge work for crying out loud. He chews broccoli while you think, good news for cloned pharaohs, they can go right from the sarcophagus to a steakhouse. Jews considered such practices a form of mutilation, and our European Christian ancestors believed it was blasphemous to mess with the Almighty's handiwork, we being created in his own image, overbite and all. Never mind that their molars ached. That was a result of sin or the mischief of demons. By the time the King James Version of the Bible hit the stands in 16-whatever it was, dentistry in the English-speaking world was a rustic joke, which is why 4,000 years after Imhotep got his cavities filled, the President of the United States was forced to replace his troubled teeth with blunt objects carved out of a fallen log. The Christians crucified dental science just like they nailed up astronomy. You know what happened to Copernicus and Galileo and the rest of the human race's intellectual and artistic progress? Yes, indeed. It was a bishop of the Church of Rome who burned the great library at Alexandria because he was uncomfortable with the reminder on such a grand scale that there were successful human enterprises that predated Jesus. You have any appreciation of what was lost in that fire? The science, the records, the scholarship, the wisdom, the literature? Our understanding of the past and what it may portend for the future was irreparably sabotaged by arrogant Christian firebugs. 
The second greatest library in the world happened to be in Timbuktu, and it was torched by Islamic revisionists for the very same reason. Let history begin with Muhammad. If these religious assholes were really convinced of the power and the truth of their big boohoos, why are they so scared by historical fact, by thought, by knowledge? He jabs the prongs of his fork into a pea pod. That's a rhetorical question. Get on with your din-din. If chickens played basketball, their drumsticks would look like the deep-fried appendages on the platter in front of you. Long, graceful, athletically bent. Good thing the feet are missing. They probably would be sporting a little pair of Nikes. Obviously, Diamond can see that you haven't touched them. Whether it's about their finances or about their souls, you venture, most people tend to be a bit insecure. But you have absolutely no sympathy for them, do you? Haven't you ever experienced insecurity? Insecurity? Me? He forces the words through pea pulp. Constantly. Every waking moment of every day, and probably when I'm snoozing. There's no such thing as security in this life, sweetheart. And the sooner you accept that fact, the better off you'll be. The person who strives for security will never be free. The person who believes she's found security will never reach paradise. What she mistakes for security is purgatory. You know what purgatory is, Gwendolyn? It's the waiting room. It's the lobby. Not only does she have the wrong libretto, she's stuck in the lobby where she can't see the show. That might not be all bad. What if the show's a dog? Jesus, that poor, penniless wretch whose failed attempts to reform Judaism to make it less commercial and corrupt, have been exploited into the biggest, most profitable business in history. How'd you like to have bought Christianity, my dear, when it was selling for a shekel a share? Uh, old Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is spread upon the earth, but men do not see it. Personally, I suspect the kingdom of heaven has got to be a pretty hot show, although I admit it, the reviews have been sketchy. Even if it's a flop, it beats waiting in the lobby. At least you can reach your own conclusions. But first you have to claim your seat and have a look. Everybody's waiting for something. Yeah, and everybody's got to stop it. It's making them crazy. Worse, it's making them mediocre. Even the Dogon, the Bozo. They're waiting for the Nomo and growing more pedestrian with each passing decade in the same way other nitwits are waiting for the Messiah. He stabs a carrot, which is worse, having a boil lanced or sitting in the doctor's waiting room hour after hour, filling out forms, thumbing through those out-of-date magazines, sneezers and coughers spraying microbic wildlife at you, Babies howling, hard luck stories being traded like baseball cards. Better to be in the examination room learning the boil is actually a cancer than waiting your life away with unhappy companions on plastic-covered furniture. Purgatory is not only inferior to heaven, it's worse than hell. As he shoves the carrot into his thin smile like a cartridge being shoved into the chamber of an antique rifle, you say, We both know what I'm waiting for. Among other things, for me to stop pontificating. But how about you? Is there something you're waiting for, Larry? Among other things, for me to stop pontificating. And what else? Well, short term, I suppose my breath's baited for your decision. Which is it going to be, Coco Eyes? Wisdom? A steady employment. You sit up straight and push aside the frog leg platter. Larry, you're going to be very disappointed in me. However, I... You are interrupted by a loud murmuring from the area of the bar. Oh, shit! Somebody exclaims. Can you believe it? Exclaims another. Even those customers who had not been watching the movie are fixed now on the television screen, where the picture and sound have changed drastically. Mexican music and coffin lid creaks have been replaced by the excited but controlled voice of a reporter. 
The color has gone from gore red and vampire green to tints of gray and beige. Blurred by the contracting muscles of your myopia, images are indistinct, although you can tell from the infrequency of the flicker that the footage is too static to be yet another gang skirmish or inner-city riot. Impulsively, you rise and glide over to the bar. 9.30 p.m. To your credit, perhaps, your first thoughts are of Cujo. What if her decapitated body has been found in a dumpster? But no station would interrupt its Saturday night movie to report on a messy bit of business that has become fairly commonplace in America. And anyway, the reaction of the bookies indicates news with financial repercussions. This spurs you to move closer yet. The bulletin, you soon learn, involves Motofusa Yamaguchi. The doctor, it seems, returned from an early dinner a short time ago to find that his hotel suite had been burglarized. Missing in the robbery is a device or instrument, not specifically described, said to be absolutely indispensable to Yamaguchi's cancer cure. Without it, his appearance at the conference on Monday would be pointless. His life's work curtailed, if not ruined. There goes the Nikkei, a broker says. There goes the Nikkei, the Hang Seng, the DAX, the Credit Suisse, the Bourse CAC, the FTSE 100, elaborates another, his voice trailing off in despair. Repeatedly, the camera pans the crime scene, a crowded, only moderately disarranged luxury suite in the corner of which Dr. Yamaguchi can be seen speaking with detectives, shrugging, shyly smiling, tapping his front teeth with a bick. Doc doesn't look all that upset, says Anne Louise, for a guy whose bird has flown. They're inscrutable, you know. The whole thing could be a setup. I mean, from the get-go, I for one was never convinced he had a cancer cure in the first place. Oh, come on, Joel. What'd be the point of a hoax? Woof, barks Joel. The movie resumes, but the brokers have lost interest in fangs and frijoles. There is a hubbub about the bar, everyone, except you, talking at once. I'd enjoy hearing Larry Diamond's take on this, Anne Louise says rather loudly. But apparently Miss Matty here has screwed his brains out. Everyone, including you, follows her gesture. Diamond is leaning back in his chair with his eyes shut, looking pale and insensate. Anne Louise lowers her voice to a stage whisper. Did you see him earlier? The poor stud could barely walk. There is a round of dirty laughter, but by the time you have tossed your head, gray strands and all, and stalked half the distance to your table, the talk has returned to the Yamaguchi robbery. There'll be no shortage of suspects, you hear a bookie say. Pharmaceutical houses, the National Cancer Institute, any number of terrorist organizations, including the AMA. Larry, are you all right? The beads of sweat on his forehead are bigger than bugs. Some of them scatter when he opens his eyes. Fit as a fiddle, he says weakly. Then in a stronger voice, let's get out of here. From his chewed-up jeans, he pulls a roll of bills one could open a Texas S&L with, peels off three fifties, drops them on the bread basket, and throws his leather jacket about his shoulders like a cape. You can tell he is struggling to walk normally. Hey, Larry, got a second? Larry, can I ask you? A chorus of Larry this and Larry that rings out as the two of you approach the bar. Again, he pulls out that beautiful tumbleweed of cash, wads another fifty, and tosses it to the bartender. Poorer of some hopes, but freer of some illusions, he says cheerfully. Drinks are on me. But Larry, do you believe? I believe that Buddha was a frog, and the frog is Buddha. Look at frogs meditating on their pads and tell me they aren't monks. A hush falls over the bookies. They step aside to let him pass. Mother Mary may have been a frog as well. That would explain the Immaculate Conception. Diamond starts toward the door, you on his heels. As you brush by Anne Louise, your hand shoots out and grabs her nose. You twist it until it feels like a gum wrapper between your fingers, and she yows with pain. It would have been a great exit a potential candidate for the Exit Hall of Fame, 
except that TV spoils it, as TV has spoiled so much. Diamond, mumbling something about baby Jesus being a tadpole, has taken only three or four steps. You have barely let go of Anne Louise's crumpled snout when another news bulletin snuffs a sombrero bloodsucker in mid-bite. With a mixture of relief, amusement, and annoyance, the reporter comes on camera to announce that Yamaguchi's anti-cancer device has been recovered. It was in his room, all along, under the bed. Unofficially, police are saying Dr. Yamaguchi consumed a couple too many cups of sake at dinner. And when he came back to his hotel, he knocked over a table with his attaché case on it, and the instrument rolled under the bed. Looking rather sheepish, Yamaguchi is shown holding up an object that resembles a translucent twig. The brokers shush Anne Louise, who is hysterical, so they may hear more clearly what the doctor has to say for himself. But Yamaguchi just sways from side to side and giggles. The guy's fried, for God's sake, the bookie from Payne Webber says with disgust. So we're well on the way ourselves. Yeah, but we're not famous scientists. We're not some genius who's supposed to have a cure for cancer. The guy the world's counting on. Precisely, I don't trust that flaky nip. If we get a strong opening in the foreign markets tomorrow night, they'll smooch him where the rising sun don't rise. Did you see what that little slut did? And Louise is sobbing and rubbing her nose, but nobody is paying attention. The father's a frog, the son's a tadpole, the Holy Ghost is swamp gas, announces Larry Diamond. He grabs your hand, and with him tugging you along, you complete your exit. 9.42 p.m. On the street, Diamond is beaming again. He pitches a coin to an armless woman, who catches it in her cleavage. It drops through and rolls south on 6th Avenue. The rich boy stole my brassiere she explains. She chases the coin down and snatches it up with her teeth. Diamond's face, which at times can be frighteningly fierce, is radiant now, with an unearthly joy. The way things keep changing, back and forth, back and forth, you feel like Alice in Wonderland. He has your hand in his. A waning but still yeasty moon bumps its golden beer belly, against the more ascetic solar plexus of city shine. Although the cool, dry air ripples with siren and shriek and car alarm, you can hear somewhere a Jew's harp playing Strangers in the Night. Diamond is either drawing you into his embrace, or your feet have become toy trucks, wound up tight and pointed in his direction. You close your eyes as your face nears his. If you was to eat dog shit and then shit it out, would you have dog shit or human shit? Good grief. You reach in your purse, fully intent on treating the royally appointed vagrant to a taste of good American mace, but Diamond looks the queen's wino in the eye and says sincerely, I believe it would depend upon the sauce. The little man tilts his derby in salute. And the wine as well? Hmm. An interesting solution, governor. To a perplexing problem. With a wince of pain, Diamond straddles a Vespa. Climb aboard, he says. I'll give you a lift to your car. The Queen's wino snares the coin that he flips. You're going then? Appears I'm waiting for something after all, he says. I'm waiting to make contact with Dr. Yamaguchi, and I can't wait a whole lot longer. What is it, Larry? You are talking to the back of his head as the motor scooter bounces over the curb and into traffic, or what there is of traffic in the financial district after business hours. Just another hard luck story. And unfortunately, one of the more unromantic ones. You have cancer, don't you? I was the guy who went in to get the boil lanced. Of the colon? Of the rectum. Oh, Larry. I warned you it held a minimum of romance. Larry, I'm so sorry. Oh, if it isn't one thing, it's another. Something's always trying to knock us off the pad. Twister's father, wide place in the road, has been treating me, and up to now the tumor's been under control. This evening, however, the little dickens let its hair down. 
decided to rock and roll. He parks his scooter alongside your Porsche, but you stay aboard. Why didn't you tell me? It's awful. What can you do? Yamaguchi holds the trump card. I have to wait for him to play it. Meanwhile, he lowers his lids lasciviously. Would you like to come over to Thunder House and see my slides of Timbuktu? For better or for worse, out of career ambition, passion, compassion, or general confusion, you have every intention of saying yes. But when he turns and leans his face into yours, as you brace for his kiss, his breath envelops you in an effluvium of burnt sugar, the exact confectionery aroma the intruder brought into the ladies' room. You pull away and dismount. I've, ah, uh, ah, uh, got to check on Kyujo, you stammer. Got to notify the police if she's not back. Call around the hospital, stuff like that. Although you do not mention it, you also need to call a certain party in San Francisco. Belford is probably eating his knuckles by now. Diamond smiles. Doubtlessly a wise decision. I wish you luck. He guns the Vespa. Thanks for a lovely evening. Too bad you didn't partake of the frog's legs, though. As he speeds away, still talking, you catch the words Easter, Host, and Holy Communion. 10 p.m. It is indicative of your state of mind that you drive past Continental Place without bothering to gaze up at the ninth-floor windows of the luxury condominium that you have so coveted and for which you must deliver a down payment within a week or else lose it and your earnest money to boot. You feel as if your brain, which only a few days ago sat like a well-fed hen on a nest of warm numbers, hatching schemes and clucking in waltz time, has been painted with radium and smacked with a fly swatter. It is a wonder you find your way home. After ascertaining that Kujo remains at large, you telephone the Missing Persons Bureau at police headquarters and are left on hold so long three more of your hairs turn gray. Eventually, you are permitted to file a preliminary report, although you must appear in person on Monday before it can officially become a case. You reach Belford Dunn in his room, almost out of breath from pacing the carpet. In an effort to tint a black lie, a whiter shade of pale, you relate that while there has been no real sign of Andre, you think you might have heard him in the maple tree outside your window. When Belford gets excited and threatens to fly home at once, you backtrack and say it could have been a raccoon or your imagination. You urge him to stay on for the interdenominational sunrise service in Golden Gate Park and for the meeting with a French consulate flunky whom the consul general, distracted and rather inebriated when Belford finally intercepted him in Sonoma, promised to send by the hotel on Sunday afternoon. Are you tired, Gwen? You sound, I don't know, funny. Must be this PMS. The sarcasm eludes him. Oh, dear, I should have remembered. Poor baby, I'm sorry. Good grief. You kick off your shoes and flop onto the bed, landing, of course, among millions of mites. Had you any inkling that your bedding was alive with arthropodic crablets, chomping away on the flakes of your dead skin, you would be so disgusted you would probably choose to lie on the floor. Yet every one of us, including the rich, the pious, and the royal of blood, sleeps each night in colonies of such mites. The ultimate witnesses, the most intimate voyeurs, these mites. What books they might author, what tales they could tell. Imagine the memoirs of a multitude of minuscule Malcolm Lowrys, expatriates in a Martex, Mexico, soused on dandruff tequila, living and writing under the volcano of love. Jolted by mattress quakes, buried by thigh slides, swept away by flash floods of seminal lava, they cling to the linen with their petite pincers, recording with literary objectivity our orgasms, our fevers, our pillow talk, our dreams. Who knows more of our secrets? Who? Nightly, and often by day, they sail with us in the lunar barge, 
their flake steaks marinated in our tear water, their breakfast boiled in our sweat, the winds of our farting at play in their hair. They are familiar with wife and mistress, husband and lover, hot water bottle and fetish, favorite sitcom and favorite drug, have memorized confession, recrimination, prayer, delirium, and that sweet name we cry out in our sleep. Our babies are conceived and born in their midst. Our parents, and someday we ourselves, die in what passes for their arms. Yes, all this. But the mites do not betray us. If they gossip, it is only among themselves. Perhaps they see an order in our messy bed lives, our tossings and turnings, moans and nightmares, snacks and snores, and trading of partners that we have not discovered yet. Perhaps they regard us as glorious even, as agents of the raw miraculous, capable at any moment, not in spite of our folly, but because of it, of a transcendence that exceeds transformance, as a rule, we do not sing in our beds. We have no need. The mites sing for us, sing of us. They are our Greek chorus, our geek chorus, choirs of microscopic angels ever ready to dance on the head of a pin. Their appetites are ghoulish, their hunger divine. They are what they eat. Excerpt from a bed mite tome. Shortly before eleven, on the night before Easter, our hostess, Gwendolyn Maddy, fully clothed, unfortunately, lay herself down in our city to gather her wits, to collect her thoughts, to sort things out, things ranging from rectal cancer to sugary aromas, from missing friends to the possible demise of that powerful and enduring conviction that every generation of Americans could and would move beyond the social and economic station of its predecessor. However, being chaotic, overwhelmed, worried, frazzled, exhausted, severely disappointed, yet strangely free, her various thoughts coagulated, her mind went to test pattern, and she slipped rather quickly into slumber. Within minutes, she commenced to dream. A voice spoke to her in her dream, spoke so loudly and distinctly, although it dragged its syllables contemptuously through its proboscis in the manner of that bulbous old comedian on the late, late show, that we heard it above our traffic and crunching as clearly as if it were there in the sheets. Startled, Miss Matty reared up in bed, and in a low, wondering whisper, she repeated the statement we had all overheard. The fool's journey ends on serious sea. Sunday morning, April 8th. Whither the Amphibians? 5.30 a.m. Bandaged in dirty clouds and seeping like rabbit milk from a wound in its side, the sun rolls a stone from the tomb of night to emerge, pale, blinking, but triumphant, into Easter's yard, somewhere between Coca-Cola and IBM. As you become more fully conscious, and it dawns in you what day this is, your spirits are both gilded with hopes of resurrection and shaded by fears of sacrificial death. And this in spite of the fact that, thanks to Q. Joe Huffington, Easter is a cipher to you now, another round hole into which the square peg of your conditioning cannot fit. According to Q. Joe, Easter was an ancient pagan festival named for the Saxon goddess Eostra. Eostra being a regional pronunciation of Astarte, the principal creator-destroyer worshipped by Indo-European cultures for tens of thousands of years. Mother Nature, in her fundamental, unexpurgated, paradoxical, bud-spouting, blood-guzzling guise. Well, that old business, gone and good riddance, is to your taste thoroughly barbaric, not to mention funky. It has the whiff of the atavistically agrarian about it, 
of wet wool after birth, wood smoke and dung heap, and sweat, tubs of stinking sweat, sweat of horse, sweat of husband, sweat of brutal labor and crude, unromantic coupling. Furthermore, if one is not a puppet of the church, as you, much to Belford's chagrin, clearly are not, one would have to be pretty cynical to believe that early Christian spin doctors appropriated the Eostra festival in an effort both to usurp the charm it held for the peasant population and to weigh in with a manufactured miracle. Oh, it might ring true to Larry Diamond, him with his rants about dental suppression and torched libraries in Africa somewhere. Diamond and Kujo are rather alike in that regard. One thing about Kujo, however, she's not one of those ninnies who goes about proclaiming that if we would only force God to submit to a sex change operation, everything would be cake and pie in the land. Her opposition to Latter-day Goddess worship is the main reason the Huff has so few friends among others in her field. She contends that the divine is no more female than male, that it is without gender, beyond gender, that while it may have its male and female aspects, those are merely two facets of the infinitely faceted infinitude it presents to the world, and that any impulse to ascribe gender to the divine is a foolish display of chauvinism that vainly attempts to place limits on that which is limitless, or worse to that effect. She makes sense on a certain level, you suppose, but why would people want to agitate themselves with unanswerable questions long out of date, unless, of course, it's their version of Washington's teeth. There's trouble enough these days just eluding violence and servicing one's debt. Concepts of God, celebrations of his and or her holidays, have evolved over the centuries, have changed profoundly since their primitive beginnings, but the struggle to survive has remained constant. Survival. That's the bottom line, on Easter or any other day. The next line up is genteel survival. Survival with authority, comfort, and good taste. A goal far easier to imagine today than in Eostra's time, although, as recent events have demonstrated, still maddeningly elusive. Kujo also said, as long as you were on the subject, that if each of us in secret were allowed to ask God one question, absolutely nobody would ask, are you a man or a woman? Or, what colors your skin? Proving that issues of gender and race are ultimately trivial. Most likely, we would inquire of God, any chance of getting out of here alive? Where'll I be when I'm no longer around? Will I ever see so-and-so again? What's the punchline? Or, Cat got your tongue? Questions we rarely ask one another because our intellectual betters consider them sophomoric and because we are privately unconvinced that any mortal, including clergy, can provide encouraging answers based on more than circumstantial evidence. Well, it's too early in the morning for this nonsense, although you must say you feel surprisingly refreshed. You slept fully clothed. There was a voice in your head louder than any dream, and at some point in the night you woke up and masturbated for the first time in so long even the mites can't remember it. Traditionally, you have fantasized about Cary Grant while abusing yourself, but last night, when the white pony rode over the hill, you whispered a name that sounded suspiciously less like Cary than Larry an aberration you would just as soon forget. Yet you are not merely rested, but strengthened, prepared, you naively believe, for the events of the day. You patter to the kitchen to pour yourself a glass of tomato juice. Inside the refrigerator are what are left of the eggs you purchased for Belford's breakfast on Friday. Were there children in your building, you might donate the eggs to their little festivities. Maybe Q. Joe is right about Easter. What could the coloring and hiding of feminine fertility symbols possibly have to do with the drama surrounding the crucifixion of Christ? Unless, perhaps, omelets were served at the Last Supper. Think of it. The most famous meal in history 
and nobody has a clue what was on the menu. It must drive gourmets wild. You and your brother hunted eggs once in your parents' drafty downtown loft. That unlikely Easter bunny, Freddie Matty, painted them for you. Each one solidly, uniformly, existentially black. 5.50 a.m. One thing is as clear as the bath water in your sunrise soak. You have a choice between submitting to your fate, in which you will end up either a jobless pauper or a marriage license whore, or taking the offensive. The latter involves, as you see it, an oil futures play, betting that the price of crude will rise short term, decline long term, and placing that wager with the International Petroleum Exchange shortly after it opens for trading in London at 1 a.m. tomorrow, Seattle time. Should you elect to roll the petrol dice, there are a couple of possibilities. With Larry Diamond's help, you might be able to buy on margin, although since your credit is as thin as the gold on a pawn shop's balls, an electronic caper of that nature would be risky and a wee bit fraudulent. If it went awry somewhere, it could land you in the steel hotel. Considering your already shaky position, it would seem incumbent upon you to engage in a legitimate cash transaction. Of course, if your back were really to the wall... Nevertheless, you should investigate at least potential sources of cash. You glug an amber oyster of shampoo under your head, and by the time you have lathered half your black hairs and two-thirds of the gray ones, you have run through the list. 1. Were you to unload, at a loss, every remaining instrument in your personal account, you might raise, at the most, nine or ten grand. Peanuts. Pee-wee peanuts. Dwarf juice. And you are not referring to some condensation of Sirius B. 2. Belford, despite his foolhardy philanthropies, must still have funds salted away. He would have to. He is going to need money to live on while he is in school studying to be a stupid social worker. You would guess him to have upwards of a hundred, a hundred and fifty thou in a sweet little bank somewhere. But while he might be persuaded to part with a hunk of it to a threadbare, wild-eyed Lutheran missionary who recites Bible stories in a Midwestern monotone to the uninterested in, say, Timbuktu, fat chance of him lending any to you, although you would pay him back with interest in a matter of months, guaranteed. Three, lastly, there is Diamond himself. That was quite a wad he was flashing last night. The thing is, although he certainly is not ostentatious on any other level, it could have been a show roll. It could have been every cent he has in the world. With a loose cannon such as Diamond, one never knows. Like Milken and many of the other naughty boys of the 80s, the gifted bookies who were punished for being too good at capitalism for capitalism's own good, Diamond doubtlessly had many a fine sparkler concealed in his lunch bucket when he was bounced out of the emerald mine. True, he apparently has not worked in nearly a decade. He puts about on a rusty scooter, dresses like a grunge rocker, and lives under a bowling alley, but one could scarcely say conclusively or with conviction that he hasn't got a pretty pile of rubles in the cookie jar. Question is, would he be willing to do a deal with you? It is hard to imagine an old fire horse not responding to one last bell. Yet Diamond seems totally and genuinely absorbed with other interests, strange matters that bespeak a loss of practical faculties, the festerings of an infirm mind. He might even be dangerous to you personally. He is so, so sexual, and not in a responsible or judicious way. Furthermore, he is or is pretending to be seriously ill. Yet another complication. Face it, Belford is the safer bet all around. You have never actually approached Belford about a loan before, so you cannot automatically assume he would refuse. Besides, there are ways to soften him up. Conversation about your alleged future together, for example, never mind if the promises are vague, and something that might really throw open every duct in his oozing heart would be your delivery to him, safe and sound, of his 
AWOL macaque. To that end, you decide, as with a soapy sponge, you flush a tiny tumbleweed of lint from your belly button, a side effect of sleeping in one's clothes, that you must hasten to a store where you might make a substantial investment in popsicles of the banana-flavored ilk. Yes, you will load your freezer and your friend's freezers as well. You will reopen the transoms, yours and Cujo's, that you closed after yesterday's unlawful entries, and upon each transom you will deposit a popsicle as a lure. You will position banana popsicles on window ledges where they will glisten like the teeth of heavy smokers. So banana popsicles about balconies where they will glow like bug lights on a southern porch. Melting, they will perfume the neighborhood like one giant Harry Belafonte belch. And a certain little rascal, no more able to resist the musacious nose music than any model-building boy, will Tarantella yellow-lipped and sticky-furred into your waiting trap. With a final swipe of the sponge, you seal the self-addressed envelope between your legs. Then, toweled, powdered, creamed, dressed in gold-colored Christian Dior underwear, black medium-length wool skirt from Perry Ellis, and a navy blue Ralph Lauren sweater over a white silk shirt, you trot downstairs, only to be met at the front door by two very serious-looking uniformed policemen. 6.30 a.m. The first thing that crosses your mind is that the cops are here about Cujo, that she's in the hospital in the morgue, in jail, in... a oh, liar. Tell the truth, Gwendolyn. The first thing that crosses your mind is that there's been an audit at the disco, that Posner has jumped to conclusions, that without giving you an opportunity to explain, he has notified the SEC and called in the police. Only after those fears have jumped rope with your heart do you consider that there could be dire news about Cujo. In fairness, however, you utter no silent prayer that the authorities are here about her, and not you. As it turns out, they are here about the safe sex rapist. The safe sex rapist, so-called because he wears a condom during every attack, has claimed 20 victims in the past 30 days. The pace of his raping is such that some Seattleites suspect it the work of more than one man, forgetting perhaps when they were young. The rich boys are frequently mentioned although the victims have been by no means exclusively homeless or poor. The rich boys have been mentioned by just about everybody except the mayor, city councilmen, and newspaper editors who golf with the rich boys' dads. At any rate, according to the cops at the door, the safe sex rapist struck again last night, or rather early this morning, assaulting a late shift nurse after she got off a bus on her way home from work. The rape, it seems, was interrupted in progress by a taxi driver who gave chase in his cab when the attacker fled. Police joined in, and the rapist is believed to be cornered and hiding in your neighborhood. We're asking everyone in the area, especially women, to stay inside with their doors locked until we flush this partridge, one of the officers says. But it's light out now. You protest, and I'm just going to the store. I'm just going to drive over to Queen Anne Thriftway. Sorry says the cop. Can't let you do that. This guy's still around here and he's dangerous. Believe it, lady, says the other officer. Hell, the Thriftway parking lot's where he abandoned his motor scooter. 6.33 a.m. Your heart trips on the jump rope and skins its elbows. Oh, Jesus, oh no, you mutter. There's a problem? No. Yes, I mean, I know who it is. What say? The rapist. I know who he is. Are you sure? How do you know him? He live here? Uh, look, it's a long story, but it's got to be him. It, it must be him. If I saw his vehicle, I could say positively. Cecil, the senior of the two officers says, why don't you flag Smokey and get him to drive you and her over to where the scooter is? I'll find the manager and have him warn the rest of the tenants here. Owners, you correct him. What? We're owners in this building, not tenants. Yeah, okay, lady, says Cecil. Come with me. 6.39 a.m. The abandoned scooter, 
being loaded now into a police department van, is one of those fancy new sparkle and glitter Hondas in a candy apple color that your blush matches exactly, although without the metal flakes. I'm sorry, you say. It doesn't take a detective to tell you that you are less contrite than relieved, less relieved than embarrassed. It's okay, we all make mistakes. Smokey produces a pad and pen. What's the suspect's name and address? What suspect? The guy you thought was the rapist. But it isn't him. Can't be certain of that. He could have changed scooters. From the patrol car radio, a voice slips the words, Car 47, between two slices of static. 47. 47. We got a report. There's a monkey running loose. Disrupting the sunrise service at Kinnear Park. You respond? Negative, replies Smokey. No can do. You're aware we got a 1060 in progress. Call animal control, for Christ's sake. Roger, 47. Can you believe that, taking us off a 1060 for a damn monkey? I know who it is. The rapist? The monkey. I know that monkey. The police officers look at each other and roll their eyes. You don't understand. It's a friend. Well, I mean, it, it belongs to a friend of... Lady, says Cecil, I want you out of the car. But no, really, I... Out! Right now! You bug anybody around here, I'm running you into Harbor View where you belong. I'd run you in right now if I had the frigging time. He taps his partner, let's roll, Smoke. Barely have you slammed the door, then car 47, sirens ban-cheeing, lights star-spangled bannering, tears out of the thriftway lot towards your once thought to be temporary neighborhood, leaving you to boil and bubble in a chopino of outrage, humiliation, remorse, and one or two other all too familiar emotions. 6.51 a.m. When the cashier invites you to have a nice day, you give her a look that leaves her wondering how a woman who just bought two dozen banana popsicles could be in such a shitty mood. Part of your foul disposition is due to the fact that now that you are in possession of a fair amount of monkey fodder, you are unsure how to distribute it. Apparently, Andre has been amusing himself at the expense of the pious in Kinnear Park. But by the time you walked over there, both he and the worshippers would probably be gone, for the sun is shinnying up the eastern quadrant faster than a peeping tom up a sorority house drain pipe. Even were the Easter service still in progress, you hardly could stroll into its midst, wagging yellow ice on a stick without attracting the wrong kind of attention, the kind that might bring Cecil and Smokey back into your life. I anyhow, rather than go chasing after Andre, a proposition designed for futility and slapstick, it would be wiser to let him come to you. The problem here is that you cannot at this time return to your building, albeit a scant ten-minute walk, because your block is sealed off. Two or more squad cars at every intersection. The path to Belford's is clear, however, and it soon becomes equally clear that since you had planned all along to seed his place with popsicle bait, hoofing to Belford's is your only logical option. On your way there, shivering ever so slightly in the morning chill, although the temperature is actually several degrees too warm for the optimum health of your cargo, you cannot help but puzzle over Andre's reported presence at the sunrise service. Coincidence? An act of rebellion? Or was he drawn there because there is some validity to this born again? No, 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 no. Ridiculous. Animals even intelligent animals, perhaps most especially intelligent animals, do not share man's pathetic need to socialize bliss, codify awe, pigeonhole the mystery, and tame the divine. For an ape, born twice is entirely redundant, since an ape gets it right the first time. At least that is how Cujo has put it. Personally, you haven't a clue in spiritual matters, but you do know, or deeply suspect, that a monkey who once mingled with aristocrats in Swiss ski resorts and movie stars in the French Riviera would find the company of Seattle Lutherans drab, doer, and dorky beyond all belief. 7.10 a.m. As evidenced by an overturned cookie jar and an open freezer door, Andre has stopped by home at least once in Belford's absence. 
Encouraged, you place three or four popsicles in the freezer, and with the remainder of the first box, Hansel and Gretel a trail leading from the garage roof to the balcony to a broom closet in which, with a swift slamming of a door, a greedy little macaque could be surprised and contained. Satisfied, although scarcely overconfident, you are all too aware that the infamous Simeon jewel thief is nobody's fool. You take a seat in Belford's favorite armchair. Using a remote, you switch on the radio and tune it to KIRO so that you will be immediately informed when the manhunt in your neighborhood has ended. On the 715 report, you learn that the rapist remains at large somewhere in your quarantine block. You also learn a moment later that Dr. Yamaguchi has called a press conference for 10 o'clock. Presumably, the announcer speculates to explain his behavior last evening. As well he might. Good grief. Thoughts of the sake sodden scientist lead like an abbreviated trail of synaptic popsicles to thoughts of Larry Diamond. Soon you yourself are shut in a closet. A closet of guilt. How close you came to officially accusing Diamond of serial rape. How eager you were to name his name. If those suspicions were unjustified, even irresponsible, could the same not be said for your willingness to lay Cujo's disappearance at his feet? To some extent, it is his own fault for allowing lewd impulses to rule him, for forsaking decorum, for behaving like a nut and a goat. Nevertheless, he is ill and in pain, dying for all you know, and you have wronged him. You have borne him false witness. How badly do you feel about it? Not badly enough to confess and apologize. What the oversexed lunatic doesn't know won't hurt him. Yeah, but what if on some level he does know? Ever since he's been on the pad, whatever in marginal hell that is, he's had the ability to hijack dreams and burglarize thoughts. It seems to you, slumped in Belford's monkey-soiled chair, the second box of popsicles thawing on your lap, that you ought either to have a talk with Diamond soon, or else avoid him like the IRS for the rest of your life. In less than nine minutes, a radio dispatch taxi arrives at Belford's building. The driver looks bewildered and mutters in Sanskrit or Aramaic or Urdu when you say, Thunder House, please. But you straighten it out, and when after no more than the usual amount of wrong turns and near collisions he deposits you at the Thunderbird Bowl, you hand him, in lieu of a tip, the carton that is now rather soggy with a flowery yellow sweat. For your children, you say generously, thinking all the while that these undisciplined third-world types invariably have stockpiles of progeny. To fair Natalie, who sachets out of Thunder House, just as you approach its door, you, so olive of skin and iodine of eye, probably look like the cab driver's wife. 7.57 a.m. For several tense seconds, you and Natalie fire tracers into each other's orbs, you thinking, espresso bimbo, Natalie thinking, prissy witch. Then you spin around and start back up the ramp. Gwendolyn, wait! You slow down and glance over your shoulder, but you don't actually halt your retreat until you hear Diamond say, Natalie, I want you to meet Gwen Maddie the woman I inexplicably yet inescapably love. Midway up the ramp, a trifle stunned, you stand with your hands on your hips, defiant but intrigued, curious whether the lecher and his tramp are sharing a joke at your expense, whether Diamond is toying with both you and Natalie, or whether he is sincere. And if he is sincere, whether he is in or out of his mind. I guess that explains it, Natalie says. A sharp twitch fish hooks the left corner of Diamond's appeasing smile. Well, adds Natalie, at least now I know it wasn't me. Distracted, says Diamond meekly. For sure, Natalie sighs. Don't let me interrupt anything, you say, your sarcasm an inch thicker than hers. You already did, says Natalie. Hours ago. With a toss of her blonde head, she propels herself up the incline. As she brushes past you, reeking, you think, like a cat food casserole, she says, 
I hope you guys live happily ever after. We promise, calls Larry cheerfully. You can count on us. Look, I only wanted to give Mr. Diamond a brief message, you say, but the waitress proceeds expediently to a Japanese mini car that looks as if it has been kicked at least once by Godzilla, leaving you to face that philandering bastard at the foot of the ramp who is now petitioning you with a grin that a sheep could use as a paperweight. 8.30 a.m. Timbuktu. The end of everybody's road. The capital of nowhere. Geography's perennial avant-garde and the armchair traveler's inevitable cul-de-sac. Tim Buck too. Hometown of mystery. Fugitivity's final refuge. Remote crossroads where obscurity runs into exotica. And daydream and exile intersect. Timbuktu, the far of which there is no farther, out there, gone, closer to the moon than to New Jersey, rivaled by only Katmandu as the planet's most musical city poem, Timbuktu, one of the phonetic wonders of the world, great place to pronounce but you wouldn't want to live there. No, indeed, you certainly wouldn't want to live there. You wouldn't want to spend a minute and a half in Timbuktu. You hadn't planned to spend much more than a minute and a half in Thunder House, for that matter. I was in the neighborhood, so I just stopped by to tell you that Yamaguchi's holding a press conference at 10 o'clock. But Diamond had coaxed you inside, on the round heels of that coffeehouse strumpet, after finally convincing you that if you looked at his slides of Timbuktu, they might offer some insight into Kujo's disappearance. He had led you into a spacious, dimly lit room, unfurnished except for a cushy butterscotch leather sofa, but whose floors were covered with the richest, most gorgeous, and probably expensive oriental carpets you had ever seen, and whose walls were adorned with African masks, several presumably meant to represent frogs, he had set you on the sofa, which you sniffed for traces of Natalie, served you mint tea, drugged, you wondered, switched on the slide projector, and now has you thoroughly and unwillingly hypnotized, yes, hypnotized, there is no other word for it, by his strange manner of speaking. Timbuktu, the last pure place. Isolation being the mother of purity. All men are jealous of Timbuktu because Timbuktu is removed from men. It's the wholeness men have fractured, the sacred extreme they've traded away. Like hell, like heaven. Timbuktu is a place in the brain, a place whose existence may be often doubted but never dismissed. Timbuktu a constellation by which the imagination can navigate, the joker that haunts the mapmaker's deck. 8.33 a.m. You may be hypnotized, but you aren't gregarious. You maintain an aloof distance from your host, not even bothering to ask how he was feeling. He felt well enough to spend the night with Natalie, didn't he? And when he illuminates the first slide and it appears to be an empty, limitless ocean formed by the melting of trillions of banana popsicles. You snort, Huh, no wonder Timbuktu's so hard to find, implying that there's no there there. That, my dear, is the Sahara. Empty, yes, barren, yes. Fierce and deceptively featureless, but, I assure you, unforgettable. Yes, I suppose, if you like beige. Diamond moves on to the next slide, which is virtually the same. As vast as it looks in this picture, this is merely a sample. You could fit the entire United States, including Alaska, into the Sahara and have room left over for Q. Joe's groceries. All that sand, what a waste of real estate. It's as much stone as it is sand, believe it or not. And twice in its history it was covered by water. Frogs and fishes used to swim in there, Gwendolyn. Turtles and crocodiles. Their skeletons are all over the place. 
How nice. When the great deserts and the great oceans get bored, they just switch places. Fortunately for us, it doesn't happen every Saturday night. They have a lot in common, the deserts and the seas. For our purposes, short-term and long-term, the sea is more important. But I do have a fondness for the desert. It shows us how beautiful the Earth would be if men weren't on it. The Sahara may be the only place left that we haven't fucked up. When you look at it, you get an idea what the planet was like before our ancestors hopped out of the soup and what it'll look like when we've hopped back in, metaphorically or literally. More tea? Thank you, no. Timbuktu, is it in the desert somewhere? Subconsciously, you are wishing he would revive the hypnosis. Not yet. It will be. He brings up yet a third view of parched basins, cinder cones, yellow dunes. Timbuktu is moving? It's a Sahara that's moving, going south like a homesick bluesman. Even as we speak, the desert sucking the toes of Timbuktu, although hardly as adoringly as I'd suck yours. The fact is, the Sahara is gradually swallowing Timbuktu. As delectable as you are, pussycakes, I'd never eat you alive. You're a gentleman, Larry. I admire your restraint. Can we please get on with it? You're always wanting to get on with it. Are you aware that rushing toward a goal is a sublimated death wish? It's no coincidence we call them deadlines. The Sahara would be good for a hustler like you. If the sea teaches us humility, the desert teaches us patience. Timbuktu's never in a hurry, and you and I aren't going to rush into Timbuktu. We agreed, I believe, that I'd show you the slides in the exact sequence that I showed them to Kujo. Which means, I'm afraid, our entry into Timbuktu is at least a quarter hour away. First, we have to spend some time with Snickersnee. Diamond changes slides, and a broad, shallow river comes into view. The Bozo. 844 AM. Mali, not to be confused with Bali, and certainly not with Malibu or Maui, is a largish, generally arid, landlocked nation in northwestern Africa. For six centuries, roughly from 1000 until 1600, Timbuktu was Mali's richest, most powerful city, one of the richest, most powerful and learned cities outside of the well-traveled, civilized world. The success of this remote oasis was entirely due to its position at the southern terminus of the Trans-Saharan caravan routes combined with its proximity to the Niger River. Upon the Niger, salt, spices, slaves, cloth, and manuscripts that the camel caravans exchanged for gold in Timbuktu could be transported by riverboat all the way to the Atlantic. The Niger, intones Diamond, the mighty Niger looks like a question mark drawn by a left-handed octogenarian dipsomaniac, a most fitting shape since European geographers went batty questioning its source, its mouth, and its course. The Niger is eccentrically shaped and flows in the opposite direction from what a knowledgeable person might expect. I assure you, many an explorer landed in an early grave trying to make sense of the Niger. Their efforts weren't helped by the fact that this baby is 2,600 miles long and there was a fresh disease and new hostility waiting around every bend. What we're seeing are views along the 500-mile stretch that runs from Bamako, the capital, northeastward to near Timbuktu. This is bozo water. Bozo water, you mutter under your breath. A perfect name for that artificially carbonated tap water many U.S. bottlers pass off as Eau Mineral. As Diamond advances the slides, you are treated to picturesque scenes of natives in long, low dugout canoes, each one poled rather than paddled by a solitary polar who stands in the stern. Some of the pirogues appear to be means of public conveyance. Others are cargo vessels, and others, perhaps the majority, fishing boats. 
There was much casting and drawing of nets. They're Egyptians originally, the Bozo are. For some reason, they gave up on the Nile and migrated all the way to the Niger about 5,000 years ago. A tiny nation of riverine folk who brought with them an Egyptian language that they continue to speak and a complex, animistic, highly ritualized religion that despite Islamic inroads, they continue to practice. The hub of this religion is the dog star, Sirius. Sitting trouser. Yes! <laughs> Sitting trouser. He regards you with genuine admiration. Lately, though, I've started to wonder if there wasn't a mistranslation. Maybe the bozo called Sirius Sitting Bowser. Woof! You bark, prompting Diamond to reward you with a smile that could paint a doghouse. Up close, the bozo are nothing if not disappointing. Apparently you were expecting a race of displaced Tuts and Cleopatras, but with the exception of their relatively fine features, they more closely resemble Mississippi sharecroppers than mystic Egyptians. The men are in dirty t-shirts, plastic sandals, and cotton pants that might have been plucked off a bargain counter at Kmart and run through a shredder. Although the women wear the traditional, long, brightly patterned dresses of West Africa, the garments are wrinkled and torn. Sacred robes and celestial adornments are nowhere to be seen, and if there are temples, they are indistinguishable from the poor huts that cluster on the riverbanks, awash in a secondary river of naked children, skinny chickens, and mud. I see you're less than knock sockless, Diamond says. Soon we'll be moving along to the Dogon, whom I suspect you'll find more impressive. Almost everyone does. The Dogon are cliff dwellers who reside in secluded pueblos, caves, and strange clay towers along a mammoth escarpment that rears out of the sun-baked savanna some hard, harsh miles from the Niger. Their ancestors fled to this forbidding natural barrier to escape foreign influences, and the Dogon have proven fiercely resistant to modern mores, Pan-Malian assimilation, and Islamic conversion. It strikes you from Diamond's pictures that the Dogon dress with no more flair than the bozo, and frankly, you had rather be laid out stiff in any well-maintained American cemetery than be alive and salubrious in a milieu so devoid of comfort and chic. You agree, however, that the Dogon's masks and wooden figures, their elaborately carved doorposts and altars, and their bizarre booga booga dance costumes are more impressive in a cultural sense than the muddy fundamentals of the bozo. Were these people originally Egyptians too? You ask, motivated less by curiosity than an attempt to make polite conversation. Diamond's slideshow reminds you of an ethnological documentary on public television, and to be honest, you have always preferred to watch those old movies in which nimble dandies soft shoe in top hats and tails, and everybody sips champagne. Now, as a matter of fact, the Dogon migrated down from Libya, where they might have been descended from shipwrecked Greeks. There's a theory that they were the lost crew of the Argo who, when they couldn't get home to Greece, intermarried with black Libyans. You don't say. Gwendolyn, yes. Are you by any chance thinking of Fred Astaire? Why, no. Where would you get an idea like that? Never mind. The Argonauts, before they wrecked, were searching for the Golden Fleece, right? You know all this. You're an educated woman. It's rumored you have an MBA. At any rate, the Golden Fleece is a celestial symbol. It refers to the stars in the constellation Canis Major, the hair of the dog, so to speak, which was directly above the oracular center of Colchis, when the Golden Meadow Colchicum, or False Saffron, an important medicinal plant in the ancient Mediterranean, came annually into bloom there. Sirius A is the big box office boffo celebrity star in Canis Major, of course. But it's Sirius B that's important to the Dogon and the Bozo. They share the same mythologies, the Dogon and Bozo. Among the Dogon, 
the rituals are more perfectly preserved, and the ritualistic objects more plentiful and aesthetically refined, but my heart ticks louder for the bozo for the simple reason that they've remained so loyal to the water world. They're consummate river folk. The first toys a bozo child are given are fish bones and fish heads. They eat what swims and are themselves strong swimmers. A bozo believes the crocodile is his father and he claims to have a blood pact with the crocs. A bozo doesn't hunt crocodiles, and crocodiles don't hunt bozo. Witnesses swear it's true. For that alone, it's obvious. Bozos have maintained closer bonds with the Nomo than the Dogon have. But I don't suppose you want to get into that. The Nomo, huh? Well, as a matter of fact, you do have a mild interest in that subject. After the fright that ridiculous card gave you and all, but what you truly want is for Diamond to complete his presentation, which so far has afforded not the softest hint of why Cujo might have fled Thunderhouse, so that you can solicit his advice on an oil futures play. Naturally, he will insist that any market play is trivial and a waste of time and consciousness, but he could be quite helpful with the mechanics of the deal. Also, you need to get back to Belfer's to check if there has been a nibble on your monkey line. Whether there has or has not, you wish now to turn your own apartment into Rancho Popsicle because of the stronger impact it possibly will have on Belfer should you impound Andre in your place instead of his. No, says Diamond. No, no, Mo. A pity. Well, okay. You can lead a toad to water, but you can't make her think. Let's move along, then, to Timbuktu. Good, you say curtly. You would bet your last battered share of Union Carbide that thinking about Bozo Nomo Bumbo Jumbo was not something he required of Natalie. 9 a.m. Timbuktu. A town made of pastry dough and starlight. A mirage you can walk around in if you can stand the heat. Solitary, sealed and shuttered, it wears a mask behind a mask, behind a veil. Timbuktu, a dehydrated Venice, crumbling into a plexus of dust canals. Conceived when the Sphinx lay down with a gold bug at a campsite half as old as time. The Sahara crackles in every bite of its bread. The ashes of dead books blown through its streets. The lost wisdom of a dozen races is buried under its drifts, never to be jiggled by the archaeologist's spade. Timbuktu. A city only an adventurer would risk. Only a romantic would forgive. Only a nomad would find inviting. Only a camel could love. Babel. Hypnotic, crackpot babble, but Diamond is right about one thing. Timbuktu does look like as if it's made of cookie dough and starlight. Which is not to say it is sweet, or radiant, or even slightly appealing. It has a definite mystique, all right, due primarily to the audacity with which it occupies the void, boldly existing where no city ought to be, and to the sheer exoticness of its architecture, the oddly organic jumble of box-like clay houses stacked atop and against one another like something a compulsive child might construct. A child who could not imagine spires, arches, or domes, yet is imbued with enough childish whimsy to paint every third or fourth door a brilliant blue. But undercutting that mystique is the sheer, empty starkness of the place. The tan monochrome relieved only occasionally by a winking blue door. The stillness so still that even the slides convey it. Had Diamond employed a movie camera, the effect would have been the same. A ghost town that will not quite give up the ghost. A place where people spend their lives listening to the wind blow. You're not the first to be disappointed, says Diamond, as if reading your mind again. 
All through the Middle Ages, Timbuktu signified to Europeans some kind of tantalizing, out-of-reach magnificence. A magical but entirely tangible city of wealth, sophistication, intrigue, and learning. A dreamy shopping mall, as it were, where you could buy salt, pepper, unicorn horns, tarot cards, books, virgins, eunuchs, dwarfs, and carpet bags of unrefined ore. Where you could cavort in luxuriant roof gardens with your newly purchased slave girl and speak with scholars or holy men on every street corner. Ah, yes. But when the first white men began to actually zero in on the place in the 19th century, it was at least 300 years past its prime. The palaces had crumbled. The bazaars had closed. The library and university had been torched. Fully expecting to be rolling in gold dust, the honkies got a face full of hot sand instead. The African El Dorado. Yes, indeed. Are you aware, my dear, that Marlon Brando called the inside of a camel's mouth the ugliest thing in the world? Why? Why? Pull back their lips and you'll soon enough... No, no, Larry, for Christ's sake. I mean, Timbuktu, if it was so rich and glamorous, why did it turn into this, this, um, boneyard? You might ask the same thing about Wall Street. Things run their course in the material world. Specifically, if you must know, Timbuktu started to decline after European traders landed on the west coast of Africa in the 15th century and provided an alternative to the trans-Saharan caravan routes. And then the town got its brains knocked out, literally, when it was overrun by Moroccan mercenaries and fundamentalist bushwhackers in 1591. But events such as those are just the vehicles change likes to ride around in. Evolution drives a bulldozer disguised as a stationary bike. With history, mm, it's the other way around. Could it be, you wonder, Diamond's non-sequiturs aside, that you are indeed like those European explorers, that you set out optimistically to partake of the wealth of a fabled land, only to arrive, after much hardship, when your destination was well past its prime. Obviously, the days of giddy prosperity are over, but is the decline by any chance permanent? Are America's once powerful financial centers destined to sink deeper and deeper into a spreading economic Sahara until one day, 10, 20 years from now, they are, relatively speaking, mudball villages whose inhabitants, including you, have nothing better to do than contemplate their obsolescence and listen to the wind blow? Or watch the stars? Pardon? Listen to the wind blow. I'm reading you like an ad in the personals today, aren't I? Or watch the stars. Diamond refills your teacup. You know, even these days, travelers arrive in Timbuktu expecting, I don't know, something epiphanic, um, phantasmagorical, and leave feeling cheated, bitching that there's nothing there. But maybe it isn't a matter of there being nothing there. Maybe they just don't know what to look for. Everybody's not a mind reader like you, Larry. What could they realistically look for? Where could they look? Oh, they might begin with a university. Timbuktu does have a university again, and I assure you, it's in a class by itself. Taught me a thing or two. Yes, indeed, a genuine thing or two. Snickersnee, snickersnee. He advances the slides rapidly in a staccato blur, finally pausing at a scene of a high, dun-colored wall. Timbuktu is not a walled city, a fact that surprises you, considering its legendary mysteriousness. But on the outskirts of town, there are several walled compounds, one of which, evidently, is some kind of school. A subsequent scene depicts an elaborate wrought-iron gate, opening on a courtyard resplendent with banana plants, flowering trees, and believe it or not, a pond? Yes. 
Did you think in a place where the moon looms so large there wouldn't be frogs to praise it? Timbuktu is, after all, an oasis. The next slide reveals a largish, squarish, two-story building made of clay in the Sudanese style and sporting blue shutters closed on the second floor. With its shady green courtyard, it is somewhat of a retreat, you would imagine, from the bleak alleyways and sun-fried sand piles surrounding it. An oasis within an oasis, but it's a poor excuse for a university. You were about to say as much when Snickersnee Diamond pushes the button and brings up another view of the gate, this time with a group of a dozen or more Westerners posing formally in front of it. The faculty, you ask? Yes and no. Yes and no. That's Robert Anton Wilson, front row, left end. And on his left is Terence McKenna, Diane De Prima, and I believe John Lilly. You can recognize Timothy Leary in the back row next to Carlos Castaneda. Only extant picture of him, by the way. And there's Andre Cadrescu, Ted Jones, and uh, Rupert Sheldrake, Fritjof Capra, R.D. Lang, and, well, several mathematicians, quantum physicists, and artists you've probably never heard of. I never heard of the others, either. You say, somewhat untruthfully, because you seem to recall Cujo, or was it your parents mentioning a few of those names? Needless to say, these luminaries aren't in residence full-time. The non-Africans come and go virtually at random, and always in secret. They do lecture now and then, they present papers, and seldom hesitate to speak out in class, if one could call them classes. But they seem to be there to study as much as to teach. Teachers or students, it's hard to draw the line. But they aren't faculty, per se. Here, Snickersnee, is the faculty. Same gait, same pose, same number of people, give or take one or two. But this group is pigmented in various shades of cinnamon and asphalt and dressed in various examples of African fashion from white robes and turbans to white linen suits, from jazzy two-piece pattern ensembles to loincloths, from flowing dashikis to animal skins. Shamans, soothsayers, griots, and big boo-hoos, says Diamond. Tell me, how do you suppose this faculty would rate your MBA? You don't answer because you aren't listening. Ever since you thought of Cujo, you have been refocusing on the reasons you were attending this stupid Easter morning show and tell in the first place. Larry, you say, a few minutes ago you mentioned that tarot cards were sold in Timbuktu in the uh, Middle Ages, I believe it was. Did you mention that to Cujo as well? I'm just wondering if that might have sparked something, if there's a clue there or... In the semi-darkness, you can detect cocktail onions of sweat popping out on Diamond's brow. You can actually feel his sudden fever. I, uh, I can't remember right offhand. He shudders. You'll, oh, you'll have to excuse me, I'll have to go to the bathroom, as denatured Americans insist on saying, although their particular mission rarely involves the act of bathing. He lurches away and vanishes in the gloom. 9.28 a.m. Face it, Gwen, you are slow. You are slower than zombies playing Monopoly. A nursing home sack race, Christmas in Saudi Arabia. You are so slow that if you jumped out of a plane, the plane would land before you did. You are so slow that a full five minutes pass before before what should have been immediately, horrifyingly, obvious, finally occurs to you. When it does, it sloshes the tea out of your cup and the adrenaline out of your adrenals. Spell it out, Sherlock. Lay it on the table. Less than 48 hours ago, Q. Joe Huffington was seated on this very same couch looking at this identical slide when Larry Diamond excused himself to visit the toilet as he has done once again as if on cue, and in his exactly similar absence, Something happened to Cujo, something drastic, something that caused her to vanish from the face of the earth. This is more than coincidence, beyond déjà vu. This is history deliberately repeating itself with one terrible step left to go.
9.30 a.m. For a long moment, you just sit, hands trying to steady the teacup on its quaking saucer, eyes wide and fused to the screen, as if some member of the faculty of the University of Timbuktu might call out and advise you what to do. Then, abruptly, you spring to your feet, dashing the carpet with tea, and like a Tai Chi novice with both feet in a bear trap, whirl awkwardly around. No one had been creeping up on you. The room is empty, and, except for the faint, nervous hum of the slide projector, quiet, dead, quiet. You stand there, on guard, fighting to clear the panic and gather your thoughts. Like some instant creepy cream of cholesterol, some cellular duck fat clotted by epinephrine, fear has clogged your mental conduits. All you can think of is that whatever happened to Q. Joe Huffington, you must not allow it to happen to you. It occurs to you, naturally, to make a run for the door, but you automatically reject the notion of running on the grounds that to be caught running would be an embarrassment. Better dead than red. Eh, Gwen? Setting the cup and saucer on the sofa, you commence to stroll toward the door, just strolling nonchalantly, dum dum de dum trying not to interpret every awful shadow thrown by every African mask as a lunatic with a knife. Separating the huge living room from the front door is a small vestibule, and as you stroll into the vestibule, arms innocently swinging, dum dum de dum you notice that an interior door opens into it, and light is seeping over the door sill. It's the bathroom, which you must pass to reach the exit. You hesitate. What if this is a trap? Whether an insidious trap with harmful consequences or one of Diamond's ostensibly instructive practical jokes, in either case, the very notion of it infuriates you. Cold globs of fear start to dissolve in a hot acid bath of anger. As you rummage in your purse for your trusty can of mace, you can sense your trumpet bending upward at an angle that would have made Gillespie dizzy. 9.34 a.m. Tiptoeing now, mace at the ready, you steal past the bathroom. Just let him try something. Your heart is pounding against your sternum, like a landlord's fist against your daddy's jams. But so great is your fury and defiance that you are almost sorry when you reach the exit without interference. You pause. Are you absolutely sure you want to vamoose? Yes, yes, you are. You aren't merely fleeing a disagreeable situation. You may well be escaping with your life. Go on, get out of here. Alas, the handle will not turn in any direction. You yank, you twist, you pull, you push, all for naught, because the door is locked tighter than a prude's lips. In vain, you search for a latch of some sort. Apparently, you have been locked in with a key. Slowly, you release the frozen handle and turn around. Nothing has changed. Thunder House remains empty, dim, and quiet. Around the corner, in the living room, the slide projector buzzes like a bug in a jar. On your left, six feet away, a hem of light continues to show beneath the bathroom door. Your options, it strikes you, are limited. You could look for a phone and play 911 roulette. These days, the calls for help are myriad. The response is few. You could seek assistance from that Native American, the Twister character, assuming Twister is on the premises and is not a party to whatever it is that is happening here. You could simply stand in the vestibule and await Diamond's next move, allowing him to determine your fate. Or you could take the initiative, go on the offensive, become a boiler room broker in the bucket shop of life. In your current state of exasperation, the last choice seems inevitable. With a toss of your rapidly graying hair, with a squeaky, kittenish version of a battle cry forming in your throat, you charge the bathroom door and throw it open, ready to mace the bastard from here to Timbuktu. 9.37 a.m. Nothing in your experience, not even Bosch's Temptation of St. Anthony, a reproduction of which your mother tacked to your nursery wall and whose inexhaustible grotesqueries in your earliest years you were obliged to watch in lieu of television, 
Until Grandma Maddie, crossing herself like a motorized bandolier, ripped it down. No, nothing. Not even the pit at the Chicago Board of Trade has prepared you for the tableau you have now intruded upon in Larry Diamond's toilet. Naked below the waist, Diamond is on his hands and knees on a handsome and probably expensive Afghani kilim, busily stuffing green leaves up his rectum. Jesus, you gasp. The erstwhile genius of the Pacific Northwest equities market looks like an incomplete mutant, an alien life form from a homemade sci-fi movie, a kind of cut-rate half-man, half-plant crawling to a garden store Bethlehem to be born. Either that or he's acting out a nightmare in which he gives live birth to a Caesar salad. Jesus. I don't believe I rang for the maid, says Diamond matter-of-factly, cocking his head to one side and gazing up at you. Thoroughly mortified, you commence to retreat, walking backward, geisha style. Steps tiny, mincing, and close together, punctuated by meek, apprehensive bows, and all the while concealing the mace canister behind your back like a bottle of inferior sake. Diamond signals you to stay. Although the process by which he signals is somewhat fuzzy, considering that he is busily impersonating a three-legged dog trying to free its haunches from an azalea bush. Forgive my primitive presentation, he appeals, but it is not easy to summarily absolve a pantless man who wears a wicked grin on one end and skunk cabbage on the other. It's my therapy, he explains. Big medicine. He releases the wad of leaves he was applying to his rump, letting it fall to the floor, and picks up a fresh batch from a sheet of damp newspaper. Here, he says, sensing that you are about to Madame Butterfly toward the vestibule again, he hands you the soppy bouquet for your reluctant scrutiny. Twister's daddy sends me these specimens of Oklahoma's finest flora. Big medicine. This is what you're using to treat your... your... Uh, my cancer? Yes, yes, indeed. Wide place in the road is a celebrated healer, although I'm forced to say his herbal prescription seems to be losing its effectiveness where my particular infirmity is concerned. Maybe I should try smoking this stuff. Jesus, you say to yourself. A poor, poor guy. How could I ever have thought? Your heart, which is already going out to him, receives both a prod and a caution when, lifting the leaves closer to your face, you detect that they release an aroma like burnt sugar, caramel, or tinned fruit cocktail. 9.41 a.m. You, 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 you must be in pain, you stammer, feeling that you should probably wipe his brow or something, but you've got the wet leaves in one fist and the mace in the other, and you are a trifle uncertain, in any case, whether you want to lay a comforting hand on him or excuse yourself on a permanent basis. Ah, oh, it's a bit like camping on a blowtorch, but everybody's got a hard luck story. They warn us when we're kids that we're going to have to suffer, but they neglect to mention the indignity. What self-respecting fetus, if shown its future as a proctology patient, Boot camp recruit or game show contestant would still elect to be born. He looks away, and you seize the opportunity to drop the mace into a laundry basket. Of course, he continues, a big front does have a big back. Yamaguchi, that old rascal, could turn out to be my hero if he plays his cards right. Meanwhile, it seems, I'm on my knees. How, how bad is it? You inch a geisha step closer to him. It only hurts when I don't laugh, he says. With that, he raises up on his knees, whereupon you find yourself looking directly at his, his, what do you call it? And with its single epicanthic eye, it is looking back at you. Immediately, you are struck by how, how altogether elegant it appears. When compared to Belford's, that is. Belford's Penis, while probably exceeding diamonds in length and breadth, is a wrinkly, crooked, blood-gorged thing that so reminds you of a boiled turkey neck that you scarcely can bear to look at it. 
diamond's shaft, on the other hand, is like an alabaster gun barrel, smooth, straight, and lunar white, while its crown resembles a satin apple, a rosy cross between a virgin pincushion, a tulip bulb, and the head of a bubblegum cobra. And if it is a cobra, you are the charmer's flute, for wherever you move in your nervous shuffling, it follows, swaying, dancing, holding you in hazardous regard. Blushing as violently as you have ever blushed in your life, you are nevertheless fascinated, mesmerized by the grace and polish of his stalwart member every bit as much as you were mesmerized by his feverish monologues. Furthermore, your knees feel like they're made out of helium and chicken broth, and when Diamond reaches up to take you by the wrist, they not only feel weaker yet, one knee seems to go east, the other west, as if to provide more space for the patch of moisture that is starting to spread in your underpants, accompanied by a melting sensation akin to that that the banana popsicles must be experiencing here and there in Belford's apartment. Diamond draws you closer. The next thing you know, you are on your knees. First shyly, then wholeheartedly, your lips collide. When his warm tongue explodes into your mouth, where it darts about like a hooked trout, where it turns your own tongue around and over and over and around, like a cutlet in the grip of a zealous meat inspector, where it brushes and lathers and frescoes your palate ceiling like a mouse-sized Michelangelo wired on espresso. When that transpires, you fling the mess of leaves, ovate and lanceolate, peltate and perfoliate, orbicular and deltoid, against the wall, the toilet bowl, the side of the tub. Within seconds, you have replaced the vegetable matter with his... Oh, God... Never have your fingers closed around anything so glossy and stiff and alive. So alive it is almost sonorous. So alive it is all you can do to hold on to it. It is as if you have grabbed a length of cable of such high voltage that it bucks and hisses and sparks in your grip. You feel his hand, somehow you sense it's the one with the arcane tattoo, spider up your skirt. This is followed by the unmistakable sound of fabric in distress. Out of the corner of your eye, you see the shreds of your panties go flying by. It is the last thing you see, for like a teenager so blinded by those squirmy red winds of lust and longing, the ones that Sirocco out of the chlorine pots of the soul, that concepts such as disease, pregnancy, or humiliation fade to black. You redundantly squeeze your eyes shut and roll slowly onto your spine, emitting little whimpering noises like a puppy in a snowbank. What is he waiting for? Oh, yes, of course, the condom. How irresponsible of you to forget. But what is he saying? Down between your legs you hear him growling, grunting, awing, ooing, muttering, This is more than a vagina. This is a monstre sacré. This is the pothole in which empires break their axles. These are the gates Samson couldn't pull down. The grin of the mollusk. The anthill of the miraculous. And so forth. Good grief. Good grief. You open your eyes only to snap them shut again when you feel his long tongue swab you from your anus to your belly button. Oh, God, what is he doing? You have heard about this from that filthy-minded Cujo, but never in your life. Your entire body quivers as he licks your vulva. You cry aloud when his tongue snakes in and out of you, and when, ever so tenderly, he takes your clitoris between his teeth. Oh, God. God. A moment later, his face, glistening with the brine of the portable tide pool, is above your face, kissing your eyelids open, and you feel his stiffness slowly, slowly, inch by impudent inch, sliding into you, pushing rapture ahead of it like an embolus. 
It is then that the whole building shakes, causing a toothbrush to fall off a shelf and bounce on the keelum beside your head, and your ears are filled with a series of rumblings and crashes, like the sounds of distant battle, and you think, it's true, the earth does move. But wait a minute, that noise, that noise, it sounds familiar. Diamond smiles fatalistically, breaks his locomotive just short of your womb, and nodding in the direction of the ceiling, whispers, Ten o'clock. They're bowling. Ten a.m. The carnal embrace is self-insulating. With efficient ease, it stifles all other biological urges, dissolves the intellect, and obliterates the conscience. If, while it endures, it can edit out hunger, fatigue, pain, time, reason, responsibility, and guilt, surely it can muffle the banal booms of bowling. And quickly enough it does. Soon the ten-pin thunder is obscured by the softer slip-slap of his belly against yours. Your skirt is up around your neck, and you are holding on for dear life to keep from plunging into the bottomless, though narrow-walled pit of the fuck. As your vaginal muscles contract around his phallus, the larger muscle of the fuck contracts around your being, and you feel as if you are being compressed into a single drop of musky fat, a dollop of electrified lard sizzling in a skillet upon a stove of silk. Your Bartholin's glands are bobbing in their juices, and when every now and again his scrotum bangs against them, the white pony rears on the ridge. Let bones buckle. Let gristle grind. Let spit fly. Let... Good grief, what now? Diamond smiles fatalistically again, his rhythmic thrust sliding to a jerky halt. What is it, darling, you want to say? Please, don't stop. Don't ever stop. No word leaves your mouth, however, and over your lover's shoulder you glimpse the figure who has arrested his motion and chased the white pony off the back forty and into the mesquite. It's Twister, for the sake of humble Jesus, Twister. The big Native American is standing in the bathroom doorway, impassive, nonplussed, so distracted he seems not to realize that he is the ultimate distraction, the personification of what is, next to death and call waiting, the most unforgivable intrusion in the human universe. Coitus interruptus. And as the blood rushes into your face with the speed of a bowling ball, you can almost hear it rumble. He says in a quiet voice that seems to come from very deep inside, Excuse me, Larry. But you told me to let you know when the Japanese doctor is on TV. 10.05 a.m. Twister withdraws. Diamond doesn't. But you can feel him shrinking inside of you. Bad timing, he says. Uh -huh. Success in life and love depends always on timing. In the market as well. Totally good timing versus bad timing. This was bad. Uh-huh inopportune. Yes. You feel him withering away. Where does it go when it goes? But there'll be other opportunities. You can't tell if he's making a statement or asking a question, so you say, we should get up. He may come back. No, Twister's in his teepee. However, in one swift motion, he lifts his hips, pulling free of you and lowering his head, kissing you sweetly. Then, backing up on his hands and knees, he plants a forceful kiss right at ground zero between your thighs. Licking his lips like a bubba at a barbecue, he stands. Feeling suddenly very exposed and very shy, you scramble to your feet. As long as we're up, he says. What? Well, I'd rather like to have a peek at Yamaguchi. Would you mind? I, um... You find your panties on the floor in a heap of foliage. Tattered and moist, they resemble what would have been left of Little Red Riding Hood if the woodsman hadn't shown up in time. I ought to freshen up. Diamond takes the panties from you, holds them to his face, and inhales. 
A fresher peach than you, my dear, would still be on the bough. You were about to protest when an aroma, not of your ruined underpants, but of the scattered leaves, reminds you of his illness, of the hope that that goofy Yamaguchi might hold for a cure, and you allow him, after he puts his jeans on, to take your hand and lead you from the room. In leaving, you glance back, half smiling, half frowning, as if your confused brain is straining to comprehend. Did the most thrilling thing to ever happen to you, outside of the confines of Posner, Lampert, McAvoy, and Jacobson, actually just transpire on that bathroom floor? 10.06 a.m. Twister's flat, entered through an inconspicuous door on the right side of the vestibule, is furnished with Heritage House early American pieces that, to a Comanche, you suppose, must seem late American, and then some. To you, they just seem tacky, although definitely superior to Cujo's thrift shop heirlooms. His living room is equally as voluminous as diamonds, but most of the furniture has been herded into one end of it, the far end, where it gathers dust and vibrates in harmony with the clattering ten pins. At the near end, against the east wall, is a bulky old television cabinet. Facing it in the middle of the room, the Indian must have better vision than you, is an uncomfortable-looking settee in a folksy calico print. Closer to the west wall, it's back to the sofa, is a wooden colonial rocking chair, which you know to be a reproduction and imagine to be hard on the buns. Twister occupies the rocker, though he is not rocking. He is, in fact, so motionless, he might be perched on a rock. He is staring at the wall, or rather, at a small picture on the wall. That must be the famous Van Gogh. Naturally, you are anxious to examine it, but Diamond leads you directly to the sofa and bids you to sit down beside him. Don't you have a TV? You whisper in his ear, the unfortunate one with a ring through it. Throw it in the dumpster, he says, when I got back from Timbuktu. He fixes on the screen with the same attention that Twister devotes to the Van Gogh drawing, although he is flexible enough to run a hand up your skirt and squeeze your bare, sticky thigh. You flinch, but neglect to resist. It must be because the market has crashed, you tell yourself, with the fact that I seem to have lost all shame. 10.07 a.m. Apparently, Motofusa Yamaguchi has devoted the first few minutes of his press conference to an elaborate, rambling apology to Seattle and all of its men, women, and children. Indeed, to humanity at large, for permitting strong drink to alter his rational responses, fog his judgment, and precipitate the farcical incident that occurred last evening, undermining perhaps public confidence in him and his medical methods. If the good doctor has lost face, however, if he is contemplating Harakiri to avoid further disgrace, it is not blatantly evident in his demeanor. There is, in fact, an amused twinkle in his eye as he sits alone at a small, spotlit table in a hotel meeting room, tapping his considerable teeth with a Bic lighter, while a more somber spokesman, someone from the staff of the Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, announces that Dr. Yamaguchi has decided to make public immediately certain details of his treatment that heretofore he had planned to reveal at tomorrow's international conference. Presumably, this is an effort to restore faith. At any rate, an excited buzzing can be heard among the roomful of reporters, and Larry Diamond increases ever so slightly the pressure on your thigh. You glance at him, trying to comprehend what he must be going through. Empathize as you might, you remain undecided about whether the fact of his cancer increases or lessens your feeling of squalor. Yamaguchi. Ah, first, that any question? Reporter. Yes, doctor. Do you have an alcohol problem? Yamaguchi. Of course. Every person who drink alcohol have problem. That why alcohol so popular. Make new problem for our entertainment. The scientist emits a shy chuckle. The reporter looks perplexed. Diamond grins and slaps the sofa with his free hand, the one that isn't fondling you. Gotta get this guy to the University of Timbuktu, he says.
Reporter, a different one. Can you tell us about that device of yours? The one that... Yamaguchi. Ah, happy you ask. One moment, please. The doctor lays down the bick, opens his case, removes a smaller case, opens that one, removes a slender object about five inches long, an object identical, as far as you can tell, to the one whose temporary disappearance caused all the commotion last night. He holds it aloft. Reporters, several in unison, What is it? Yamaguchi. I believe in English you call nozzle. Nozzle for enema. A riptide of murmuring cuts through the room. Photographers and cameramen crowd in for tighter angles. Reporter cautiously. Is there something special about this enema? Uh, nozzle? Yamaguchi shrugging. Oh, a little bit special. It's very old for one thing. It's made of jade for another thing. Jade and mineral crystal. You see? Holds it higher, rotates it in his fingers. It has a faint mint green glow. Reporter from back of room. What's the function of this nozzle? Yamaguchi. Function is to regulate and facilitate flow of solution into bowels. Reporter. Yet another one. Right, we understand, but what's so special about it? Yamaguchi. Oh, for one thing, it's very old. Regards it admiringly. Was personal enema nozzle for Empress of China two, three hundred years ago. For another thing, it's made of... Reporter exasperated. Yeah, but does it do something other ordinary nozzles can't do? Yamaguchi. Of course, yes. Pauses. It chew the rice. You turn to Diamond. Did he say it chews the rice? The reporters are looking at one another, asking the same question. The representative from Hutchinson, inadequately trying to conceal his panic and preserve what remains of the ostensibly soteriological nature of the occasion, speaks up. Dr. Yamaguchi... Could you please inform our guests? Could you explain exactly what you're getting at here? To the press, he says, Remember, ladies and gentlemen, English is not Dr. Yamaguchi's native tongue. Gwendolyn, my love, would you say that I have a native tongue? Naturally, you blush. Yet, try as you might, you cannot refrain from smiling. Yamaguchi. Secret of good health is chew. Person have nutritious diet, no matter if not well chewed. Many persons in industrial nations have secret malnutrition because don't chew food enough. You want long, healthy life? You chew, chew, chew. Okay? Now. Anima solution I give patients is made of, made of uh, uh, rice. Better carotene, I want two more things. Rice, unrefined, what you call brown rice, restore normal condition, good health to MCC gene. MCC start produce good protein. This allow tumor or polyp to go small, to shrink. It's simple, no? Ah, but one thing missing. Where chew? Must have chew for rice solution. Teeth, he retrieves big, plays his overbite like a xylophone, are in mouth, not rectum. Yes, so? No teeth in bowel, so nozzle must do all chewing. Pauses. How come nobody chew around here? Reporter. Which one doesn't matter? How does this nozzle of yours chew the rice and beta-carotene solution? Yamaguchi. As say down in Houston, Texas, beat the hell out of me. Reporter. You mean to say you don't have any idea how it works? Yamaguchi. I have idea. I think refraction of light by jade and crystal... Allow nozzle to do 
chewing. Ah, of course, I say down in Houston, we poor enema nozzle where sun don't shine. So I am not referred to literal light. I am referred to poetic light, to energy. Never have you seen a media mob so tongue-tied. Even those whose expressions indicate they believe they have uncovered a monumental quackery, even they are verbally unable to move in for the kill. Diamond seems thoroughly enthralled by the doctor's performance, so much so he has momentarily lost interest in making slow, maddening passes at the periphery of your pubis. Reporter, finally. Dr. Yamaguchi... Administering brown rice enemas through a jade and crystalline nozzle is going to enable us to destroy tumors? To conquer cancer? Yamaguchi. What you mean conquer? What you mean destroy? Western medicine all the time think in terms of destruction. In West, person gets virus, he wish kill it. Get tumor? Wish fire magic bullet at it. Not a healing, but a gunfight. Okay, Koran, eh? Points, nozzle at press corps, fires imaginary shot. My method, not warfare. My method is pacify. Make friend with tumor. Friendship with cancer. Change friend's diet. Teach friend good manners. General muttering. Reporter, last night you were very upset when you thought your nozzle had been stolen. Don't you have backup nozzles, or is this the only one in existence? Yamaguchi, ah, behind every star in sky is another star, but they are a long way apart. Reporter, doctor, you must appreciate that some of us are having trouble taking you seriously. Yamaguchi shrugs. Ah, as pop I say, I sweet potato, what I sweet potato. At this point, the visibly shaken spokesman from Hutchinson stands and gestures that the press conference is concluded. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. More information will be made available to you after tomorrow's presentation. Meanwhile, l let me remind you that while communication in these East-West areas can sometimes be problematic. Dr. Yamaguchi's successes in arresting colonic malignancies are impressive and verifiable. Uh, thank you once again. Having returned the nozzle to its case, Yamaguchi rises to leave. Suddenly, Diamond slides forward on the settee and yells at the TV screen, Hey, can your animus cure rectal cancers too? Poor guy, you think. Underneath his quirky savoir-faire, he's desperate. What he must be going through. Yamaguchi, looking into camera, treatment may also work for malignancy of rectum. He waves. 10.20 a.m. Jesus, Larry, how did you do that? As they say down in Houston, Texas, beats the hell out of me. I just started imitating some of the stuff I witnessed at Timbuktu. Sometimes it works for me. Usually it doesn't. Well, it's scary. Don't you think it's scary? Oh, it's no scarier than the bozo's familiarity with Sirius B. Most people are scared of those things that don't sit still and pose for our official portrait of reality, which means they have a hell of a lot to be scared about. I suppose that's why they're careful not to look very far in any direction. Speaking of sitting still, Twister has not budged. Yamaguchi's press conference, Diamond's outcry, the virtual fingering of you, can you believe it, a few feet behind his back, all passed unnoticed, as near as you can determine. You squint to attain a clearer view of the valuable drawing, you have simply got to relent and get contact lenses. That holds him so, but it remains a murky little rectangle on a big, shaky wall. Upstairs in the bowling alley, activity has gradually increased. As Diamond leads you to the door, you impulsively call out, How much is the Dutchman offering these days? What the heck? 
After the inflagrante delicto, the two of you should be on somewhat intimate terms. Twister neither moves nor speaks. Well, okay. It's not the first time you've been snubbed. Can't fault a girl for asking. Following Diamond into the vestibule, you hear a voice behind you, one of those folded-upon-itself tortilla voices that seems to have sifted through centuries of cornmeal and ashes. You hear the voice say, Two million and rumble crash, my goodness. Even before the Brunswick lightning struck, Twister was talking some jumbo juice. 10.25 a.m. Enemas, says Diamond as much to himself as to you. Irrigation. Timbuktu is in want of irrigation, and apparently so am I. A ritzy little irrigator, that nozzle. Tip, translucent carved out of some sort of colorless crystal, stem carved out of green jade. He shivers. Oof, I bet it's cold, don't you? She must have been a real dragon lady, that Chinese empress, shoving an icicle like that up her behind. The jade or the crystal or both interact molecularly somehow with Yamaguchi's home remedy. Hmm. You notice the old fox withheld a couple of ingredients and alter it so that it becomes electrochemically active on a subcellular level. If there's a carcinogenic virus involved, it would make sense, I guess. Viruses thrive on fats and sugars. Stuff like brown rice and broccoli, even when it's not been electrochemically mutated, pisses them off. They'd rather die than eat it. Come to think of it, we humans are a lot like that ourselves. Remember that, Gwendolyn, the next time you order deep-fried frog's legs. If there's a virus in you, it'll be egging you on. Come on, lady. Go for it. Send me down some fat. And how about chocolate mousse for dessert? Mmm. Of course, it's probably not a virus anywhere in your cute little system. Your little system's too cute for that. He runs his fingers through his long, stringy hair and treats you to one of his Halloween cackles. Well, enough of this, my precious hop toad. Let's see, where were we? Diamond means to resume something, although whether it is the slideshow or the sex, you cannot be sure. You are sitting meekly on the leather sofa while he paces back and forth between you and the projected image of the TU faculty, your ripped panties hanging out of his back pocket like a referee's penalty flag waiting to be thrown. The truth is, you do not really have a lot of time for either slides or sex. After all, Belford is due home at ten this evening, the London Exchange opens a few hours later, and at six tomorrow morning... Oh, God, you will be back at the disco to face Posner, your clients, what's left of the market, and the fates who have mocked you throughout your whole damn career. Meanwhile, there is a deal to set in motion, a monkey to be outwitted, and... Cujo. Poor Cujo. You should try calling her again right now. You stand up and are looking about for a phone when Diamond slips an arm around your waist and draws you into an embrace. Oh, well, it's doubtful if you would be able to concentrate on the tasks ahead anyway until you get this out of the way. If Larry will just take me to bed and make love to me... Okay. Fuck me for twenty minutes. Okay. An hour. I'm certain I'll be able to think a lot more clearly. And so will he. Poor fellow. You snuggle up against the lump in his groin... When you kiss, you stick your tongue in his mouth. It's kind of exciting in there. Of course you are disgusted with yourself. Never have you felt like such a mare. Sure, you've been aroused before. For better or for worse, arousal is a feature of the human condition. And even nuns, even female CEOs, so you are told, do not wholly transcend it. It is the curse of the meat. And a woman must learn to live with it. No, a woman must learn to leverage it, to hedge it, to manage it, to make it work for her, to politely sample its undeniable, if 
shoddy pleasures when it announces itself and to refrain from either stressful fasts or mindless binges. She must familiarize herself with it, exploit it when it is exploitable, but never, ever get careless around it. Otherwise, it will turn on her like the lean and famished wolf that the maiden, in her innocence, invites to sleep on the hearth, and she will become its supper, or its slave, or worse, its rival, a famished she-wolf who eats herself out of emotional house and independent home. She will fuck her dreams away and settle for lesser goals. No, the wolf is no stranger to you, but... You cannot recall a time when its howl was so melodious, its pelt so downy, its carnivore's breath so sweet. For once, you do not mind that sex is gooey or smells like Cupid's socks. You find yourself wanting Diamond to do dirty, nasty, unspeakable things to you, although you have scant notion what those things might be. They are beyond your powers of imagination. For all you know, they might be painful or overly strenuous, and certainly they would be time-consuming. They would cut into your day. I sure picked a fine time to get horny, you think. You make a face inasmuch as one can make a face while kissing. Horny is a proletarian expression, a cartoonish word, a word for clowns, galoots, and adolescents. My desires may be crude, but they aren't frivolous. It would take a far more complicated and heartfelt word than horny to measure the dimensions of my wet itch. You reach behind you and undo buttons. The sound your skirt makes when it cascades to the floor, a sound so muted and brief, yet so emphatic, bold, and rife with liberation, the frumph of a sail unfurling on a blockade runner's sloop, that sound sends a delicious tingle up your spine. Diamond reacts by slowly twisting free of your tongue, giving your bare bottom a baby pinch, he says. Gwendolen, I'm hesitant to suggest such a thing, but I wonder if you would object to... Yes, yes, what is it, Larry? What dirty, nasty, unspeakable thing does he want to do to you? Or want you, <gasps> gasp, to do to him? What filth and degradation has he in mind? You are palpitating like a gospel singer in a church fire. What kinky, slinky, licky, sticky, sucky? What revolting forbidden practices will be forced upon you? What accoutrement might be required? And how many of your major orifices will they involve? Yes, Larry, yes. I wonder if you would object to accompanying me to... A lecture on frogs. 10.47 a.m. Thus it is that you find yourself frustrated, demeaned, yet oddly buoyant on the back of Diamond's scooter. He grinned at you knowingly in his most irritating fashion when you explained that you had arrived by taxi, backfiring across the Ballard Bridge, leaving Thunder House, its faux tempest, its Timbuktuian poetics, its dark and dinky Van Gogh drawing, worth two million and change in Amsterdam, its draconic shadows and love-stained Keelum behind, headed by way of Queen Anne Hill to the Pacific Science Center, where, as part of the final day's activities at the Reptile and Amphibian Fair, there is scheduled at 11.30 a lecture entitled, A Silence in the Swamps. You had insisted on going by way of Queen Anne in order that you might stop off at your building to check for news of Cujo, you told Diamond, although news of Andre is just as eagerly sought, and to that end you will direct Diamond to stop off first at Belford's place and then, if warranted by events, at a grocery store. The burial cloths and egg whites through which the rising sun had surfaced are still present in much of the sky. The air is mild enough when one is afoot in it, but as it breaks about the scooter, it takes on a bit of a chill. You cling to Diamond for protection, protection from wind, protection from detection. It is unlikely, but what if someone with whom you do business should spot you aboard this ridiculous machine with this unkempt companion upon an Easter morn? 
They wouldn't even have to know that your bottom is bare and sticky and cold against the ratty leather seat. Diamond reeks of deteriorating leather, of sugary foliage, of you. A contradictory combination that provokes in you a certain tenderness. You slip your arms around his waist and bury your face in his back. Then your downcast eyes spot your ravaged undies, blooming like a magician's handkerchief in his back pocket. You yank them out, resist the temptation to swing them above your head for the benefit of passing motorists, and as the scooter pulls off Elliott Avenue to begin its laborious ascent of the hill, you sling them over a hedge bordering a modest lawn. Fly away, be free. You sing and then instantly admonish yourself for your light-minded behavior. Someone will probably discover those panties and turn them over to the police. A memento from the safe sex rapist or a souvenir of a rich boy prank, although few, if any, women whom the rich boys disrobe have ever stepped into knickers as stylish as these. 11.23 a.m. Got him. You got him. Let economies lose their wheels and minds their reason. Let hormones go ballistic and prayers go unanswered. Let daddies box bongos and employers box ears. Let hairs turn gray and inks crimson. Let the fates break off in mid-chortle, for sooner or later, Gwendolyn Maria Matty was bound to outwit them. You got Andre. You got the Mad Monk. Only a cursory survey of Belford's apartment, you are feeling pretty guilty about Belford, but you mustn't think of that now, was required to determine that Andre had feasted there on the sweet baits of the morning. The freezer door again hung open, and naked popsicle sticks were strewn about like yarrow stocks after an I Ching typhoon. One needn't be a primatologist or an Interpol sleuth to predict that the macaque would move on to your place, Belford's former residence, looking for more treats once these were digested. You had had Diamond swing by Thriftway. He putted right up to the entrance, practically driving the scooter inside the store, embarrassing you painfully, where you purchased another carton of banana ice and avoided the cashier's stare. To Diamond's credit, nothing seems to surprise him, he did not question your errand, but drove you and your plastic bag to your building, where he was content, again, to wait in the parking lot. A kiss with a flicker of tongue assured him you would not be long. Your freezer door was also open, and a package of baby bok choy lay defrosting in the middle of your living room floor next to your mother's poems. People do sometimes conceal jewelry inside hollowed-out books, but if he supposes anybody would hide a popsicle in a volume of verse, this monkey is not as smart as he is cracked up to be. Anyway, you had missed him, but odds were highly favorable that he would return, so you left a popsicle on each of several different windowsills and put the rest in the freezer. I hope this stupid lecture doesn't peep and croak all day, you thought, as you wriggled into a fresh pair of underpants. You listened to your phone messages, all from Belford and mostly pitiful, and left without locking up, although locks had seldom been challenging to Andre in the years before he accepted the Lord as his savior. There was no response to your hopeful depression of Cujo's buzzer, and you were about to hurry on down the hall when your nostrils contracted, and your incongruously narrow proboscis began to behave as if it were packed with jumping beans and gunpowder. The aroma that drifted through the seams around the door was that of Cujo's tobacco. There was no mistaking that smell. Cujo's was the tobacco Satan would smoke, if smoking in hell was not redundant, and only your father's marijuana was more familiar and more offensive to your nose. Maceless now but brazen, you let yourself in, expecting who knows what. Cujo, maybe gone insane from her trifling with supernatural forces, crouched in a corner, drooling, smoking, staring into space through rubbery eyes. What you found instead was Andre. The monkey, a pouty expression on his face, was bouncing up and down in an overstuffed chair, looking like a pygmy Elvis impersonator from the Congolese club circuit, and he was puffing on a cigarette he had rolled himself. The cigarette was a splayed, shaggy, droopy mess, 
But then Kyujo didn't roll them much better, and she had fully opposable thumbs. Faking nonchalance, you spoke in your most gentle storybook voice. Hi, Andre. Hi, honey. Nice to see you. Hi. You sit right there, and Auntie Gwen will bring you something delicious. Okay, dear? Okay? Slowly, softly, you pulled the door shut. Then you sprinted down the hall like Jackie Joyner Kersey with a wasp in her shorts. You snatched the box of popsicles from the freezer and tore back to Cujo's at top speed, praying all the while that he hadn't fled. Here, honey. Look here. Look at what I have for you. As he ripped the offering out of your hand, he blew a river of acrid smoke in your face, causing you to choke and very nearly a wretch. You almost gave yourself a hiatal hernia trying to suppress a cough, but you held your ground and presented the rest of the popsicles, while Andre busied himself removing the paper wrappers and trying to figure out how to eat and smoke at the same time, a trick he could have learned in any redneck restaurant, you got a hammer and nails from the pantry and, as unobtrusively as possible, nailed each and every window shut, including the transom. You filled a bowl with water and canned fruit punch and emptied what was left of your last Valium prescription into the liquid to dissolve. You set the bowl on the floor by his chair. Here, honey, in case you get thirsty. Stamped out the fire that was beginning to smolder on the carpet, for he finally had jettisoned the cigarette and backed geisha-like, you were getting good at this, to the door. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. You enjoy yourself, and Gwendolyn will be back in a little while. Okay? Bye-bye. Happy Easter. You engaged both locks and drove in a few nails for good measure. There. That ought to hold you, you little bastard. I've got you. 11.24 a.m. Got him! There are a half dozen residents gathered in the downstairs lobby, and one of them says to you, Got him! Beg your pardon? How the hell did they know? These people are as nosy as they are unsophisticated. You have simply got to move into a higher-class building. They got him! Who? Why, the rapist! They missed him earlier, but they got him now! Oh, my God. Mrs. Kudal spotted him in the parking lot and called the cops. Good grief. Shoving neighbors aside, you rush outdoors, where you spend the next ten minutes persuading the police that the man they have up against the wall is a friend of yours. You, an owner here, and despite his appearance, a law-abiding citizen. There is generous scoffing and eye-rolling on the part of Smokey and Cecil, who are of a mind to put you up against the wall as well. On top of everything else, you are absent-mindedly brandishing a hammer, but eventually do as much to lack of evidence as to your brokerage-honed skills at salesmanship, they are forced to release him. There is one last thing. In patting down the suspect, looking for weapons or condoms or what, Smokey had found a large roll of currency, and they want to know why Diamond is packing this cash. Surely, officer, says Diamond, it has not escaped one as observant as you that I am also in possession of airline tickets. I'm going away tomorrow to visit my dear parents, missionaries spreading the gospel in a distant and heathen land. And surely someone as informed as you is aware of the sad and disgraceful fact that American credit cards are not as enthusiastically welcomed abroad as they once were. This may seem a sizable amount of moolah, but with the dollar in its present weakened condition, godless foreign hustlers will consider it chicken feed. So they let him go. Cecil's parting words to you are, Lady, I don't know what your story is, but I don't ever want to run into you again, and I mean never. Don't worry, officer. As they climb into their squad car, you turn to Diamond. Where are you going, Larry? The reptile and amphibian fair is my announced destination. I mean, tomorrow. Is that a catch in your throat? I'll explain later, Pussy Dumpling. 
The lecture started five minutes ago, and I'm afraid my scooter's given up the ghost. All right, let's take the Porsche. 11.50 a.m. Where have all the froggies gone? That is the subject of the talk at the Pacific Science Center's lecture hall. You must confess that you had not missed them in the slightest. But, obviously, some folks noticed, because the speaker, a mild, bearded, 35-ish herpetologist in jeans, blue work shirt, why do people who can afford better choose to marginalize themselves in the garb of the field hand? And Tweed Jacket is reeling off statistics when you and Diamond join the surprisingly large audience, you would guess 80 to 100 people, and apparently he has been doing so for some time. These figures are the results of various independent surveys conducted by scientists worldwide, and they strongly indicate that there has been a sudden, baffling, and alarming decline in the planet's frog population. As he reads the findings of each survey, the herpetologist chalks the name of yet another disappearing species on his blackboard. There were more than a dozen listed when you arrived, and to these he adds, Golden Toad? Bufo Boreas, Harlequin Frog, Yellow-Legged Mountain Frog, and Canadian Chorus Frog. My goodness. You hoped the chef at the Bull and Bear had not placed the lower extremities of one of these particular creatures on your dinner plate last evening. On the other hand, what does it matter? The last whole frog you recall seeing was the one you were forced to dismember, yuck, in high school biology class, and in all honesty, you have not felt in the least deprived. If these nerds were as concerned about the decline in the crisp green dollar as in the slimy green frog, maybe you would be closing on your new condominium next week. For 200 million years, frogs have survived floods, droughts, glaciers, meteorites, volcanic eruptions, and whatever else killed off the dinosaurs. For 200 million springs, through ice ages and fiery cataclysms, they serenaded Mother Earth. Now their song is almost done. Without some miraculous recovery, we estimate that half of the world's 3,800 known species of frogs and toads will be extinct within 20 years. Gee, you think, that still leaves 1,900 species. How many varieties of creepy little peepers does one planet need? You glance at Diamond. He winks. As if, in answer to your question, the speaker explains that for every creepy little peeper who succumbs, an untold number of bugs will thrive. The decline in frogs creates a field day for insects, he says, and he cites the rise in crop destruction, mosquitoes, and malaria in parts of Asia where native frogs have all but bought the ranch. Is this good news for your shares in Union Carbide? And as frogs dwindle, Birds, fish, lizards, snakes, and small mammals dwindle, too, for many, many creatures lunch regularly, if not exclusively, on amphibians. They are a vital link in the food chain. Cujo told you that when she stayed home sick from school, her mother would feed her alphabet soup. Every time she threw up, Cujo would check the puddle to see if the little pasta letters spelled out anything. For the psychic, omens are everywhere, you suppose, but for some reason... You can never hear the term food chain without thinking of Kyujo's story and feeling a twinge of nausea. It isn't simply a matter of saving frogs. Oh? There's a kind of domino effect operating here, and the frog is just the first domino in line. The more biological diversity we lose, the less flexibility we have to create new food sources that can tolerate the new environmental conditions that progress is spawning. Today, the frog. Tomorrow, the bird. The day after that, who knows? As Dr. Richard L. Wyman of the State University of New York has said, we don't know how many species can be lost before the system as a whole ceases to function. In the past, life responded to change through evolution, and that process depends on genetic diversity. If everything's the same, evolution stops. Now isn't that a scary thought? Throughout the small auditorium, there is a low hum of concern. Looking around at the audience, you are struck by its lack of diversity. Virtually everyone, 
regardless of age or gender, is wearing a down-filled nylon vest over a plaid flannel shirt. For decades, this expression of backpacker chic has been the unofficial uniform of Seattle's white middle class, and now you have to wonder if uniformity might not be partially at fault for the demise of the bourgeoisie. But is there less standardization among the poor, whose numbers are escalating, or the rich, who are holding their own, and successfully resisting efforts by you and others like you to infiltrate them? This line of thought leads directly to an introspective examination of your present situation, financial and personal, and you are only half listening as the speaker explores possible causes of the dramatic and mysterious amphibian decimation. If it were human encroachment and habitat destruction alone, it wouldn't be quite so problematic. Pesticides and herbicides have been devastating, clearly, and a lot of people point fingers at acid rain. But 50 miles from here, frogs are vanishing from pristine Cascade Mountain lakes, where repeated measurements reveal no acidification, nor, for that matter, pollutants of any kind. This suggests that what may be responsible is an increase in ultraviolet radiation. But since, thanks to governmental and corporate opposition, we lack the data that might show whether UV radiation is actually increasing or not, we can only speculate. Most likely, what's killing off our frogs is a complex mixture of global environmental changes. Because, in the course of their lives, they live both underwater and on land, eat both vegetation and insects, and are covered by a permeable skin that offers little protection from the external world. Frogs are the ideal barometers of planetary health. Frogs are telling us something about the general condition of Earth's environment, and the news is not reassuring. For tens of millions of years, They've been such hardy survivors that it makes the fact that they're now all of a sudden hurtling toward extinction all the more of a dire warning. Frogs may be the proverbial canary in the coal mine, except that when the canary keeled over, workers could evacuate the mine. We can't leave the planet. We shouldn't have to. He takes a breather, and the silence snaps you out of your introspection. Are there any questions? You lean into Diamond. I have questions, you whisper. Are you really going away tomorrow? And if so, where are you going? What do you intend to do about connecting with Dr. Yamaguchi so that you can arrange to get treatments? Was Kujo locked in the Thunder House the way I was? Why are you attracted to someone like me when we're such opposites? Is it sheer animal appetite? And did you know all along that I'd be an easy conquest? And is there actually a serious sea? It is plain to Diamond that you have not been paying attention to the lecture, and he glares at you accusingly. Sorry, pussy sugar, he says, but all queries must address the topic at hand. He grins at you in that disturbing, maniacal manner of his, and then he stands and grins at the herpetologist and the audience in the very same fashion. Since the sole function of the majority of the human race, he begins in his elongated nasal drawl, is to eat, shit, procreate, and watch television. Oh, good grief. And since those few who aren't outright larcenous and violent are fearful, ignorant, and most of all insensitive, there is a shuffling of Birkenstocks and rock ports. The audience is not thrilled with the comments of this wild-looking individual, and neither, frankly, are you. And since their collective greed and imbecility has shoved the entire biosphere to the brink of oblivion, now there are random nods of agreement. And since our so-called leaders, political, commercial, and religious, deserve to be mashed to jelly and sandwiched between hunks of ripe Limburger. Careful, mister, you hear someone exclaim. And since the newspapers and magazines that support these shysters are fit for nothing but outhouse bung fodder, won't he please sit down and shut up?
And since everybody has a hard luck story, including the frogs... Excuse me, sir, says the herpetologist. Excuse me. Do you have a question? I'm reluctant to propose that the depletion of our amphibian population might be due to something other than the foul and feckless follies of our fellows, or that what seems like a biospheric catastrophe might actually be a positive and hopeful sign. I'm hesitant to propose these possibilities, but I must. Abruptly, everyone is on the edge of his or her seat, and the herpetologist, who had been politely trying to silence him, guardedly bids Diamond continue. Diamond is, as he would put it, merry and bright. It would appear that you alone are cringing. As you erudite people well know, the word amphibian comes from the Greek amphi and bios, meaning to live a double life. This refers, needless to say, to an ability to live both in water and on land. In that regard, amphibians are the most adaptable creatures in the world, the ones, ironically, best suited for residence here. But as those of you who've read spy stories or had extramarital affairs are aware, a double life implies a clandestine life, a life of secret behaviors. Now, a frog is a little dumb animal with a poot-sized brain. It probably isn't the custodian of a hell of a lot of covert information. No, indeed. But rather than possessing secrets, suppose a frog is a secret, a secret link. This would be a prudent time to head for the ladies' room if not the Porsche, except that Diamond, the man who everyone in the auditorium knows is your escort, is blocking the aisle. The amphibian is the bridge between the terrestrial and the aquatic. I invite you to consider that it may also be a bridge between our water planet and the largely arid galaxy. A bridge between Earth and the stars. A bridge, most importantly, between the mind of man and the cosmic overmind. And, of course, it's the biological bridge between the fishes, which many identify with Jesus Christ, and the reptiles, which many identify with Satan. Members of the audience, some amused, others uneasy or anxious, are regarding him as if he could be in that case after all. You, your face as stinging red as a freshly skinned knee, refuse even to glance in his direction. To think, a few short minutes ago, you were entertaining the girlish notion that you could be developing a romantic attachment to him. In fairness to Diamond, granted an opportunity to elucidate, he might oxidize a patina of credibility on his screwball postulates. Alas, when he says, I'm going to ask you to consider that hyper-intelligent entities, agents of the overmind, aliens, if you will, could be abducting our frogs as part of a benign scheme to free us from the tyranny of the historical continuum and reunite our souls with the other dimensional. You spoil his chances by shooting to your feet, rushing past him and hustling from the auditorium. You pray he won't follow. But as you hurry between the reflecting pools and salt-white arches, virtually sobbing from embarrassment and remorse, how could you have permitted unruly bodily cravings to temporarily blind you to his dementia? You hear him shout, Wait, Pussy Pudding, hold up, wait for me. You haven't heard the punchline. Sunday afternoon, April 8th. Starting out as seafood. 12.17 p.m. The creature is the size of a standard poodle. It has a body of crunchy armor, several more legs than good taste dictates, 
long, wiggly antennae that seem to be sorting through atmospheric molecules like old women buying tomatoes, and eyes that are all pupil and no expression, yet follow your every move as if heat-seeking scanners had been implanted in a pair of black golf balls. It's a repulsive, willy-giving thing, but it's the monster beside it that scares you. After your mother threw herself in front of a cement truck, Grandma Maddie, with sewing shears, snipped her image out of every photograph in the family album, whether from Filipino superstition or ordinary malice, you could not say. In any case, you wish you had a pair of scissors capable of cutting Larry Diamond out of the reflection the two of you are casting in this plate glass window. On second thought, maybe you ought to snip out your own image and leave his there. The window in a storefront alongside which your Porsche is parked belongs to a pest control business and is occupied by a holographic cockroach as large as an ocelot. It is the roach that's out of place, for roaches are fairly rare intruders in the northerly clime of Seattle, whereas diamond, from your point of view, would be a plague at any latitude. My, my, says diamond, ignoring the fact that you have been trying to ignore him. It would take a frog of considerable girth to lunch on this entomological entree. Makes me curious about what the Nomo might eat. Listen, Larry, you say, doing your best to coach your sing-song with a husky phlegm. It just isn't going to work out with you and me. Work out? He seems genuinely puzzled. Yes, you know, it isn't going to lead anywhere. Oh, you'd be surprised where it might lead. I bet I would. But it isn't. I mean, as a relationship, it has zero future. Future? Oh, I get it. You mean you don't foresee a pot of gold at the end of our juicy rainbow? You mean that our intimacy isn't likely to yield a dividend? You disappoint me, Gwendolyn. I hoped you might have a watt or two more light in your bulb than those poor toads who look on romance as an investment like waterfront property or municipal bonds. Would you complain because a beautiful sunset doesn't have a future or a shooting star, a payoff? And why should romance lead anywhere? Passion isn't a path through the woods. Passion is the woods. It's the deepest, wildest part of the forest. The grove where the fairies still dance and obscene old vipers snooze in the boughs. Everybody but the most dried up and dysfunctional is drawn to the grove and enchanted by its mysteries, but then they just can't wait to call in the chainsaws and bulldozers and replace it with a family-style restaurant or a new S&L. That's the payoff, I guess. Safety. Security. Certainty. Yes, indeed. Well, remember this, Pussy Latte. We're not involved in a relationship, you and I. We're involved in a collision. Collisions don't much lend themselves to secure futures. But the act of colliding is hard to beat for interest. Correct me if I'm wrong. You can't argue that your encounter with Diamond hasn't been interesting. And no matter what he might presume, you, of all women, do not regard every male you meet as a potential partner in a domestic compromise. But fairies? First he makes fools, fools, of you both by raving in public about frog-nappers from outer space, and now he's talking fairies, please. If it's all a joke, let him share it with a cockroach. You have other chores. It's disappointing, because I was rather hoping we could have done some business together. I've got a plan, but it's best I do it on my own. As for the, uh, sex part, those things happen. No regrets. As long as you're disease-free, you are, aren't you? He merely grins, and the reflected grin looks by no means out of place next to the vermin in the window. See? You're impossible. The irony of asking a cancer victim if he is disease-free has lost on you. 
and I absolutely cannot deal with these public displays of yours. Your scenes. Really? I thought you were quite a sport at the Bull and Bear last night. Okay, damn it, I've been a little out of control lately. I've been flighty at times. This is not an easy time for me. But that's not who I am. Who are you, Gwendolyn? You sigh, bite the kiss sack you call your lower lip, and turn away from the window. I'm a... I'm a black ball jockey on a lame horse in a fixed race, but I'm not a quitter. I'll ride to the finish, and I'll ride alone. Now, if you want, I'm willing to drive you back to the bowling alley, but that's the extent of it. I've got moves to make. As you rummage for your car keys, he taps the plate glass next to the giant roach. Gwendolyn, he says, if our child should turn out like this, would you love it anyway? 12.22 p.m. Diamond accepts a lift, but not to Thunder House. He requests to be driven to the Sorrento, the aging but still graceful hotel on First Hill where Dr. Yamaguchi is reportedly staying. I've got moves of my own, he says. He lays a hand on your thigh. You slap it away. No, Larry, please, it's after the bell, okay? My life's hectic enough right now. I'm not sure I could even handle a normal relationship, but certainly the last thing in the world I need is some kind of collision. Au contraire. A collision is exactly what you do need, because collisions are transformative. A relationship can occasionally fulfill a person, but only a collision can transform them. It's the same for cultures as for individuals. Shall I cite historical examples? What makes you think, Mr. Arrogant, that I need to be transformed? Because that's what we're here for. It's obvious. Or do you think we're here to service our debt? I'm a growing person. I've grown a lot. How would you know whether I've grown or not? I'm not talking about growth. Little tadpoles don't just grow into big tadpoles and call themselves frogs the way little children grow into big children and call themselves adults. Tadpoles are transformed into something entirely other. You are about to shriek, Who gives a hoot what tadpoles do? When you are forced to slam on the brakes to avoid plowing into a shopping cart train that is crossing the intersection at First and Denny against the light. Around six months ago, several of those homeless individuals who push all of their earthly belongings, and often the day's pickings from refuse cans, along the streets in appropriated supermarket carts, got the bright idea to start convoying. It quickly caught on. Nowadays there are convoys, or trains as they are called, 30 or 40 carts long, and they have attained a certain amount of protection from cops, the rich boys, and bullying peers, and a certain amount of power, especially over motorists, for downtown traffic is frequently at the mercy of these squeaky-wheeled, slow-moving, irreverent caravans of detritus and desperation. You are both vexed by the delay and rattled by its source, but Diamond surveys the scene with an expression of wonder. Can you picture them traversing the Sahara, he asks, on their way to Timbuktu? And his wonderment only increases when, a few blocks farther, you see a toolless burglar smash a car windshield with his head. A procession of hysterical, half-naked Christians flagellating themselves with strips of steel-belted radials and a cadre of neo-Marxists extolling the joys and benefits of bloody revolution to clusters of purple-lipped winos, hip-hopping crack runners, and a few dazed couples newly exiled from suburbs that no jacuzzi salesman will ever cruise again. Lining the curbs like storks on a rail, and sometimes executing disjointed Veronicas in traffic, as if bullfighting were an event in the Special Olympics, panhandlers of all ages, races, social backgrounds, and degrees of mental health screech, mumble, warble, and whine their pleas for alms. And as you pass the corner of First and Stewart, you can swear you hear the strains of a familiar theme being played on a Jew's harp. 
Diamond must have noticed your grimace because he says, Yes, yes, I agree. It's much too early for strangers in the night. If the guy had his wits about him, he'd ply us with a diurnal tune. With that, he throws his head back and launches into zippity doo dah. I really don't understand how you can be amused by this degradation. Congratulations, Hop Toad. Once again, you've hit upon the wrong word. The theater of man is not always amusing, but it is always theater. And theater can be marveled at even when its content is sober and harsh. You're acquainted with Greek tragedy. The next thing you know, you're sounding like Belford Dunn. These people aren't performing, for God's sake. Their misery is real. Everybody's performing. We only think it's real. Oh, is that another nugget of wisdom you dug up in Timbuktu? I hope you make it in to see Yama Goofy. He'll give you a free enema just to hear you yak. You swerve to miss one jaywalking wino and then another. If the Titanic had been a Porsche, it would still be afloat. Of course, if winos were icebergs, scabs would wear snowshoes and fleas would need picks. I have a friend, you say, who believes that it's our fault these people are in the streets and our duty to shelter and feed them. It may have made sense at one time, but now there's so many of them. Yes, isn't it grand? A bum or two on a corner is a bittersweet vignette, but this, this is spectacle. Numbers aside, your friend is a presumptuous twit to be assigning blame and delegating duty. Your friend insults the homeless by giving them no credit for having made the decisions that shape their lives, that demeans them further by declaring them powerless to alter their situations. There are many ways, my dear, to victimize people. The most insidious way is to persuade them that they're victims. Now, wait a minute, Larry. You try, quite hypocritically, to approach it from Belford's point of view. I doubt very much if anybody chose this as a way of life. I mean, can you see the kids hanging out at the video parlor after school... One says he wants to be an engineer some day. A couple want to be lawyers. A girl's ambition is to study veterinary medicine. And then this other kid says, Gee, I think I'll be a homeless person. Or else a stinking toothless wino who sleeps on cold cement. I don't buy that. Nor do I. And yet, except for the legitimately congenitally insane... Each and every one of them is where they are because of choices they made. Dumb choices. At some point, the gods placed two sealed bags in their vicinity and said, Choose. One bag had a pepperoni in it, and one had a turd. Now, if they had bothered to examine the bags to squeeze or shake or smell them, Pepperoni having a decidedly different feel, bounce, and fragrance from its excremental counterpart. Well, you get the picture. But because the turd bag was closer at hand and they didn't have to exert themselves to retrieve it or because it looked to be lighter and thus easier to carry or larger and thus promised more of something for nothing, or because the turd bag was decorated in the colors of their favorite team, maybe somebody else chose for them. That's very often the case, but we can choose to make our own choices. Easier said than done. What isn't? I mean, if you're going to complain because there frequently are extenuating circumstances or because we're forced to choose bags when we're too young or uninformed to know what we're doing, you'll have to take it up with the gods. Uncle Larry didn't invent the system. All Uncle Larry is saying is that individuals have to accept responsibility for their own bad choices. 
If every time we choose a turd, society at great expense simply allows us to redeem it for a pepperoni, then not only will we never learn to make smart choices, we will also surrender the freedom to choose because a choice without consequences is no choice at all. Maybe it boils down to the premium we want to place on liberty. It's numero uno in Uncle Larry's book, far out in front of food and shelter, though only a clam whisker ahead of your little... Stop it! If the poor should rather be racing on the Autobahn at 120 miles per hour than idling through a stream of vaguely hostile pedestrians at First and Pike, gateway to the fabled Pike Place Market and center of the wino universe, it doesn't let on. The throttled back Porsche behaves as if it is sipping brandy and puffing a cigar in the library of a Bavarian hunting lodge. If only you were as equanimous. For years the down and out have secretly annoyed you, and for years Belford's teary-eyed concern for them has made you feel guilty. Now here is a guy suggesting that both annoyance and concern may be misplaced, that the homeless are simply players in one great pageant and may be essential, even intrinsic, to the plot. At least you think that is what he is saying, resisting more out of fear than kindness the urge to honk your horn at the actors who are clotting the crosswalk. You say, the fact is, Larry, there are people out there who did choose your pepperoni, who grabbed it and ran with it, who didn't quit school or flunk out, who didn't rob a convenience store or steal a car or get pregnant, get married too young, or get hooked on booze or crack. People who made the most of a happy childhood or transcended a rotten one, who worked hard and made a success of themselves in business only to have the rug yanked out from under them when the economy went south. What about them? Aren't they victims? They are if they think they are. Everybody's got a hard luck story, that's all you have to say? A temporary break in the procession allows you to gun the Porsche through the intersection. I apologize if my incipient boredom is a millstone around the neck of this conversation, but as far as I'm concerned, these matters are all sociology and noise. Noise and sociology. I should remind you, however, that authority and fate can be outwitted and that for every actual victim in our culture, there's a hundred who victimize and trivialize themselves by indulging their anger and nursing their bitterness. zibbity doo da And that's all you have to say? I wouldn't have said that much if you weren't such a little mango bruiser. Come on, pussy butter. Don't call me that. Apparently, you want me to chirp a lament for our brothers and sisters in the financial sector, but the ice capades will be touring hell before your doomed colleagues inflate a gas bubble of sympathy in my dirty breast. Ruined investors and bankrupt bookies alike, most of them set themselves up for whatever's happened to them by buying into the lie. Did they now? And what lie is that? The lie of progress. The lie of unlimited expansion. The lie of grow or perish. Listen, we built ourselves a fine commercial bonfire. And then instead of basking in its warmth, toasting marshmallows over it, and reading the classics by its light, we became obsessed with making it bigger and hotter, bigger and hotter, until if the flames didn't leap higher from one quarter to the next, it was cause for great worry and dissatisfaction. Well, any bozo on the riverbank could have told us that if you keep feeding and feeding and feeding a bonfire, sooner or later you burn up all the fuel and the fire goes cold. Or else the fire gets too huge to manage and eventually engulfs the countryside and chars its inhabitants. Nature has always set limits on growth, limits on the physical size of individual species, limits on the size of populations. 
Did we really believe capitalism was exempt from the laws of nature? Did we really confuse endless consumption with endless progress? Benjamin de Casseres, a Frenchman who lectured at Timbuktu, defined progress as the victory of laughter over dogma. Now there's a victory worth celebrating. In English, there is a quaint expression, making good time. A colloquialism that, if taken literally, implies that time is something that can be crafted or manufactured, and either poorly so or else expertly, a notion every bit as fanciful and illogical as naming a star sitting trouser, until one becomes acquainted with quantum physics, whereupon one learns that time, as measured by clocks on Earth, is indeed a contrivance, a thing we have conveniently made up. Moreover, the better time we make, which is to say the faster we go, the less time there is, so that by the time we reach the speed of light, there is no time at all, indicating perhaps that the only good time is a dead time. Something else to ponder is that if higher science has justified the figure of speech making good time, might not it someday validate the name Sitting Trouser as well? For the moment, however, it is enough to say that you are fairly flying along First Avenue, making good time at last on your trip to the Hotel Sorrento. You downshift, turn eastward up Marion, and within a few steep blocks leave the last remnants of the spectacle behind. Soon, shopping cart convoys will have been replaced by luxury automobiles, derelicts eclipsed by folk in Easter finery. This lifts your spirits, and there is barely an accusatory burr in your voice when you say to Diamond, You're a man who's turned against money. He omits half a cackle, the bottom half. That's like saying, I've turned against the crowbar or the hoe. But that's like saying, I've turned against the stunt double. The what? the surrogate who stands in for principles and does their stunts for them. Oh, you say, but you don't quite get it. Surely, my dear, I'm not so obtuse that you've mistaken me for an ascetic, one of those self-destructive poverty snobs. Have you ever seen an ascetic who was merry and bright? Have you ever heard of a saint who was creative, brilliant, attractive or anything beside a masochist, sexually dysfunctional, unnatural egotist who thinks he or she's spiritually superior to you because he or she revels in misery and you don't. People who bought into poverty are just as shallow and exploitative as those who bought into wealth. Both have been stultified by their lack of imagination. Well, it's certainly not your problem. I'll accept that as a compliment, especially since, as an autistic child, I began life with no imagination whatsoever. Why, when I was six years old, I was as prosaic as a bean counter in a bureau. Honest? I remember you saying you'd been autistic, but I thought it was one of your jokes. As seen from the pad, it's all a joke. Even autism. But there are good jokes and bad jokes. And autism on its own terms is worse than that chicken that keeps crossing that road. I'm afraid I don't know much about it. But I, I guess the doctors don't either. My theory, and few if any doctors subscribe to it, is that unlike ordinary emotional disorders, which, as Papa Freud taught us, are usually the result of a childhood trauma. Autism is the result of fetal trauma, something that disturbs us while we're still in the waters of the womb, while we're in our minnow stage. I mean minnow stage, literally, by the way. We all start out as seafood. Not wishing to test those waters, you ask, how were you able to overcome it? The autism... Dolphins cured me. Good grief. You give him a look that prompts him to say, Don't give me that look. 
Save that look for the apologists at your disco tomorrow. When I was eight, my parents took my sisters and me to a place in Florida where we could swim with dolphins. After an hour, I came out of the water and asked for a peanut butter sandwich. Up to that point, I'd never spoken. Not one word. The next day, we did it again. This time, I emerged from the water and hugged my father. It was the first time I'd voluntarily touched another human being. My dad took leave of his absence from his job, and we stayed at Grassy Key for several months. I swam every day with the dolphins, and by the time I was nine, I was a so-called normal boy, a very naughty boy, but by psychiatric standards, normal. Autistic children are disappeared into themselves. The dolphins broke through, went in there, and brought me back. How? We could communicate, the dolphins and I, because we were on the same level, the self-contained intrauterine level, the submarine level. Emotionally, autistic children are still in the womb, underwater. They can't relate to land animals, to life in the air. Somehow, the dolphin showed me how to make the transition from a liquid to a gaseous environment. It seems perfectly logical. It's well known that depression and hypertension can be reduced by simply observing fish in a tank. Maybe that explains why I'm a nomophile? Not entirely. However, it's safe to say that I am more disposed than most to drawing major conclusions from the arcane aquatic traditions of the bozo. But you don't want to talk about that. You want to talk about money. That's unfair. Money's not the only thing. I'm. Don't be defensive. It'd be a bad sign if you weren't inclined toward abundance. Abundance in all things, material, emotional, intellectual, spiritual, is the goal of any first-rate soul. But into which of those categories does money fit? Automatically, you say, material. Uncle Larry disagrees. Uncle Larry says, spiritual. Money may be our greatest spiritual teacher, more edifying than a stadium full of swamis. Nothing can knock a pilgrim off the path as fast as money. That's the job of a spiritual teacher, you know, not to hold us to the path, but to knock us off of it. Until we can stay on the path without ever being knocked or tempted off, until we can resist the teacher's carrot and withstand his rod, our transformative journey can be little more than fits and starts. When it comes to illuminating the inner structure of consciousness and highlighting its weaknesses and flaws, nothing, not even love, casts as bright a beam as money. The things we're willing to do to obtain it, to protect it, to express our guilt over having it, are incomparably revealing. There's a thin line between charity and greed. At bottom, they're both expressions of insecurity and manifestations of ego. If you want to know how insecure you are, how swollen and stiff your ego is, what your chances are of staying on the path, just examine your attitudes toward the juice. Money's a terrible servant, but a wonderful master. Far be it from Uncle Larry, my dear, to come between a seeker and her guru. Jeez, what are you supposed to make of that? You are still trying to interpret the nuances of Diamond's latest pedagogy, could this be a veiled invitation for you to enlist his aid in your oil futures play when you arrive at the barricades around the Sorrento Hotel? 12.45 p.m. First Hill has neither physical nor thematic connection to First Avenue. 
The two are separated by nearly a dozen blocks. Moreover, many Seattleites are disposed to refer to First Hill as Pill Hill, a tribute to its high concentration of hospitals, clinics, medical offices, and pharmacies. Harborview, in whose public mental wards that rude Cecil and Smokey would confine you, is on Pill Hill, as is the Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. And on the extreme northwestern rim of the hilltop, high above downtown and Puget Sound, so is the Sorrento, a lovely, smallish, turn-of-the-century, Mediterranean-style hotel favored by guests seeking privacy, calm, and refinement in an urban setting. Perhaps those are the very qualities Motofusa Yamaguchi looks for in lodging, but more than likely his hosts booked him into the Sorrento because of its proximity to the Hutchinson Laboratories. In any case, although many a showbiz celebrity has successfully hidden away at the Sorrento, Dr. Yamaguchi's residence there has shattered any pretense of privacy or calm. A crowd, quadruple the size of the audience at the Frog Lecture, is milling around in front of the hotel, and while 400 people is hardly a multitude, they are more than enough to overrun the Sorrento's serene little garden entrance with its fountain, spiked iron fence, and hardy palms. Whether seeking last-ditch medical attention, business association, or merely curiosity, the visitors have clogged the courtyard and spilled over onto Madison Street, as well as onto Terry around the corner. An overworked and depleted police department has erected barriers about the hotel proper, and two cops are directing and deflecting traffic, concentrating on keeping Terry Avenue clear, for Terry is the direct ambulance route to the Swedish Hospital Emergency Room, only a block away. You nose the Porsche into a parking lot off Terry. Every stall is occupied, but you only require space to stop long enough to discharge your passenger. Diamond powers down his window and asks a passerby what is going on. The frail, elderly woman replies that Yamaguchi has been whisked off to lunch somewhere, but is expected back around three. What will you do? You can't help but notice that opals of perspiration are studying his brow once again, and as anxious as you are to get rid of him, you are not without mercy. First, I'll battle my way into the lobby. If management refuses access to a toilet, I'll come back out here and squat between parked cars. He pulls a Ziploc bag of Comanche leaves from the inside pocket of his leather jacket. It isn't the pain that bothers me so much as it is the banality. I'm sorry, Larry. You don't have cancer, but you know what he means. Then I'll wait around with these other needy non-entities to see if I can steal a word with Yamaguchi-san. I hope he'll talk to you. It'll be good theater in any case. He turns to face you. Before I take my leave, however, let me attempt very briefly to answer your other questions, though probably not in the order that you ask them. You must look bewildered because he explains... The questions you posed in the lecture hall? Oh, those. Nobody except the bozo and the dogon postulate that there's a serious C. But the bozo and the dogon have unique credibility in that area. If they're correct, if Sirius has a second sister that a, astronomers don't know about, if there is a serious C... Then the quaking custard we call reality is a very quaky custard indeed. In that regard, and in answer to another question, I have to inform you that the way the automatic lock works at Thunder House, nobody can exit without a key. I haven't the foggiest idea how Q. Joe Huffington was able to get out. I didn't want to tell you earlier, for fear of scaring you off. You stall the car on that one and are slow to restart the engine. Now, as for attraction, the instant I saw you, my dear, I wanted to open your legs like a checking account at a bank that doesn't charge for overdrafts. And believe it or not, I wanted to open your mind as well. I said to myself, Larry, wouldn't it be a fine thing, a swell thing, a boon to the community of man and to all creatures, great and small, if this girl's soul was as ripe and stunning as her ass, it isn't, of course, but maybe it could be. Gwendolyn, you're like a handsome, expensive television set that can only bring in two or three channels. I want to hook you up to cable, sweetheart. 
I want to be your satellite dish. While you are trying to decide whether to be flattered or insulted, he removes from his breast pocket a packet of tickets. Green stains, a result of the packets having been carried next to the medicinal herbs, almost blot out the name of the airline. Tomorrow, he says, answering your remaining question, I'm going back to Timbuktu. 12.52 p.m. Timbuktu? Tomorrow? You gulp and endeavor to conceal the gulping. Yes, on the morn ere the cock crows thrice. I realize this is heartbreaking news, but you needn't despair. I'm confident we can devise a strategy that'll render it a joy instead of a calamity. Obviously, we can devise nothing of consequence with that conga line of Cretans caterwauling behind us. Several cars whose futile circlings of the lot you are blocking have begun to honk impatiently, so I'll bail out now knowing that love will find a way and we'll solve everything next time we meet. Don't count on any next time, you start to say, but then he kisses you. And the kiss is so like a Mexican wedding dress with layers of lace and tears of frills, with flounces, embroidery, rows of pearl buttons and loops of bright ribbon that the angry traffic turns into a fiesta and the parking lot attendant waving his arms at you becomes a drunken priest bestowing a blessing. By the time Diamond slides away, trailing a thread of saliva, your gonads are riding hard toward Durango. 1 p.m. Solid ground. That's what you long for. To stand for a while on solid ground, bedrock, terra firma, reinforced concrete. Oh, gravity, where is thy hook, thy line, thy sinker? You choose a circuitous route home, studiously circumnavigating the denser populations of street people, thereby avoiding pedestrian gridlock, possible acts of vandalism and violence, and the temptation to look at the homeless hordes through Diamond's eyes. If they are indeed extras, and at the same time stars in a humongous and vibrant spectacle, you would like a word with the producer, casting couch and all. You arrive at the building without incident, which is a triumph of sorts, although hardly a harbinger of stability, since you must now look in on Andre, an assignment that precludes any illusion of firmness beneath the feet. Fortunately, because it is an old building, woefully demodé, its doors are punctured by keyholes, and it is with your eye to a worn brass aperture that you are able to peer into Cujo's domicile and ascertain that the macaque is present, conspicuously present, is in fact sprawled atop the Huff's cherry wood table, tarot spread and all, like the sacrificial victim of a toupee cult. Due to your cursed myopia, you are quite unable to say for sure if Andre is breathing, and the awful thought occurs to you that you may have killed him. Who knows how much Valium a twenty-pound monkey can tolerate? You squint. You blink. You press so far into the keyhole that your eyeball is like a grape being forced into a pea shooter. Alas, you are still unable to detect any rise or fall of hairy chest, if you have carelessly murdered Belford's little rascal, well, the consequences are too dire to consider. As you pry loose with your nail file, the door nails so that you might tiptoe inside to hold a mirror to monkey nostrils, to feel for monkey pulse, your mind is already scanning for alibis, ways to pin the fatal misdeed on someone else. Barely have you crept over the threshold, however, then Andre startles you by grabbing at his rump in an irritated manner, a gesture that culminates in his pulling a tarot card from under him as if it had been pinching his tight little scrotum and casting it aside. Although he has not opened his eyes and he stirs no further, you are satisfied that he is okay, you don't consider coma or brain damage, and are greatly relieved. The longer he sleeps, the easier it will be to contain him, at least one thing is going well. You're about to slip out of the apartment when your eye falls on the card that Andre yanked from the spread. It has landed face down on the floor, and you are seized by a sudden, sharp curiosity. 
A card picked so forcefully, yet so somnambulistically, must have special significance, and you wonder which card it might be. You wonder, too, if the card would pertain specifically to the monkey's subconscious, assuming that a monkey has a subconscious, or might its message be aimed at you? Might it, for example, reflect on the scheme whereby you would exploit the return of the prodigal primate to extract money in the form of a short-term loan, of course, from Belford Dunn? The next thing you know, you are down on all fours, crawling stealthily toward the fallen card. You are halfway to the card when it occurs to you that this is hardly appropriate behavior for someone who has been yearning to plant her feet on the unyielding crust of routine and reason. You pause to consider your actions, and during the freeze frame of your hesitation, hear someone clear their throat behind you. Essie Kudal, the retired florist who lives across the hall, is standing in the doorway, eyes wide, mouth agape. It is a measure of your will, perhaps, that even in the midst of blushing violently, you have the presence to hold a finger to your lips, forestalling any exclamation from the widow Kudal that would awaken the sleeping prince. 2.40 p.m. As the afternoon passes, your mind strays several times to the unexamined tarot card, but having exhausted your powers of persuasion, selling Mrs. Kudal on the idea that the little scene upon which she stumbled was not as depraved as it seemed, you have no intention of re-entering Cujo's unit unless Andre awakens and creates a ruckus. Every quarter hour or so, you do tiptoe down the hall and spy on your prisoner, but not without the distinct sensation that Mrs. Kudal is peering out her keyhole at you, peering in Cujo's. Even more frequently, your mind strays to Larry Diamond. To wit, one, having not eaten all day, you reheat some lobster bisque, and while spooning it in, wonder if Diamond has bothered to take nourishment, or if the cancer has eaten his appetite, as cancers are said to sometimes do. Two, having run out of other ideas, you call around to the hospitals to inquire if they have admitted anyone fitting Cujo's description, and while awaiting their inevitable denials, try to picture where on Pill Hill each particular hospital is located in relation to Diamond and the Sorrento. Three, Having owed Grandma Mattie a letter ever since she left Oakland in February and moved back to the Philippines, you take out your Mont Blanc to pen her a note, and as the ink is soaking into the wood pulp, imagine the old lady throwing up her hands at the sight of Diamond and exclaiming, He looks big crazy, same as you papa. Four, having had minimal experience in the commodities market, you remove a college textbook from the shelf, and while reviewing the chapter on futures investing, rekindle the hope that Diamond might assist you in your desperate ploy. Five, having reached the point where guilt and common decency will no longer allow you to ignore Belford's pathetic calls, you dial his hotel, and while the phone rings in San Francisco, find yourself wishing begrudgingly and altogether unreasonably that Diamond and not done, would pick up the receiver. 2.42 p.m. Belford sounds so low, he would have to stand on a ladder to change the bulb in a flashlight. His meeting with the French official has just ended on a pessimistic note, and he cannot fathom why you've not returned his calls. Where have you been? he asks, straining his larynx to the cracking point, in his effort not to whine or accuse. Why? Searching for Andre, of course. You reply so innocently that no turtle dove would hesitate to build its nest among the quince blossoms of your inflection. And I have some good news. You do? Well, sort of good news. I've seen him. You have? Uh, I think I have. W what do you mean? I'm pretty sure I've spotted him in the trees near the school. Twice. And I have a plan to entice him into my car. Oh, praise Jesus, I hope you're right. I'd rush back immediately, but every flight's booked solid because of the holiday. <sighs> happy Easter, by the way. Yeah, happy Easter, Belford. There's no way I can get to Seattle before ten tonight. Good. What do you mean? I'm sorry, I meant that'll be good enough because it could take me a while uh, to corral him. 
but I may well have him for you when you arrive. But how'll you do it? Never mind, don't worry about it. I've got a scenario. Trust me. Oh, I do trust you, hon. I trust you explicitly. But I have to mention, and I'm not saying this to hurt you, I have to mention that, well, Andre, you know, he's not always inclined to, um, respond to you. Andre and I have had our differences in the past, but I have a feeling we're going to get along just fine from now on. I'll be praying nonstop for both of you. You know, Gwen, if it's really him, one thing that might help is a banana popsicle. Gee, yeah. Good idea, Belford. Maybe I'll try it. 2.55 p.m. You stare out the window for several minutes before it dawns on you that it's raining again. The last time you glanced at the sky, it was still largely blue. Well, that's Seattle for you. From lapis to tin in the blink of a lash. Blink once more and your espresso's diluted. Quick to wet and slow to dry, the city is resigned to sudden overcast and prolonged spillage. Newcomers wring their damp mitts and fret about rot. Old-timers curse and get on with business, aware that the next sunny day, although it may be weeks away, will trot out such a mountainous array of pagodas, Sundays, hero chins, and god fingers, such a sunset palette of jello, Kool-Aid, Vegas strip, and carrot oil, such a sea vista display of broad waters, furred islands, whale spouts, and sailboats thicker than triangles in a geometry book, that any and all memories of rain will fizz and implode in a blaze of bedazzled amnesia. You have long ago grown accustomed to the witch measles of persistent drizzle, and although the assault on your makeup and hairdo never cease to annoy you, you tend to take it in your snide. This afternoon, however, an unfamiliar ingot has been tonged onto the anvil of the gloom. You wonder if the rain has caught Larry Diamond, still waiting outside the Sorrento Hotel. You picture him soaked, lonely, and forlorn, risking a pneumonia that might severely complicate his malignancy and lower his resistance to its blows. Of course, Diamond is an amoral seducer, a reckless weirdo who means little or nothing to you, and besides, he is leaving tomorrow for some Timbuktu where a person would be lucky to find an unused Band-Aid, let alone chemotherapy, so how sick or how smart can he be? Nevertheless, it doesn't seem quite right just to leave him there in the rain without shelter or transportation, not in his condition. Would it hurt to give him a ride back to Thunderhouse? You ought to search the neighborhood around the bowling alley anyway to see if Q. Joe's car might be there. You simply refuse to believe that she passed through a dead, bolted door without a key. 3.06 p.m. What are you gawking at? You demand of the Thriftway cashier. It is obvious what she is staring at. It is the third time on a particular Easter Sunday that you have come in and purchased unusually large amounts of banana popsicles. But it is none of her business, and you will be darned if you will let her get away with impertinence. Excuse me, she says, avoiding your glare while she bags your purchase. It's nice to see somebody else blush for a change. You seize the bag. These are the only known cure for stigmata, you say sternly. If you were more than a jewelry store Christian, you nod at the little gold crucifix around your neck, you'd know that. Yes, ma'am. And next time, remember to ask if I want paper or plastic. There. That makes you feel better. You smile all the way to Belford's place to pick up the pet harness. 3.16 p.m. Essie Kudal, who has seen you drive off but missed your return, is on her knees in the hallway, squinting through Cujo's keyhole. Now it is your turn to clear your throat. My, oh my, how quickly a sallow face can redden. This is great fun for you, this spate of reverse embarrassment. Wobbling to her fuzzy, slippered feet and gathering her bathrobe about her chest, as if she feared you were the safe-sex rapist, Mrs. Kudal says, It's doing something. It's doing something funny. Brushing her aside and pressing your own chocolate eye to the keyhole, you soon figure out that what the macaque is doing is attempting to roll another cigarette. A bit groggy, he is less successful than he was earlier, 
and impatient fistfuls of tobacco are spilling off the cigarette paper onto his lap and the nubby old sofa on which he sits. Ignoring Mrs. Kudal, although you would love to make her blush some more, you pry loose the nails and unlock the door. Hi, Andre. Hi, honey. Did you have a good rest? You approach him cautiously, but despite his frustration with a cigarette, he seems rather docile. Look, Auntie Gwen's gone and brought you another treat. While the monkey slurps the popsicle, you slip the harness over him and buckle it tight. Good boy. Good monkey. Here, have another one. You and Gwendolyn are going to go for a little ride. And if you're nice, you can have lots of popsicles. Boku. Okay? Leading the happily dazed animal out of the room, you pause by the tarot table. Most of the deck has been knocked onto the floor by now, making it impossible, alas, to isolate from the scatter the card that Andre had impulsively snatched. You do glimpse a corner of the Nomo card, however, and it spurs you to hasten your departure. To Mrs. Kudal, whose curled head is hanging out of her doorway as if on a string, you call, Happy Easter. The father's a frog. The son's a tadpole. The Holy Ghost is swamp gas. 3.27 p.m. You anticipated difficulty in stashing Andre in the trunk of the Porsche, but as soon as you toss in the carton of popsicles, he bounds right in behind it. He does screech a bit when you slam the lid, but the racket gradually subsides. It is only when you pat the trunk with satisfaction and turn away that you notice the squad car parked across the alley. Drat, you think drat to the sixteenth power. It's a Barbary ape, you call. It hates the rain. Smokey is rolling his eyes and shaking his head. I didn't see nothing, did you, Cecil? Cecil will not even look in your direction. Cecil, in fact, is staring at a row of overflowing garbage cans as intently as if he had a grant to study the effects of acid rain on used kitty litter. I didn't see a goddamn thing, he growls. It is the voice of a defeated man. All the way down Queen Anne Hill, you keep checking your rearview mirror for flashing blue lights, but none appear, and you proceed swiftly. Through downtown, the brisk pace continues, for the rain has driven the majority of the homeless and the criminal off the streets and into doorways and various makeshift shelters where their trash fires hiss at the weather. Nevertheless, you select Third Avenue over the usually more teeming First a route that carries you close to the Werewolf Club, where the coming attractions, you note, are the Drunk Drivers and the Tijuana Diaper Service. Naturally, the club reminds you of your last conversation with Kujo, but it would take more than that memory to tar your current glad mood. Rain, that thin, gray sheriff, has also served its cold-hearted eviction notices to the crowd outside the Sorrento, those who have not sardined into the lobby have returned to their cars or their homes. Scarcely a dozen still stand in the open courtyard, but among them is Diamond. He is soaked, to be sure, but hardly lonely or forlorn. Engaged in animated conversation with an attractive middle-aged Asian woman, his match strike of a grin sulfurs the soggy air. Fortuitously, a minivan has just vacated one of the limited parking spaces on Terry Avenue, and you nose right into it, beeping your horn to attract Diamond's attention. Eventually, he notices you and strides blithely over to the Porsche, his long hair heavy with moisture, swinging to and fro, batting raindrops aside right and left. I was in the neighborhood, you say, powering down the window. Yes. Yes, indeed. Me too. For some reason, you don't mind the mockery in his smile. I'm surprised you're still here. What's going on? Well, the good doctor came back about 20 minutes ago. Not a very imposing figure, less so in person than on TV. And apparently he'd been sucking the sake cork again. He spoke with us briefly, but none too coherently showed us a plastic jar full of something that looked like the spinal fluid of a scarecrow, the enema elixir, the anal ambrosia. 
he indicated that aside from spring water, boiled brown rice and beta carotene, there's nothing in it except a pinch of coffee. Anybody could produce it if they were cognizant of the precise proportion. That's too bad. Why do you say that? Well, if the word gets around that there really isn't any secret formula that can be patented and protected, then the Nikkei's water wings are going to pop tomorrow. And if Tokyo joins us in the octopus's garden, who's left to play lifeguard? We're pacing the bottom in cast iron shoes. Ah, you're forgetting the nozzle. Without Yamaguchi's special nozzle, the formula is just so much dirty dishwater. One little enema nozzle can't prop up a world economy. It is only the second time you have ever used the word enema in mixed company, but you are too distracted to blush. Drat. Well, anyway, would you like a lift home? Sweet of you to inquire, Pussy Nougat, but I think I'll hang around here a while longer. Yamaguchi inferred that he might come back and talk to us about the possibility of treatments after he changes suites. The hotel's moving him to the seventh floor penthouse for security reasons. Not likely to do me much good in Timbuktu, but I feel I should be cognizant of available alternatives. You can't just wait out in the rain. You're drenched. Get in the car for a minute. I'll turn the heater on. zippity doo da sings Diamond. zippity a 4 p.m. In the beginning was the thing, and one thing led to another. The simple but enduring truth of that abridged version of the first chapter of Genesis is demonstrated once again in the cockpit of the Porsche, a space in which you, the general public, and the vast majority of German automotive engineers would have deemed it impossible to have full-fledged sexual intercourse, but you remove your Exxon sweatshirt with which to dry his hair, he slips his tattooed hand inside your silk shirt, the windows conveniently fog over, and one thing leads to another. Still, for the rest of your life, it will remain a mystery to you how the two of you managed it. But manage it you do, with vigor and tenderness, and at considerable length. Snorting and whinnying, the white pony comes over the hill, trotting at first, then at a gallop, and just keeps coming and coming until it reaches your front yard, where it kicks up its heels a few times, and then lies down lazily and rolls in the clover. Kucho was right. Those other occasions had been false alarms, processed cheese, laugh tracks, and placebos. The condensation on the windows gives you an exaggerated sense of privacy. But the way the Porsche was rocking at the apogee of your ardor, everyone in the neighborhood, thank goodness the cops have gone, must have guessed that something untoward was transpiring in that little sports car, and poor Andre must have felt as if he were going over Niagara Falls in a barrel. What's so funny, Gwendolyn? <laughs> Nothing. No point spoiling a perfectly good post-coital reverie by informing Diamond there is a monkey aboard. Even after she has given her body, a girl must keep some secrets. You snuggle up to him. Larry, you say dreamily. Yes. Tell me about the good old days. Tell me about the eighties. He sighs. Ah, hop toad. So what did he expect? By now he surely must know you were not the type to inquire of a partner if it was good for him, too. He sighs again. You sigh as well. If you won't tell me about the boat I missed, then tell me about one I stand a chance of catching. Well, there's always the nature boat, the art boat, the sex boat, the intoxication boat. They're bobbing at the end of nearly every pier, just waiting to ferry us across our personal doldrums, societal whirlpools, and institutional sewage lagoons. Why, the best of them can even cut the tides of mediocrity. The sex boat had provided a more rewarding voyage than you ever thought possible, but you are ashore now. You have got your land legs back, and never at any time have you had art or nature or intoxication in mind. You untangle your panties from the gear shift. 
They prove so difficult to acrobat into that you can scarcely believe how easily they came off. When you have gotten yourself somewhat back together, you look diamond in the eye, and then you spill your beans. You outline for him your oil futures play. As you might well imagine, you say when you are done, I can't begin to meet the exchange minimums for buying marginal securities in a lot large enough to be worthwhile. But as you suggested yesterday, was it only yesterday? There may be a way to journal around it. There's got to be, Larry. You kiss him on both stubble cheeks and then on the mouth. Do you suppose you might? Maybe. Perhaps. Let me think about it. Frankly, the prospect strikes me as less unethical than irrelevant. It's about as enticing as a cup of cold coffee in a stale croissant. But I'll lapidate it for a while in the old cerebral gem tumbler, fair enough. In return, Uncle Larry's going to insist you do some lapidating of your own. Some lapidating and some laps, as in swimming. Because every one of those boats I mentioned is leaky to one degree or another. And the boat you're waiting for may have already sunk. So much the better. It could be time to abandon ship and get back in the water, or at least onto the pad. So wipe that manipulative, avaricious entreaty off your chops and listen up to a tale or two. Okay, Uncle Larry. As long as you put it that way. 4.45 p.m. I noticed, says Diamond, that you are admiring the bloom of my manhood. I was not. Even an inadvertent peak would have informed you that I've been circumcised. So you're Jewish, aren't you? I'm precisely as Jewish as you are Welsh. Anyhow, it's amusing how we associate circumcision with the Jews. The practice was originated by the Egyptians. Moses, who of course was raised in the Egyptian court, commanded the Israelites to circumcise their sons either because he'd become convinced that it was good hygiene or because since he'd had his own wick trimmed, he viewed it as an expression of loyalty to him and solidarity among the rebels. Anyway, you slice it, benign genital mutilation was a feature of pre-dynastic Egypt. We're talking 5,000 years ago. And the traditions, rituals, and body of knowledge based on the Sirius star system originated in the same area at about the same time. Today, certain Bozo and Dogon ceremonies that are centered around Sirius also involve rites of circumcision. To these tribes, the act of circumcision symbolizes the orbit of Sirius B around Sirius A. Pardon me, but isn't this maybe another case of males trying to attach cosmic significance to their peepees? <laughs> it has to do, smarty pants, with the elliptical path of the knife. Besides, the peepee, as you so ingloriously label it, already has innate cosmic significance as does your own sweet plumbing, for reasons both ecstatic and procreative. In many, if not most, folk traditions, the pee, pee and the vagina are associated with frogs. Frogs are associated with mushrooms. Mushrooms are associated with genitalia. And all three, frogs, mushrooms, and sex organs, have their indirect connection to the stars. I bring this up merely to demonstrate how intertwined these matters are. It's so complex, I hardly know where to begin. Gee, if it's that complicated, if it's going to, you know, tax your brain, please don't feel obligated to continue on my account. Diamond starts to reply, then pauses and cocks his head. Gwendolyn, I'm aware that this is a late model luxury automobile, but by any chance, do you have mice in the trunk? You fake an incredulous and insulted expression, but 
Your ears detect the rustling, too, and although the Porsche's cockpit is already heavily perfumed with a commingling of male and female nectars, not to mention the burnt sugar aroma of Twister's daddy's leaves, your nose is starting to pick up the unmistakable essence of monkey. 4.48 p.m. I'll be back in a flash, says Diamond. You worry that he is going around to the rear to investigate your cargo, but through the condensation of the window glass, you make out his ghostly silhouette loping across the street toward the hotel. When he returns a few minutes later, he announces with some relief that he has not missed anything, that Dr. Yamaguchi is still upstairs, probably sleeping off lunch. Raikou will yell for me when he shows up. He flicks a drop or two from the chisel of his nose. I'm going to miss this rain and parched old Timbuktu. Best reason I've heard yet for going there. Come to think of it, it's the only reason I've heard for going there. I went there because I thought it was as far as one could go. A value-free, time-free refuge from the shitstorms of commerce and information. However... Since the universe is made of information, what I ended up doing under the impetus of a new database was shedding one layer of meaning and exposing another. It was an infinitely deeper, more resonant layer, though, and it revealed my naive travel impulses to have been divinely inspired. Gwendolyn, you seem to be familiar with Sirius. Isn't everybody? The dog star? Brightest star in the sky? Only 8.5 light years away? Six. 8.6. You shrug. That's what they say. Looks more like 8.5 to me. Diamond studies you. He cannot tell for sure if you're joshing. You've scoped it. Why, of course, you say boastfully. Scoped Sirius B, too. Then you must have had a well-made scalp. Sirius B is so relatively tiny and so overwhelmed by the light of Sirius A that it's completely invisible to the naked eye and wasn't even discovered by astronomers with telescopes until late in the last century. You're aware of that, I gather. Um, uh, more or less. But are you aware that people in Africa, ancestors of the Bozo and Dogon, knew Sirius B as long as 5,000 years ago? Not only knew the existence, the exact location of this star that the naked eye can't see, but knew also the exact shape of its orbit around A and how long it takes to complete the orbit. Incidentally, it takes approximately 50 years, and contemporary bozos still have ceremonies that adhere to 50-year cycles. Furthermore, B, like all white dwarfs, is extremely heavy and dense. The stuff it's made of is so unlike ordinary matter that there's nothing in our solar system to compare it to. The bozo, who are largely illiterate and never have possessed astronomical instruments of any kind, know that as well. The knowledge was handed down to them by their ancestors. Needless to say, when I heard about this, it altered the trajectory of my life. But why? That's what I don't get. I mean, okay, it's kind of interesting. It's an intriguing mystery. But how did they build the pyramids? And who figured out the connection between the human subconscious and those symbols they put on Kujo's tarot cards? And which came first, the chicken or the egg? But hey, what difference does it make? What does it have to do with anything? Our family life, our careers, our health and well-being, our personal finances, none of these things are affected in the slightest. Most of us have to concentrate on the realities of everyday existence, Larry. Maybe you have the luxury to become obsessed with some forgotten supermarket tabloid enigma, but the rest of us don't. And frankly, I think you are the worst for it. Ah, Gwendolyn, while it may be true that everyday existence is the turl of dull, repetitive activities that you infer, it's just one layer of a many-layered cake. 
And if it seems an exercise in pointless mediocrity, maybe that's only because most who live it are too narrowly focused to perceive its underlying kaleidoscopic density. Or too darn busy. Besides, I never said it was pointless or mediocre. Don't interrupt. I'll concede, however, that there's a dominant consensual reality, and even the broad-minded don't venture too far from it. Yes, I'll concede that. Yet the very fact that certain Africans thousands of years before the invention of the telescope could accumulate precise information about an obscure, invisible star, that fact strongly suggests that there's a rip in the fabric of consensual reality, a crack in that rational structure that we'd like to believe holds things together. And that crack calls many of our most fundamental beliefs, historical, scientific, religious, into question. And if Sirius B could be familiarized without telescopes, couldn't molecules or atoms be familiarized without microscopes? And if these feats of perception are possible, what then is impossible? The Dogon and Bozo, by the way, have always claimed that Sirius is a three-star system, that there's also a Sirius C. So far, modern astronomy has found no evidence of it. Well, if it's there, they'll find it. And they'll have a logical explanation for it. I'll bet they already have a logical explanation for how the bozo knew about Sirius B now, don't they? Are you kidding? Conventional scientists wouldn't touch that problem with a ten-foot grant. Of course, not a dime of grant use would ever be made available for such study. There's no apparent commercial or military applications. And anyway, riddles of this sort scare scientists right out of their lab coats. They're as cowed by the big-time mysteries of the universe as the guy on the street and are only too happy to sweep them under a rug. There has to be a logical explanation. You're half right. At its macro and micro levels, the universe is no more logical than the stock market. But there is an explanation. The few good minds that have addressed the issue have arrived at the same conclusion. The ancestors of the bozo got their detailed knowledge of Sirius, as well as the content of their complex cosmology, from visiting aliens. Yes, hop-toed, yes, indeed, they're talking the old extraterrestrial contact. At this moment, as if on cue, Andre lets loose a barrage of unearthly jabber. You force an extended laugh, pretending that you are ridiculing the suggestion of spacemen in Bozo Land, but Diamond is not fooled by your cover-up. What in pre-shrunk hell was that? That noise, you mean? Oh, probably a space alien. <laughs> Gwendolyn. Well, how am I supposed to know what it was? It's the streets of Seattle out there. These days you're liable to hear just about anything. Could have been the rich boys up to their tricks. But of course, the rich boys, they've added impressions of early Tarzan movie soundtracks to their fiendish repertoire. He rakes you with his cat claw smile. It sounded like it was right behind our seats. Maybe sound carries in the rain. I don't know. Andre must have polished off all the popsicles and either has a bellyache or is demanding more. In any case, there's nothing you can do about it now. You just hope Diamond isn't reading your mind. It stopped you say, crossing your fingers. So, what were you saying about extraterrestrial contact? Grumbling like W.C. Fields at a kindergarten picnic, Diamond returns to his narration. 5.02 p.m. The argument that the early bozo couldn't possibly have gotten into the cosmic cookie jar without outside help wouldn't hold quite so much water, so to speak, if there weren't a record of extraterrestrial contact in the oral history of the tribe. Seriously? They actually claim they were visited by little green men? Green, maybe. Little? Now. The Nomo were at least as tall as us. 
For some reason, the word NOMO, like hostile takeover or leverage buyout, sends ripples of nervous excitement through your plasma. You shiver. NOMO? Like on Kujo's star card? That NOMO was supposed to be from outer space? Rather like old Jesus, but whereas the scriptures are vague regarding the exospheric location of heaven, Bozo tradition doesn't hesitate to list the Nomo's specific address. They came from the system of the star Sima Cain. Serious to me and thee. Which, by the way, is precisely where modern science expects extraterrestrial contact to come from, if E.T. contact is ever made. Why there? Proximity, pure and simple. Sirius is in our neighborhood, or just outside of it. Still one hell of a long distance from Cincinnati, but within range of a properly engineered spaceship. The mythology of the Sub-Sahara relates how an ark landed on the Earth. So it's only a myth. Gwendolyn, Gwendolyn, surely you're not one of those undereducated boobs who believes a myth to be a set of exaggerated facts. A myth, you ought to know, is a metaphoric method of describing dramatizing and condensing historical events and psychological states that are otherwise too complicated to be digested or appreciated by the prevailing society. So, pussy chops, when the Bozo and Dogon say that an interstellar arc once landed on the Earth to the northeast of them, and lo, what's to their northeast but Egypt? They could be referring to an external event, a centuries-long series of events, or a strictly psychological phenomenon, a sort of enchantment. In any case, the Africans say that when the ark touched down, its weight caused its blood to spurt to the sky. The way they describe the reddish rays emanating from the landing craft makes it sound suspiciously like some kind of a rocket ship. At this point, Diamond flings the back of his hand toward your face with such force that you duck, thinking he's trying to strike you. Tad jumpy, aren't you, sweetheart? That's said to be the sign of a guilty conscience. You redden. He grins. And Andre rattles a tire jack. Diamond's hand, embarrassingly scented with the oils of your vagina, remains in your face. He is showing you his tattoo. This is a copy of a well-known tribal drawing that depicts three versions of the Nomo vehicle. It doesn't require much more than the imagination of a state legislator to interpret these circles and rays as various stages of the firing of rocket engines. Okay, yeah, I can see that, I guess. Kind of a stretch, but I, I can see it. What I don't see is why you would have tattooed it on your hand. Diamond's grin is almost boyish. Gets me excellent service in bozo restaurants, he says. How convenient. You await further explanation, but hear nothing beyond the rain typing its memoirs on the roof of the car and the process of popsicle wrappers being turned into monkey confetti in the trunk. Fearful that Diamond will detect the latter sound as well, you are relieved when he finally says, You know, it may be an omen that it's raining while I'm telling you these things. Aside from being the monitors of the universe and the guardians of the soul, the Nomo were also called the dispensers of rain and the masters of all water. Supposedly, the purpose of the Nomo's visit was to bring spiritual principles to the human race. Sometimes when my brain is soft, I think I can almost hear these principles being transmitted by the rain. Yeah, hear voices, do you, Larry? Andre uncorks a short shriek, and you exclaim, Wow, you're right. There's one now. He glares at you so violently that you take his hand and squeeze his kooky tattoo. Just kidding, you say. But tell me something. If these aliens from Sirius, these... Nomo, we're the masters of rain and water. Why were they hanging out in that part of the world, where it's so horribly dry? 
5,000 years ago, Africa was a lot wetter than it is today. Its deserts are a relatively recent phenomena. The Noma would probably have found plenty of water, and there would have been large amounts of water aboard their spaceship, too. There would have had to have been. And why's that? Because, he says, the Noma were amphibians. 5.12 p.m. While raindrops scurry down the windshield of the parked Porsche, like sow bugs rushing to a rotten wood festival, and the macaque continues to shred popsicle wrappers in the trunk as if he were employed in the document room of a Republican president, Larry Diamond, in his astringent drawl, drones on and on about large half-human amphibious creatures with webbed digits and fishtails who, according to the Dogon and Bozo, founded their civilizations. Apparently, they founded other, earlier, more important civilizations as well, for Diamond relates that the Assyrians, Babylonians, and Sumerians each venerated a group of beings who came from reedy, watery regions to bring written language and spiritual values to humankind. In the pictograph and cuneiform fragments from ancient Sumer, which represent the world's oldest extant examples of writing, the half-man, half-fish is referred to as Oannes. And to Oannes is ascribed many of the deeds and functions that the Hebrews later appropriated for their heroes, Noah, for example, in the Old Testament. Jehovah himself may have been patterned after the amphibian Oannes, although the Dogon and Bozo insist that the Nomo were not gods, but highly developed mortals. Nevertheless, Diamond goes on, there are definite parallels between the accounts of the Nomo and the Christ stories. A French anthropologist was told by a Dogon priest that the Nomo divided his body among men to feed them, and that the universe had drunk of his body. Sound familiar? You ever take communion, Gwendolyn? Swallow the leader? After you have registered disgust at his pun, he continues, it is also taught that the alien amphibians will return. Yes, pussy pie, yes indeed, coming soon to a pond near you, the advent of the Nomo. Will you be ready? Are you prepared? Are you on the pad? You will be if you stick with Uncle Larry. You make a face and Diamond laughs. By the way, the celestial symbol of the Nomo resurrection is E.A. Pelutolo, star of the tenth moon. You can't find this star, not even with a radio telescope, because according to the Bozo, it'll only be formed when the Nomo's arc descends. So E.A. Pelutolo is not a star per se, it's a star ship. Again, he shoves his pussy perfumed paw in your face. Star of the Tenth Moon, he says, waving his tattoo. You'll notice that these orbs also resemble the eyes of a frog. Yeah, and the moon does kind of look like green cheese, you mumble. You really don't know how to react to any of this. Is Diamond actually on to something significant, or has his brain been bungee jumping off a piano stool? You are forced, more or less, to lean toward the former possibility, because otherwise you have to admit you have just had the crowning coitus of your young life with a crackpot. I don't know what to say, Larry. I mean, essentially, you're asking me to believe that civilization was brought to the human race by a bunch of swamp things from Sirius. From a planet in the Syrian system, to be precise. The Egyptian word for the Syrian system, you might like to hear, also meant throne. And what do you do with a throne? You sit on it. So that may be where sitting trouser comes from? Good girl, yes, perhaps. Among sub-Saharan peoples today, the phrase to keep seated means to behave in an intelligent, virtuous manner. Obviously, you don't have to look very far in any direction to ascertain that the general population is out of its seat in a major way. 
loud-mouthed ignorance and criminality abound. It's been a grand show. All these frightened fools and greedy gangsters on their feet jumping up and down. But it's starting to get a trifle tiresome. And, of course, it's egregiously unfair to other species, to the animals and plants that have had the good sense and the purity all these millennia to keep seated. It could be marvelously refreshing, don't you think, with a nomo to return and coax us back on our haunches? And all this pushing and shoving, this yammering for attention. Picture us squatting, I'm speaking symbolically, serene and wise, like frogs on a lily pad. You have to smile. Yes, Larry dear, that's a nice idealistic fairy tale. Unfortunately, that's all it is. I mean, come on, start with the whole idea of these nomo mermen is totally far-fetched. Before you bet the ranch on that, ponder a few things. It's a mathematical certainty that there are intelligent life forms in the universe besides us hooligan earthlings. Considering the vast age of many of the other solar systems, it's also highly probable that a number of them have developed technologies more advanced than our own. Since we are an innocuous little planet on the fringes of a mediocre galaxy, a kind of interstellar Timbuktu, any interested parties would likely hail from a relatively close system. The Syrian system's a perfect candidate. For more distant systems, we wouldn't be worth the effort. Well, our sun's a great ball of fire, but it's practically a snowball compared to Sirius A, whose luminosity is 23 times brighter than El Sol, even though it's only half again as large. Any planet orbiting Sirius is going to be on the warm side, and probably cloud-covered at all times. Even through the vapor, it would be harmful to one's vision to look up at Sirius. Now, what sort of dominant, sentient life form would evolve in that hot, brilliant, steamy world? Amphibious mammals, wouldn't you say? Why amphibious mammals? Because only mammals possess the brain size necessary to create civilizations and technologies. Amphibious mammals, because to keep cool and protect their skin and eyes, they would have needed to spend much of their time in and under the water. Long ago, naturally, they would have developed tinted glass and air conditioning, but since biological evolution lags behind technological innovation by millions of years, these beings, even today, would be as accustomed to and perhaps dependent on life in the oceans and lakes as we are to life on land. As mammals, they'd require oxygen periodically, but they'd be quite comfortable under water. They'd be a lot like dolphins with hands and feet. You savor that image, I can tell. Yeah, yeah, he drawls. It's delectable to contemplate an ambulatory porpoise rocketing in to awaken humanity from its grabby trance, much as the porpoises I swam with in Florida awaken me from the trance of autism. He holds up his hand, but the one without the tattoo. You're aware, I suppose, that in the fins of dolphins there are the skeletal vestiges of fingers. Yes, indeed. There was a time when dolphins could have performed card tricks or tickled the ivories. Conceivably, our big brain, playful friends are related in some manner to the space-traveling Nomo. Is that true about vestigial fingers? Cross my heart. He doesn't add and hope to die, but then a cancer victim wouldn't add that. Well, you say... I concede that it's plausible that entities like the Nomo could exist somewhere in the universe, and it may even be plausible that these entities hopped down to Africa and briefed the bozo on astronomy, but when all said and done, I can't swallow it. Sorry, but I do not believe that's how the bozo learned about Sirius B. You expect him to get huffy and call you hop-toed, but he smiles and says, That's good, pussy gravy. Frankly, I don't believe it either. 
Surprise rings your eyes like a pair of goggles. Before Diamond can explain himself, however, there is a rapping at the passenger window. 5.24 p.m. Your first fear is that Andre has jimmied the latch on the trunk and is free and seeking retribution. Your second fear is that someone in the neighborhood has summoned the vice squad. You check to make sure your blouse is buttoned. When Diamond lowers the window, however, the Asian woman with whom he was flirting earlier leans in. Excuse me, please, she says shyly. I'm sorry. I wish to tell you that Dr. Yamaguchi has sent word he will come to the lobby at six o'clock. Why, thank you, Renko, Diamond says. I'll be there. Okay. Excuse me. Her nose is quivering ever so slightly, almost imperceptibly, but Diamond takes notice. Smells pretty in here, doesn't it, Reiko? Are you old enough to remember the Beatles? Remember John Lennon and Paul McCartney? When they sang, they'd put their faces together at the microphone in such a way that they'd blend into just one face? He sighs. It was the most beautiful face I'd ever seen. Now, it's the same when a man and a woman put their odors together, don't you think? They blend into the single best odor in the world. Reiko withdraws gracefully and with dignity, but as she walks away, she cannot help shaking her head from side to side. Diamond seems to have that effect on people. 5.25 p.m. During the next half hour, cramped in the sex-saturated cockpit of the Porsche, accompanied by the silver whips and molluscan castanets of the rain, and uninterrupted by monkey chatter, Andre apparently having grown bored and fallen asleep, Larry Diamond serenades you with a medley of unfamiliar and generally unfathomable notions. Here are several that stick in your mind. The bozo received their information about the stars telepathically. They, or to be precise, their ancient ancestors, enhanced their telepathic abilities through the ritualistic use of so-called visionary compounds, hemp derivatives and iboga, a flowering bush with a long history of use as a hallucinogen in West Africa, were certainly employed and enjoyed, but it may have been psilocybic mushrooms sprouting from the dung plops of migrating herds back when the savannas were blessed with rain that fostered the early Africans' telepathic powers that, in fact, provided the expanded awareness that allowed them to evolve to a more complex level than cousin baboon or cousin chimp. While in a radically sensitized state, among Africans, the state produced by iboga is referred to as open-heartedness. Imbibers, singularly or in groups, may have been able to pick up mental transmissions from the extraterrestrial amphibians whom they were to know as Oanes or Nomo and who were never to physically travel to our planet. It wouldn't have been necessary. An even more likely and perhaps more portentous possibility, according to Diamond, is that the transmissions received by early Bozo came not from an advanced amphibian civilization orbiting Sirius, but from a dimension of their own consciousness. The temptation is to label that dimension the higher mind, although it may actually be the lower mind, the aspect that Jung called the bottom below the bottom. In any case, it is an aspect of consciousness shared but not easily accessed by all human beings. It is the overmind or undermind of the species. It is hardly astonishing that the overmind would manifest itself in an amphibious guise for the simple reason that we land-based primates are essentially, ultimately, aquatic. Sperms swim in a liquid conveyance. The fetus forms and develops entirely submerged in fluid. Human embryonic development closely parallels the metamorphic stages of the frog. Until the umbilical cord is severed, newborn infants can thrive underwater. In its chemical composition, blood bears a most remarkable resemblance to seawater. Our bodies are more than 65% water, and our progenitors were marine animals who experimented with dry oxygen and became addicted. In a manner of speaking, human beings are fish out of water. 
The sea is a cradle we all rocked out of and may be the home place to which we will someday return. There would be several important advantages in resuming an amphibious way of life, since, for example, nearly three-quarters of the biosphere's surface is covered by water, and since, thanks to a rampant stupidity compounded by the sinister designs of organized religion, overpopulation is reducing the quality of life, profaning the sanctity of life, and threatening the continuation of life, the oceans and Great Lakes constitute Earth's final frontier, a vast area for resettlement and refuge. The seas are immeasurably rich in natural resources. Water blocks radiation, providing protection. Therefore, both from solar rays streaming unchecked through a depleted ozone layer and from the nuclear fires almost certain to be unleashed sooner or later by any one of a dozen nasty little nations. If global warming melts the polar ice caps, as some predict, we will have little choice in our resumption of an aquatic lifestyle. Our race has long been titillated by images of a lost civilization beneath the sea. Some say it is legend. Some say it is genetic memory. A few say there is small difference. Their common mistake is their relegation of this vanished utopia to ancient history. Deep consciousness is hardly bound by the constraints of linear time. Atlantis is in our future, not our past. On the other hand, Atlantis may figure both in our future and our past. Surely we harbor pleasant cellular memories of dolphin-like romps in warm prehistoric seas, of gentle froggy transformations in the security of a water-filled womb. Lost utopias. Scientists report that no creature on Earth dreams as much as the human fetus. If the fetal brain has had no experience, if its newly formed mind is a tabula rasa, what then does it dream about? Do we imagine that the tiny swimmer's dreams are dry? That no nomo splash therein? That the mood is other than oceanic? Oceanic, significantly enough, is a word we choose to describe the immense and ecstatic feeling of oneness. Oneness with humanity, with the biosphere, with the divine. That occasionally overtakes all but the hopelessly insensitive and frequently illuminates the contemplative and astute. In this context, oceanic is a spiritual term, and spiritual transformation is what the amphibian sidereal connection is all about. At some eschatological moment, having at last absorbed the values that the nomo literally or figuratively came here to impart, we may ride the currents to the stars, where, in the dimension of the overmind, we'll experience closure with the Godhead, eventually to embark on even higher tides, to even stranger destinations requiring even more unimaginable transformations. Meanwhile, had our present level of development, largely oblivious to our origins and our destination, we are half asleep in frog pajamas. 5.55 p.m. Diamond said a lot of other things, but these are the highlights, if that isn't too strong a word. These are the wild ideas with which you might entertain Kujo, providing Diamond hadn't already spun them around her turban at their Friday morning session and providing you ever see Kujo again. Oh, yeah. And there was the stuff about Buddha. How in almost every picture or statue where Buddha's extremities are shown, he has webbed fingers and toes, and how the seated Buddha's silhouette strongly resembles a bullfrog. Had you the time or inclination, you suppose you could do some research and ascertain whether the Buddha had webbed feet or if Uncle Larry was pulling your leg. And you might dig out that dog-eared Bible that Grandma Maddie sent you before she moved back to the Philippines and check Exodus chapter 8 to see if there really is a passage therein about Egypt being invaded by frogs. Those things you could look up, but what about the Greek business? How there supposedly were fifty sisters called the Danaids, who ventured out of their reedy marshes of the Nile Delta to bring the gift of water to the most arid region of the Peloponnese. Fifty sisters, mind you, one for each year of Sirius B's orbit around Sirius A. 
The Danaids were descendants of reed-wielding Io, who in Egypt was known as Isis, a word that referred to seat or throne as well as to the Sirius system. Gee, you had said, so many crisscrosses, overlaps, and connections. Yes, agreed Diamond. Yes, indeed, and I'm barely skimming the surface. All those ancient marquee cultures were drinking out of the same gourd. Or the same dog dish. Dog, as in dog star. Virtually everything that sparkled in the golden age of Greece was borrowed from the Egyptians, and the Egyptians adapted their routines from the royal blacks of Nubia. We moderns overlook Nubia. We forget how proud and fancy and influential it was. Nubia played Professor Longhair and Big Mama Thornton to Egypt's Elvis. The Nubians were lake and river dwellers and well acquainted with amphibians and stars and mushrooms. I could go on and on. As far as you're concerned, he did go on and on. And now, at the conclusion of his rant, he is bringing up mushrooms again. I realize it's cracking your little heart in two, but I've got to get over to the hotel and hear what Yamaguchi has to say. He's not supposed to say anything else before the conference tomorrow, but <laughs> he gives every indication of being out of control. Diamond slides his hand up your skirt, plucks like a liar the sex-encrusted crotch line of your panties. You would have stopped him, except for the past ten or fifteen minutes he has been squirming in his seat, and it is obvious he is in pain again. Moreover, his plucking is vibrating the lips of your vulva, and it feels, in a vulgar and embarrassing way, rather agreeable. Before I go, however, well, I'd be remiss if I neglected to say something else about the mushroom. I'll forgive you if you don't. You wouldn't want to miss Yamaguchi. No, 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 you really must hear this. The Africans often referred to Sirius as the seed star. It may sound quaint today and not very hip, but they believed emanations from the Syrian system were a pouring out of the seed of the soul, and that the seed which uh, energized the world came directly from Sirius, okay? Now, are you aware that it's possible for seeds to drift through space, through outer space? That seeds, over time and on their own, could theoretically travel from one solar system to another. Wouldn't they die out there? Some might, but many are perfectly equipped to survive for millions of years. Indefinitely, in fact. Mushroom spores, for example, aside from being very light in weight, have a particularly lengthy viability. This is another tidbit you gleaned in Timbuktu? Well, I sure as hell didn't hear it from Dean Witter. But imagine it. The hardy spores of psilocybic mushrooms blowing through darkest space, sifting and sailing, rubbing elbows with particles of cosmic dust for eons before finally entering Earth's atmosphere and eventually falling into bed, so to speak, into the moist soil of some prehistoric meadow, where they spread their mycelia and display their fruit, which someday, inevitably, will be sampled by a hungry or merely curious primate. Bingo! Bingo? Yes, yes, indeed. A light goes on. The energizing of the world has begun. The awakening of the soul. You see, the Nomo wouldn't have had to voyage to Earth in a starship or even to project telepathically. Everything they had to teach our species, from philosophical values to the anatomy of their star system, could have been transmitted through the medium of the mushroom. The mushroom may be the microphone of the overmind. And we know, don't we, Larry, you say with just a salt of sarcasm, that mushrooms are associated with frogs. Good girl! And the frogs have started to disappear. Yeah, something is afoot. Some force, some program that was set in motion millennia ago has begun to accelerate. 
You've mocked, perhaps, with justification my little conceit about the pad, but when I speak of being on the pad, all I mean is being intellectually, emotionally, and spiritually prepared to fully participate in the next breakthrough in evolution. It may occur as a sudden mutative thrust rather than the micro-step by micro-step advancement we've come to accept. And 90% of the population, those frozen in the ice pack of their bankrupt doctrines and brittle cliches, may be left behind. I'd hate to find you in their company. Well, that's sweet of you, but you don't need to worry about me. If I can ride out this darn market, you think, I'll take my chances with evolution fast, slow, or down the middle. Truthfully, I can't understand why you'd want me on the pad. Ah, uh, Hoptoad, can't you see? You have potential. You're a mother load of wit, of spunk, of courage, of adaptability. But it's all repressed and misdirected. You need to cut loose, open up, break free. He snaps your elastic, and you're potentially the best piece of ass in Seattle. You slap his hand away from your groin and push him toward his side of the car. What's more, I adore your voice. Really? You soften with a suddenness no mutative thrust could ever match. Really? You do? 6 p.m. As he limps across the street in the rain, Diamond's goodbye kiss reverberates in your mouth like a firecracker in a silverware drawer. The screwball certainly can kiss, you have to grant him that. But can world-class kissing compensate for... Oh, no. He's turning around and heading back to your car. You hope he isn't going to wax sentimental. He's already tried to extract a promise from you to meet again later in the evening or before his flight tomorrow. You said you would see what you could do. It would influence your decision if there was a chance that you could smuggle him into your disco for an hour or two, sit him down at your computer. Grandolin, he says, raindrops glistening on his stubble like champagne on a scouring pad. I hope you're not going to start thinking of me as your guru. Good grief, you have to laugh. <laughs> of course not, Larry. Not a chance. I can't save your soul. How about my job? Nobody can but you. At this stage of the game, it's every man for himself. Every woman, too. I can live with that. The Nomo can't save us either. They may be from Sirius, they may be an extrusion of the Overmind, they may be both at the same time, but they aren't going to ride to our rescue any more than Jesus is, or Marx, or any cavalry charge yet devised by the sanctimonious pimps who shill for our assorted and voracious ideologies. Mistrust them all, sweetheart. Oh, I do. The advent of the Nomo may not necessarily improve our lot. It may even make things worse. Perhaps the best we can hope for is that things will be different, that cycles will be broken, that dogmas will be discredited. Uncle Larry is for change, Gwendolyn. <laughs> He's for slipping into new skin, sharing information irresponsibly, and belly-flopping into those ancient ponds whose still waters we've gone so long without parting. Fine. Yes, well, just thought I ought to mention that. Thanks. You're considerate. Yes, yes, indeed. And in return, maybe someday you'll be considerate enough to tell me what you're doing with a fucking monkey in the trunk of your car. He rips you with his eyes, then hobbles away. Sunday night, April 8th. Some people calls it madness. 6.21 p.m. You fling open the trunk with what amounts to a prayer in your heart, praying that the conspicuously silent Andre has not perished for lack of oxygen, a detail you should have considered earlier, and are immediately reminded of the Mona Lisa, Andre and Leonardo's famous model share an ability to look quizzical and curious despite the fact that neither has eyebrows. Ham actors for whom eyebrows are the banners and billboards of all emotion 
could learn a lot about expression from the browless Mona, the browless macaque. Straighten Andre's hair, dress him in a Florentine smock and a thin veil, seat him on a loggia with eroded rocks and several miles of bad road behind him, and he could be the Mona Lisa's double. The monkey exhibits the same dainty and browless, face full of elusive sentiment, hinting at bewilderment, or is it private amusement? He looks so searching, so poignant, so altogether human as he regards you with an unexpected quietness from his nest of popsicle wrappers and tire chains that you cannot help but think of Italian art and evolution. Primate similarities notwithstanding, you would prefer to avoid the subject of evolution. Not that you doubt Darwin's theory. To the contrary, when you were a schoolgirl, you used to argue, as schoolgirls will, evolution with Grandma Mattie. Your grandmother did not believe in evolution. She believed in a literal interpretation of the book of Genesis. She believed in the Bible, in Imelda Marcos, in her homemade octopus adobo, and not much else. Grandma Maddie did not accept evolution in Oakland, California, and now that she is back in her ancestral village on the outskirts of Manila, she probably accepts it less. You, on the other hand, have always accepted it as a matter of course. Yet, until you met Larry Diamond, you thoughtlessly presumed that evolution was over with, that it had achieved its goals and then petered out. You, like millions of other arrogant chauvinists, had taken it for granted that the human species was the end product of the evolutionary process, its culminating and crowning glory. How could you have held that notion for an instant? We, with our propensity for murder, torture, slavery, rape, cannibalism, pillage, advertising jingles, shag carpets and golf, how could we be seriously considered as the perfection of a four-billion-year-old grandiose experiment. Perhaps as a race, we have evolved as far as we are capable, yet that by no means suggests that evolution has called it quits. In all likelihood, it has something beyond human on the drawing board. We tend to refer to our most barbaric and crapulous behavior as inhuman, whereas in point of fact it is exactly human, definitively and quintessentially human since no other creature habitually indulges in comparable atrocities. This negates neither our occasional virtues nor our aesthetic triumphs, but if a being at least a little bit more than human is not waiting around the bend of time, then evolution has suffered a premature ejaculation. In any event, Andre, for all his restrained and reflective Renaissance mien, seems to have endured his imprisonment salubriously. If he is uncharacteristically compliant as you lead him into your building, his motor skills are normal, his eyes bright. The question now is what to do with him until Belford gets home. Hours have passed since you last went to the toilet, and your bladder, repeatedly jostled by Diamond's prow, feels as large as a ripe melon, bursting and bruised. Yet if you are uneasy about leaving Andre alone, you are doubly uneasy about allowing him to accompany you to the bathroom. What type of woman would let a monkey watch her pee? In the end, wobbling along with your legs squeezed together, you usher him into the tub, fasten his harness chain to a faucet, and draw the shower curtain closed. By the time you plop down on the toilet seat, your stream is already underway. A close call, but you made it. You have voided only about a cupful, however, before the shower curtain is ripped down like a tyrant's flag, and Andre, gibbering all the while, is giving you the simian once over. You attempt to stem the flow, but it's just too painful. So, avoiding his gaze, you blush and squirt away. To the best of your knowledge, Andre has never enjoyed the companionship of a lady macaque but you have the distinct sensation that he has a pretty good idea of what it is you are trying to conceal. With that in mind, you are hasty and furtive when the moment comes to dab yourself dry, and you turn obliquely away from him to yank up your underpants. You smell like midweek at the Biloxi Shrimp Festival. 
Yet a shower and a change of clothes are out of the question until... until what? You are uncertain. Maybe you need to sit quietly somewhere and think. When you go to unhook Andre's tether from the faucet, his expression is less that of Leonardo's Mona Lisa than Franz Hall's laughing cavalier. You might even describe it as a smirk. Larry Diamond mentioned, God knows you cannot remember why, that frogs, relatively speaking, have unusually large bladders, providing a reserve of water that their bodies make use of on those occasions when they are trapped on dry land. For your own urinary receptacle, you desire no more dimensions because there is absolutely no way you will go to the bathroom with this animal again. 6.49 p.m. The Nile will teem with frogs. They will come up into your palace and your bedroom and onto your bed, into the houses of your officials and of your people, and into your ovens and kneading troughs. The frogs will go up on you and your people and all your officials. Thus promised the Lord God in Exodus chapter 8. In what century was that written, you wonder, and what does it mean? It seems the opposite of what is happening nowadays. Nowadays, it's people and officials who are teeming, while frogs are becoming quite scarce. You read the last line again. The frogs will go up on you and your people and all your officials. You are reading aloud to Andre, whom you have tethered to one of the living room radiators, for once you are glad your building has old-fashioned steam heat, and given a loaf of rye bread to mangle and eat. The macaque fancies raisin bread, but you haven't any raisin bread on hand, and you are sick and tired of catering to his tastes. I don't understand this biblical language, Andre, you say, but at least Larry wasn't lying about Egypt being invaded by frogs. I'd almost prefer it if he'd lied. What if all that weird stuff he said is true? Maybe we should read some more, okay? Ever since you brought out Grandma Maddie's old Bible, the monkey has been so attentive, so respectful, that it actually lends a modicum of credence to the claim that he is a Christian monkey, that he has been born again. No, couldn't be. Ridiculous. A coincidence or a con. At any rate, this is the scene. You are sitting rather primly in your favorite Jeffrey Bean architectura chair, with an open Bible on your lap, reading the word of the Lord to a heedful Barbary ape, when through the front door, which you had left ajar on the off chance that Cujo Huffington might happen down the hall, there suddenly bursts Belford Dunn. 6.56 p.m. Belford weeps. He actually weeps. So moved is he by the tableau upon which he has intruded, Moved not merely by his abrupt reunion with his beloved pet, but by the unexpected, unprecedented sight of you sweetly reading from the Holy Scriptures to your erstwhile antagonist, that teardrops the size of guppies swim down his cheeks. And through the tears he is beaming, beaming with such radiance that you would not be surprised if he formed a man-made rainbow. His smile seems to say, here at last, my dream come true, my little family, my domestic unit together, all safe and cozy and sweet, savoring each other's company while pursuing greater knowledge of the splendor of God. Once he has pasted your face with trembling kisses and nearly squeezed the banana-flavored crap out of Andre, who appears amused but hardly overjoyed to see his big master, Belford explains, I just couldn't stand it. So I went out to the airport and found a sailor who was willing to trade flights with me for $65. That's a lot of money for swapping tickets, but he was a Christian, he told me, so I knew he wouldn't waste it on beer and card games. Speaking of cards, is Cujo back too? Huh. Not only is Cujo not back, Belford, she was last heard of going through a locked door without a key. Oh, now, honeykins. Either that, or... Or what, Gwendolyn? Well, we'll straighten all that out, don't you worry. But first, you've got to tell me how you found him, my little rascal. Where was he? What was he doing? Tell me everything. You concoct a story, a fictional account that puts you in a favorable light, while Belford paces back and forth between you and Andre. 
Presumably, he fails to detect the fumes that rise from your sex-soiled body, perhaps because the macaque is likewise a study in pungency. In any case, he is equally adoring of you and his pet, a situation you find both endearing and irritating. I'm ashamed to admit it, Gwen, but there were moments this weekend when I lost faith. In Andre, in you, in Jesus, even. That's understandable, Belford, and I'm sure we all forgive you. You are equally sure that not one of you noticed. Your alleged swain is feeling amorous toward you. Uh, you can tell by the way he caresses your forearm, by the moony look in his eyes. He is ripe for a little harmless exploitation, yet you must be cautious. You must proceed slowly. Listen, you say. You and Andre need to spend some time alone together. Why don't you take him over to your place for an hour or two? Then maybe you and I can visit for a bit. You can secure him later on and come back over here. But only for a while, because I've got a huge stressful day tomorrow. Well, all right. I heard on the radio in the taxi that the market probably won't open in the morning. Not because of the crash, they were saying, but because of that atmospheric interference we've been having the past week. I don't know if it's sunspots or what. It's going to be a rough day in any case. Here, here, are your car keys. You give him a generic pret-a-porter smooch and nudge him toward the door. We'll talk in a couple of hours. Bye-bye, Andre. Have a nice evening. While I try to repair my shower curtain, you evil beast. Bye, honey. Thank you so much. I don't know how I can repay you. Oh, we'll think of something. 7.40 p.m. Leaving the shower curtain in a heap on the floor, you enjoy a leisurely soak. At one point, smelling the washcloth, you can't help but wonder where into diamond speculations fits the fact that human sexuality reeks of cod, an activity so basic, so primal, and so obviously perfumed by the tides. Gosh, you are surprised that the sniff cadet didn't make a big deal of it. Mostly, however, you think about business. It may be to your advantage if the markets do close for a day or two. You'll have more time to put your oil futures play into action, as well as to sweep a few things under the carpet, if it isn't too late, if Posner hasn't already decided to yank your plug. One of the reasons the market keeled over was the huge increase in margin debt, clients buying stocks on brokerage credit. Margin buying was a hunky-dory practice, in your opinion, until the masses tapped into it. The gates should never have been opened to Sam and Sally Seattle and all of their unsophisticated kin. Marginal people have no business with margins. You have said that all along, and now they have gone and ruined it for you. Or at least made it very difficult. On the other hand, they may have unwittingly provided you with a grand opportunity. Larry Diamond, the so-called financial genius, didn't dismiss your scheme as unworkable. Not at all. He simply has other interests. Interests you wish you had never been exposed to because, darn it all, they've lodged themselves in the back of your mind like one of those catchy, awful, embarrassing pop tunes. Dolphins with fingers, mushrooms with transmitters, Buddhas with webbed feet, starships with frog tanks, people with destinies that cannot be described. Where are George Washington's teeth when you really need them? Your body is the color of maple butter, and when it glistens with bath lotion, it looks as if it could be spread on the waffle of the world. You wrap it instead in a silk robe and take it to the kitchen to make it a salad. The spinach appears astonished when you dump it out of its plastic bag. You feel almost as though you have interrupted something. A red tomato revolves in your hand like a planet. For some reason, the world around you seems alive in a way it never was before. You have just forked the last Harpo Marx curl of arugula, jazzy and clownish and dimly electric, into your mouth when the telephone burbles. Diamond is on the line. You hadn't expected to hear from him quite so soon, but you have to confess to a tiny tinge of thrill, and you have to admonish yourself for feeling it. Is there something in your mouth, or are you just glad to hear from me? I'm finishing dinner, thank you. 
I rushed to the phone because I thought it might be Cujo. Alas, not. But I have a premonition I'm going to hear from her soon. You are going to hear from her? Yes, me. That's the premonition. But you know, it could be wrong. Anyway, Pussy Burger, I'm calling from a car phone. That explains the static. For a moment, you thought it might be the arugula. There's a lot of it tonight. Celestial interference seems to be getting worse. Look, I'm on I-5, coming back from SeaTac. What were you doing at the airport? That's for me to know and you to find out. I have something for you. An Easter present, you could call it. My new friend Reiko, who's been so kind as to show for me about, will be dropping me off at Thunderhouse in about, oh, uh, 20 minutes. Can you meet me there? Oh, uh, I don't know, Larry. I, I really don't think so. Good. You won't regret it. Every little pussy girl likes presents. I'm not a little... Don't call me that. I'll meet you in an hour. At 9.30. Outside in the lot. Okay? Outside. I'm not coming in. Whatever you say. Personally, I've had a lot of fun lately in parked automobiles. <laughs> yes, indeed. 9.30 p.m. The rain clouds have gone, gambled away their transparent dimes and box card out of town, spent, skinny, ragged, and broke. The moon, always a winner because it knows when to fold, stands on the balcony of the closed casino, looking as though it might light up a cigar. Stars blink at it, as if to say, as sure as this is Seattle, there'll soon be another batch of big spenders rolling into town from the west. The moon is in no hurry. It wipes its flushed brow with a cirrostratus handkerchief that must have fluttered from some sucker's pocket when he turned it inside out. You circle the bowling alley twice before parking. The lanes are dark. They must have shut down early on Sunday nights. The only light in the building seeps from a narrow row of basement windows on the west side. Twister's teepee, if you are not mistaken. You picture the burly Comanche meditating on his precious Van Gogh, squinting at one of the vigorously crayoned but lumpy peasants as if the figure were a phantom buffalo. No sooner have you switched off the engine when a car door slams behind you and Diamond steps out of a late-model Volvo. His hair is tangled, his clothing still damp, his limp pronounced, but his grin could paint Liberace's ceiling. Fun in parked automobiles, eh? What has he been doing with that Madame Butterfly? He slides into the Porsche and keeps on sliding. Within a second he has slid his tongue between your lips. Cautiously, as if you might be bitten, you disengage yourself from his osculation. You mustn't get must. Belford awaits you. How did it go with Dr. Yamaguchi? You inquire, wiping his saliva from your lips with your sleeve. I watched an American Western in Paris once. It was in English with French subtitles. A grizzled cowpoke walks into a saloon and growls, Give me a shot of red eye. And the subtitle read, Dubonnet, s'il vous plaît. Words don strange masks in translation. But Yamaguchi speaks English. He speaks English subtitles. Okay, but do you get a treatment or not? Only if I go to Japan. The FDA hasn't approved his treatment here, and Yamaguchi thinks it could take years. Wait a minute. You have to get the government's permission to have an anima? It's maybe the land of the free, sweetheart, but you're deluding yourself if you think your ass is your own. Well, you're going to Japan, aren't you? No, I'm going to Timbuktu. Why, Larry? Why is it so important you go to that stupid place? He pauses, drops his head back, and lowers his lids. I have a date with a frog, he drawls. 9.39 p.m. You suppose he is speaking of the Nomo. He could have been referring to a French girl, although in that case he probably would have said Froguette. Therefore, it must be the Nomo, some delusional foolishness involving the alleged mermen from outer space. But no, as it turns out, he meant exactly what he said, a frog. 
a particular species of frog, a frog whose skin secretes a biochemical agent, a complex nitrogenous peptide, whatever that is, that affects the human nervous system in a most peculiar way. Sounds like a drug. It's a hallucinogenic bufotoxin. Aspirin is a drug. But it makes you high. On Wall Street, they say, buy low, sell high. On the pad, we say, buy high, sell high. Isn't that somehow better? No, it's, it's irresponsible and unbusinesslike and probably dangerous. A great deal safer than the streets of Seattle. They're really fairly common, these magic froggies. Everybody who's ever read National Geographic knows about their use among the Indians of South America. Well, they're also native to West Africa. There's no evidence of their employment in contemporary religious or hunting practices, such as there is in the Amazon, but it's almost unthinkable, considering the historical relationship between tribal cultures and organic hallucinogens, that the Africans wouldn't have taken advantage of them at some point in the past. At least they had the good sense to stop. Climate changes and pressures from Islamic and Christian exploiters had a lot more to do with it than good sense, I'd venture. My theory, the theory that made my reputation at the University of Timbuktu, is that the Bozo and Dogon aquatic cosmology, the legend of the Nomo, was strongly colored, if not wholly inspired, by amphibian hallucinogens. I guess that would explain it all right if anybody cares. But what's that got to do with you going back to that dried-up camel pit? Especially with you being sick and all. As you might imagine, there are no longer any frogs in Timbuktu. But there used to be. The fossils prove that. Inspired by yours truly, a couple of guys from the university recently went into the jungle in Senegal and filled a flower sack with live specimens, stocked the little pond in the courtyard with them. Imagine them there, pussy gumbo, sweetening the wind with their erotic prayers, sucking the giant Sahara moon into their pulsating green throats. There's going to be a ceremony this fall sometime, fifty days after the rising of Sirius. That was when the Greek elite set out for Eleusis, you know, to drink the ergotized sacrament and be initiated into the mysteries. Ah, but this year my tumor rose before Sirius, and I may not be in a position to wait for September, so I'm going over early for a sneak preview. What, exactly? Of the magic frog elixir, exactly. Oh, now don't look at me with such toady scorn. You're planning to eat one of those poison frogs? Never, I promise. Anyway, a woman who orders frog legs in a downtown restaurant shouldn't be casting stones. Well, smoke them then? Smoke a frog? Me, who won't even puff a Havana Corona? No, the beauty is... The frogs aren't harmed. What one does is lick their skin for the sweat that's on it. The best spot is right about where the ears would be if they had ears. Sweat? Ew, gross. Right out of a fairy tale romance, darling. Remember those pretty princesses kissing amphibians? Incidentally, one can't actually get warts from handling frogs but one could possibly absorb bufotoxin through one's fingers. That's the origin of the superstition. Mustn't have the kitties blowing their wee minds. So why do you want to blow yours in such a disgusting way? Minds were made for blowing. Oh, Jesus, Larry. Do you recall why I went to see Q. Joe Huffington? Yeah, because Twister's father refused to let you blow your mind on mushrooms. In terms of strain on the immune system, wide place in the road may have had a point. But I needed to have my cerebral house and lot reappraised. And since Cujo, gifted though she is, is not in the same league as the psilocybic elves, I undoubtedly would have consulted the mushrooms anyway, 
even if I hadn't known I had an appointment in Timbuktu. We've established that certain mushrooms may function as normal microphones, broadcasting strange, nonlinear alien information, simultaneously archaic and futuristic. You established that, not me. But if Earth's frogs are directly related to the primary inhabitants of the Sirius system, then the data broadcast by their biochemical transmitters might be even more authentic, one step closer to the source. We might compare mushrooms to latter-day missionaries, while frogs are the offspring of the original apostles at least in terms of the purity of their neural transmissions. Yes, yes, indeed. You clasp your head in your hands. This is crazy, insane. I can't believe you're going off to some African hellhole to lick frogs. In the words of Cab Calloway, some people calls it madness, but I calls it hidey ho. It's just part of the process. You have no idea who Cab Calloway is, although you are sure you have heard your father speak of him, which is not an encouraging sign. What if you lick too much, or uh, something goes wrong? You're allergic or something. Risk is part of the process. And what are you going to do about cash flow? You're going to be needing medical attention. I bet you don't have a cent of insurance. Jeez, these men, Diamond and Belford, walking away from a regular paycheck, a big, fat, regular paycheck, as if a regular paycheck were no more than a habit. Diamond merely grins. Maybe I should practice on you. Licking, I mean. He allows his tongue to hang over his lower lip like a cold cut hanging out of a squashed sandwich. Stop it. Get serious. You look deranged. Now, now, be nice, pussy fondue. As advertised, Uncle Larry has a gift for you. Whereupon he digs in the front pocket of the roadkill that serves as his leather jacket, removes a small object, and presses your fingers around it. You open your fist, pleased to discover that in it is nothing mawkish, such as an engagement ring, or embarrassing, such as a sex toy, or creepy, such as a live frog, yet disappointed and perplexed that it is, Lighter? Not just any Bic lighter, Dr. Yamaguchi's Bic lighter. He gave it to me. A touching gesture. We hit it off. Mm, eye contact, mainly. Hail fellow, well met. Yes, in any case, the lighter's mine. It's not your gift. But fire it up, will you? I'm serious. That's right, go ahead. Flick your Bic. Gorged with fuel, the little device spouts an inch-high flame, which Diamond instructs you to hold steady. Then, from the inside pocket of that paleolithic bath mat he zips about his bony shoulders, he produces a pair of paper envelopes, one about eight inches long, thick, and brightly colored, the other shorter, thinner, plainer. Actually, he says, they're two gifts. But you get to keep only one. You have to choose. But what? In my left hand are airline tickets. First class, you might like to know. To Timbuktu. Not on my flight, unfortunately. Couldn't be arranged. You'd leave on Tuesday, Delta in New York, then Air Afrique to Bamako. I'd meet you there, and we'd enter Timbuktu together, the two of us hand in hand. Can you imagine what that would be like? Can you even imagine? As a matter of fact, you can't. For a slice of a second, maybe, your mind's eye sees a sprawl of crusty sand castles on a vast, sealess beach beneath a gun-smoke sky, you and Diamond standing in a mud arcade, looking pale and lost like the lovers in the tarot deck, while armed nomads in blue veils thunder by on camelback, accusing you in uncivilized tongues of illegally trafficking in frogs. But that image fades as quickly as it comes, leaving you staring blankly at Diamond's right hand. In this appendage, he draws, I'm holding, now keep the flame steady now, reasonably detailed notes and instructions, 
covering the steps you'd need to take to journal around your disco's database in such a way that Lundid could read you sitting on a hundred grand or more in your personal account, but without any hint of the phony funds or your trade with them ever showing up in Seattle. Unless, of course, oil prices don't move in the direction you're predicting, in which case, sooner or later, when you can't cover or you cover out of somebody else's account, some pretty serious gentleman will come to call. If your hunch is correct, though, you'll end up with bags of free money, and nobody will ever be the wiser. I apologize in advance for the condition of the notes. I wrote them with a ballpoint pen in Reiko's car, part of them while the car was moving. Now, he moves the envelopes closer to the lighter, which is starting to heat up at an uncomfortable rate. I want you to set fire to one of the envelopes, one or the other. The tickets or the cheap notes, one of them has to go up in smoke. It's your choice. The pepperoni or the pearl. You can connive to improve your life within the existing boundaries of your life. Or you can expand your life, maybe even transform your life. You can risk your freedom for a taste of jumbo juice. Or you can risk absolutely everything for something that may be incomprehensible, even if you achieve it. Just give one of these babies the torch, Gwendolyn, and we'll both live with the consequences. Come on. Don't go numb on me. If you don't choose, by the time I count to five, the offer's withdrawn. I'll burn both envelopes. One. Two. Wait a minute, Larry. Although the bick is burning your fingers, you must stall for time. It's clear out now. Can you see Sirius? Do you think Sirius A? Is it uh, over my shoulder, maybe? No, it isn't. This time of year, Sirius sets a bit after nine o'clock. Three. But I saw it Friday night. Uh, must have been close to eleven. Impossible. I'm counting. I did see it. It was the brightest star in the sky. I saw B, too. No, you didn't. Not at this latitude. Not in April. We're going to run out of lighter fluid. Well, I saw something in the West, an extremely bright star. What else could it have been? Maybe it was E.A. Pelutolo. Now stop procrastinating. You mean the Nomo spaceship? The Ark? The star of the tenth moon? <laughs> You're not serious. You're kidding me. Anything is possible. I'm counting. But Larry... You say eagerly, what if you're right? What if it was out there beaming up frogs or something? He doesn't go for it. Far, he says. 10.10 10 p.m. So disoriented are you when you weave out of the bowling alley lot that you accidentally turn down a narrow side street that dead ends at a sheet metal shop. Rather than turning around, once you realize your mistake, you pull over to the curb, shift into neutral, and sit there idling. You cannot believe what you have just done. He must have hypnotized you, put you in some kind of African trance. You thought at the moment, if indeed you thought anything at all, that you were acting on intuition. But maybe it was something else. A woman is supposed to be able to trust her intuition. It's supposed to work in her favor. You couldn't seem to help yourself. And he does have strange mental powers. From the seat beside you, you pick up the envelope, examine it, shake your head. Tickets to Timbuktu. One-way tickets to Timbuktu. Good grief! Is this the dumbest, most self-destructive decision you have ever made, or what? Oddly enough, you are less than overcome with remorse and regret. In fact, for the third or fourth time this weekend, a rare, unjustifiable giddiness has overtaken you. The bell of your trumpet is bent back to the mouthpiece like a snake swallowing its own tail. You are in a mild state of shock, it is true, yet no sense of grave finality plugs the ducts of your inner workings. Perhaps it just hasn't sunk in yet. Perhaps you are in denial. 
but the cocktail of emotions your heart is guzzling contains a carbonated mixer of unspecified excitement, in addition to the jiggers of fear and disbelief. Wow, you think. Jesus. Wow. There is a lump in your chest the size of a cauliflower, which initially you identify as a knot of acute anxiety. Gradually, however, it becomes apparent that the lump is a compressed globe of mirth. There is a large laugh inside you, or else a nexus of tiny giggles petitioning to escape. Under the circumstances, it is embarrassing, this suppressed laughter, and you dare not release it, lest it have implications of hysteria. It certainly doesn't feel like hysteria, but just the same. Again, in the shine of the street lamp, you inspect the packet of airline tickets. An option, you think? Only an option. As much as you are fascinated by Larry Diamond as, come on, admit it, susceptible to his sexuality as you have reluctantly become, as concerned as you are about his illness, if he believes for one moment that he has captured you, that you have volunteered to become his Timbuktu love slave, well, he had better not count his frogs before they peep. Still, what if you did follow him to Timbuktu? What if you thumbed your little Anglo nose at Posner, the disco, the SEC, at the entire economic situation, and took off to the ends of the earth? What if you really did? With that thought, a laugh breaks loose. It is a short laugh, but rather loud, and since another one is pressing to follow on its heels, you glance around to ascertain that nobody on this inglorious little mixed-up street of Norwegian cottages and marine metal fabricators has overheard you. Instantaneously, the ball of chuckles dissolves, for there, directly across the street from you, parked in front of one of those cheesy snooze junction clappards, is Cujo's Geostorm. 10.15 p.m. As noiselessly as a paraplegic cricket, you steal out of your car and over to Cujo's. The Geo is empty. Her body is not slumped in its seats, and there is no way she would fit in its trunk, probably not even if she were dismembered. You look up and down the street. The industrial buildings are deserted, and of the half-dozen cottages, two are dark, four faintly aglow with a photonic frost of television. It seems safe enough to try the door. Not surprisingly, it is unlocked. These days in Seattle, as Cujo is well aware, to lock one's door is to issue an invitation to have one's windows smashed. A rush of stale tobacco stink smacks your nostrils. Nothing else. No note, no remnant of clothing, nothing beyond an ashtray overflowing with ill-shaped butts and a wadded-up wrapper from a meatball sub to indicate that the vehicle is not owned and operated by a robot. Maybe Sherlock Holmes might find a clue here, but for you, the search is fruitless. Quietly, you return to the Porsche. When you get home, you will telephone the police and report the whereabouts of the Geo. Meanwhile, its discovery has struck a note of optimism. If for no other reason than it has convinced you once and for all that Diamond is not responsible for Cujo's disappearance. Maybe absence is a better word. Diamond might be eccentric, but he isn't stupid. He would hardly harm a woman and then allow her car to sit a block away from Thunder House. With that in mind, you drive off for your meeting with Belford Dunn. 10.34 p.m. Honeykins, where have you been? As arranged, Belford is waiting for you at your apartment, he is a trifle agitated. I told you I had to run an errand. At this hour, on Sunday night, I was worried. I was looking for Cujo's car, and uh, I found it. No fooling you did. Where? Oh, over in Ballard. But how did you know where to look? Just a hunch. I found Andre for you, didn't I? Oh, I'm a regular detective. You give him a peck on the cheek. Now, loosen your tie and relax. Put on some music. I'm going to report this to the police, and then I'll be with you. Easier said than done. You spend more than ten minutes negotiating a bewildering electronic labyrinth before you reach a living human being, only to be told that the Bureau of Missing Persons, 
meaning the white-haired investigator and the iguana woman who fronts for him is closed and that you should call back after nine tomorrow morning. Your argument that the situation could be serious, the discovery of the car significant, falls on steel ears. Frustrated and fed up, could public services be a whole lot worse in Timbuktu, you slam down the receiver and storm off to the bathroom. There you wash your face, apply a fresh patina of chic, and analyze the immediate state of affairs. Undoubtedly, Belford will insist on discussing the Cujo situation, and once that subject is exhausted, he will have questions about Andre, about, for example, the methods employed to pacify him, the specific Bible verses read to him, how and why they were selected, and what steps need be taken to ensure that he does not fly the coop again. Is the monkey completely trustworthy? Do you think Belford has failed him? Etc. All this could gobble the better part of an hour, and you simply lack the patience for it. You will, in fact, scream if you have to go through it, and a screaming fit at this juncture would probably not promote your agenda. Thus, with a higher purpose ultimately in mind, you remove your outer garments and return to the living room in your underwear. 10.52 p.m. Would you still find me attractive if I hadn't lost my tail? Belford has selected the soundtrack from The Sound of Music, the closest thing to Christian entertainment in your meager collection of CDs, and seated on the plush Paluco sofa, he is absent-mindedly humming along with Julie Andrews when you mince into the room in peach lace undies to paralyze him in mid-hum. When he regains the power of speech, he stammers, oh, wow, what, what, uh, what are you talking about? Tail? I had a tail once. When I was an embryo, I had little flippers and ridges and grooves alongside my head like the gill slits of a fish. As you say these things, you turn deliberately around and around as if you were a model on a runway, and with each turn your hips move closer to Belford's face. So, suppose I still had a tail. B but you don't. Belford's breath is behaving as if his lungs were overweight farm boys trying to squeeze through the strands of a barbed wire fence. His Adam's apple resembles a squash ball bouncing down the steps of an Aztec temple. I, I, I don't believe it's an actual tail that we have in the womb, but whatever it is, it looks like a tail. It goes away long before we're born. But if we're created in God's image, how come the human fetus is so much like a fish or a frog? Did Martin Luther address that question, when he wasn't busy addressing the question of how many bowling pins the Lord intended? If there's no such thing as evolution, how come we have tails and gills when we're embryos? And why don't I have any now? Taking your question a tad more seriously than you meant it, or perhaps seeking a diversion from the round little bottom that is hovering only about ten inches from his nose, he scratches his large, durable head, and after long consideration says, We're only in God's image after we're born. If we're, you know, funny-looking, frog-looking in the early stages of our development, well, it's it, probably a warning. The Lord is telling us that if it wasn't for His merciful love, we could all be born looking like something that hops around in the slime. You see what I mean, hon? That's the way our babies would turn out if Satan was in the driver's seat. Jeez, you hadn't intended to precipitate a theological discourse. To wrench the subject several degrees to the left of mainstream religion, you peel your panties slowly off your buttocks until your very perineum is exposed. But you never did answer me. How do you think I'd look with a tail? Belford can stand it no longer. He pulls you down on the sofa beside him, practically on top of him, to tell the truth, and commences to kiss and fondle you with an appetite close to frenzy. <laughs> this is getting ahead of schedule, if not out of hand. <laughs> you manage to free yourself. Whoa, easy! He looks hurt. Wh what's wrong? Did I... Don't you want me to take off my bra? I thought you liked my little Filipina moons. 
Belford nods twice, once to indicate that he does wish you to remove your brassiere, a second time to reaffirm his allegiance to your relatively undersized bust. Smiling, you unhook the bra. This model fastens in the front, but draw it back only far enough to reveal the narrow plane of flesh between the mounds. Holding a bra end in each hand, you pause and look him squarely in the eye. Belford, you say, there's a serious matter I need to discuss with you, and I'm sorry about this, but until we get it out of the way, it's just going to be weighing on my mind, distracting me. You smile again and saw the bra back and forth, your breasts jiggling like yokes in their poachers of lace. You don't want me to be distracted, do you? He does not. He wants only what you want. Like the gentleman everyone believes him to be, he sits back and listens politely as you deliver a Reader's Digest version of your scheme to turn the current financial crisis to your advantage. Were he truly a gentleman, he probably would not have maintained an erection throughout your speech, although there are extenuating circumstances. To wit, you are sitting beside him with your brassiere unhooked and your panties down around your thighs. Now comes the delicate part and you strive for composure in an outward display of cheerful confidence. You require a short-term loan, say a hundred thousand dollars, more if possible, to be repaid with interest, and in the event of matrimony, profits shared. Washington is a community property state. Attentive, even enthralled, Belford lets you complete your pitch. Then he takes your small, cute hands sympathetically in his big, rough ones, and as your bra falls open, he says, Golly, that's a very interesting idea, sweetie. <laughs> kind of risky. No, no, Belford, it's a lock. Trust me. But the fact is, I, I couldn't help you in any case. I have to tell you what I did. He grins a grin that in certain parts of Montana would attract wolves and coyotes from miles around. Gwen, I made a promise to God. I promised the Father that if he was to see fit to deliver Andre back to me safe and sound, I would donate 90% of my savings to the Lutheran Homeless Shelter. Oh, honey, I'm sorry, I really am. I can't stand to see you disappointed, but I was desperate, and he heard my plea. He took pity on me in my darkest hour. And you know, a guy just doesn't break a promise to the Lord. As your mind plays reruns of the Bic lighter, the envelope of instructions, the fire that illuminated the Porsche cockpit, the ashes that sifted like nuclear snow onto Diamond's jeans, you think, what about my darkest hour? Hey, it was me who got your goddamn monkey back. For several minutes, neither of you speaks. Your mind races nervously over your list of remaining options, like the fingers of a blind espresso drinker reading the Braille menu in a coffee bar. Belford squeezes your hands and sort of coos and moos at you. He sounds like the background noise at a petting zoo. Through it all, however, he never loses his erection. And eventually, like the only tree left standing after a hurricane, it gets your attention. There is a natural desire to touch such a tree, to thump it, to lean against it, perhaps to lunch in its shade. That must be it. Otherwise, why, at this intensely delamatic juncture, when so much is at stake, and when your romantic relationship with Belford has crossed the threshold of termination, would you reach out and grasp his suited phallus, pulling and bending it as if you were a Sherwood Forest bowmaker testing a sapling? Misinterpreting your gesture, Belford swoops you up and carries you off to the bedroom. You ought to protest, but instead you kick off your underpants and root while unbuttoning his shirt. Now, the plunge into the erotic is often a flight from a troublesome reality, yet it can occasionally be a centering device, a furnace in which to burn off all energies except that clear cerebral energy upon whose light an accurate, revelatory focus ultimately depends. 
in retrospect, you will be able to claim this reckless coupling as a prime example of the latter. But for the moment, you are aware of little beyond the keen throb of an incandescent clitoris, a blistered hawthorn aching to be salved. He lays you down among the grateful mites and steps smartly out of his trousers. Syncopic with a strange impersonal craving, you stare, transfixed, as he removes his boxer shorts, folds them neatly, and places them on top of the dresser. His member may resemble a turkey neck, but it is very large and very stiff, and you scarcely can restrain yourself from crying out for it. Hurry, hurry, you mutter, as in the next room a blithe Julie Andrews lists for anyone who's interested a few of her favorite things. Heaving like a garden tractor, Belford busts the sod of your guilt. Yes, there is a layer of guilt there, but it only makes your submission more frictional and therefore more galvanizing. You split open for him like a furrow. He plants a root crop, and the root crop runs deep. You rear, twist, shove, and squirm so as not to miss an inch of it. His back is a brown paper package, your legs the string. Take it from the top, Julie. Periodically, every three minutes or so, you think that you are finished with this lewd business, that you have had your fill, that you will push him off you and regain your composure, if not your dignity, but then he will bump up against some nerve ending that has not been previously massaged, and you lose yourself for another three minutes until you have rubbed every last hitch of pleasure out of that spot. Belford, you say between grunts, isn't this the best sex we've ever had? He is so surprised to hear you actually speak during intercourse that he freezes for a moment, as if alarmed. Then he nods in the affirmative. Belford, too, has never spoken during the act of love, and he, for one, is apparently not about to spoil his record. And with his cigar-sized fingers spreading the cheeks of your derriere, he resumes his thrust from a slightly different angle, sending a shock wave rumbling and jerking all the way to your gums. Now suddenly he is lodged against your clitoris, pinning it to the wall, as it were, flattening it against the wall, where he polishes it repeatedly, like an old Greek grocer polishing an eggplant, like Aladdin summoning a reluctant genie polishes it until you can feel it shine, feel it lighting up your vagina like a Broadway show. Ta-da! Down the aisle trots the white pony, proud and frisky. With a swish of its mane, it bounds through the orchestra pit, leaps over the footlights, and lands center stage with a mighty whinny, hooves pawing the boards, mouth foaming, nostrils flaring, eyes popping on and off as if bulbs in a strobe. It brings down the house, and when Belford showers it with a hot tsunami of liquid white roses, it stands on its head for an encore. 11.56 p.m. In the breathy aftermath of this show-stopping extravaganza, you feel less satisfied than vindicated, less vindicated than liberated. Satisfaction is nothing but a temporary anesthetizing of the numinous noogie of existence. Vindication is merely revenge without the mustard. Liberation, on the other hand, liberation is a front so big that the only back that can match it is death, and even death may not be a perfect fit. Any fear you harbored that Larry Diamond had a hold on you had put you in some psychosexual trance, completely dissipated in the surf of your orgasm. True, you may not have been able to achieve that orgasm if it hadn't been for Diamond. It was he who showed you how to spur the white pony all the way over the hill. And should there ever come a time when sex plays a more important role in your life than it does at present, a time when an admirer might actually dub you the best piece of ass in Seattle, and you, God forbid, feel honored by it, then you suppose you shall be in Diamond's debt. For now, however, having shot the wildest imaginable rapids in a raft launched by the barely competent Belford Dunn, you feel liberated from obligation, from dependency, 
from awe. Feel free from Diamond's potential influence or domination. Feel in charge of your own destiny, and not a penny less. And, washing up at the bathroom sink while Belford snores, you know exactly what action you are going to take. One thing you do not know, alas, is that Belford, in a rare display of proprietary presumption, unplugged both of your telephones immediately after your futile call to police headquarters. Had your apartment been online, you would have received an hour ago a message from Larry Diamond, a message urgent in tone, if not in substance, a message concerning an alleged sighting of Q. Joe Huffington. An absurd message, frankly, yet one that might have altered the bold course upon which you are about to embark. It might have. And again, it might not. Monday morning, April 9th. Another day in the life of a fool. 12.33 a.m. An ear being cleaned with a cellophane Q-tip. A duck eating shredded wheat in an echo chamber. The gods frying ambrosia burgers. The void gone electric. Termites reading aloud from Kafka. There is so much static on the line that you barely recognize Saul Finkelstein's voice when he answers a phone at Posner, Lampert, McAvoy, and Jacobson. He, on the other hand, like an ornithologist who can pick out the chirp of a chickadee in rush hour traffic, identifies your pee-wee piping instantly. Where the hell are you, Matty? The fun has stopped. It's time to dance with the dead. He sounds as if he is still slightly drunk, and he offers no apology for his rudeness on Thursday night. Ah, uh, listen, Saul. Speak up, Matty. I can hardly hear you. Communications are a mess. Posner and I have tried every frigging exchange in Europe. The Yamaguchi bubble is about to burst, and we want to short the whole Japanese index. Short the Nikkei? Yes. Why hadn't you thought of that? But we can't crack the interference. Tried to fax London a minute ago, and instead of a fax signal, I got Asian sports scores. Ever hear of a basketball team called the Hong Kong Flu? Saul, I I've got some personal stuff at the disco. Pictures and stuff. Would you have Judy Mulligan clean out my desk and take everything home with her? I'll send for it later. What are you saying, Maddie? You're walking? Posner's got a whole bag of bones to pick with you. I'd advise you to come in and face some music. Or don't you have the decency, the guts? A cyclone blows a pile of dry leaves through the PA system at a high school pep rally. When the crackling subsides, you say, Kiss my third world ass, Saul, and fuck Posner and the cookbooks he wrote in on. Before you hang up, you add, If you had a clue, Toad Brain, you'd know the fun is just beginning. Zippity doo da! 12.39 a.m. Standing over Belford, you watch the rise and fall of his hairy chest. In a pulse of deja vu, you flash back to Andre, tranquilized atop Cujo's table. Compared to the monkey, though, Belford looks touchingly unworldly. Not that Andre is actually corrupt. He has just had to be clever in certain unorthodox ways in order to survive. Like you, Gwendolyn? Yes, you suppose you are beginning to feel a modicum of kinship with the exploited macaque. In any case, Belford isn't free of stain. He unplugged your phones, didn't he? Well, so what? That was easily corrected. In the living room, you simply jacked back in and burned a bridge. A major bridge. Jesus, you hope you won't come to regret it. You kneel now and reconnect the bedside phone, unaware, of course, that you have missed Diamond's call. Were you a voicemail subscriber, like nearly everyone else in America who can still afford telephone service, you could retrieve his unique message, but you chose instead one of those state-of-the-art answering machines that are not much larger than a tarot card. You are suspicious of voicemail. Who knows what pirates might hack into one's stored messages? A businesswoman has to be careful these days. Unlike the typical Filipino who favors long, often fake, brightly painted nails, even Grandma Maddie goes in for them, yours are trim and natural. 
bitten to the quick, frankly. So you do not hesitate to draw them over Belford's smooth pink cheeks. He stirs. <sighs> Wake up, lover boy. We've got some cliffs to jump off of. Huh? Got to make hay while the moon shines. W what? Belford, you don't by any chance have an enema, do you? The old-fashioned kind? Abruptly, he sits up. Uh, honey, are you sick? Probably, but it's not what you think. Get dressed now. I need you to run an errand with me. 12.59 a.m. You are all in black. Black jeans, black sneakers, black Jane Barnes sweater, black beret covering the steadily increasing number of gray strands that violate the blackness of your hair. In your black handbag, you have secreted your spare canister of mace. Let's stop by your place first, you say. But, hon, I told you I don't have any enema stuff. Well, that's okay. I think we should check on Andre. That's so sweet. But I'm sure he's safe and sound. Yes, but he may be lonely for us. Belford regards you adoringly. Well, all right. He's probably sleeping, though. He and I had a little roughhouse before I locked him up. Boy, is that little rascal strong. I think he got tuckered, though. Let's take a peek, you say, and Belford aims the Lincoln toward Queen Anne Avenue. You have not traveled far before the moon that travels with you, sailing above the dirty sorrows and fortified excesses of the city, an unabashed, charismatic reminder of the primordial magic that the institutionalized, technologized mind has never quite succeeded in repressing. That moon is vulgarly, if temporarily, obfuscated by a boogie-woogie of cobalt and ruby oscillations. An ambulance and several police cars are blocking the street, emergency lamps flashing, and a crowd has gathered outside a modest duplex. When you get closer, you spot Smokey and Cecil. Don't those two ever go home to their loved ones? among the cops who are waving onlookers away from a prone figure being attended to by medics on the lawn. Turn around, you order. But just a minute. No, no, turn around. Let's get out of here. Honey, that house, that's the house where I... I know what house it is, Belford. You got clobbered there. Wasn't once enough? Belford powers down his window. Excuse me, sir, what's happened? It's a safe sex rapist. Guy who lives in that house captured him. Nearly took his head off with a croquet mallet. Oh, dear. Come on, let's leave now. Officer Smokey is looking directly at the Lincoln, gesturing for it to turn around. You lower your head, slump down in the seat. Good grief. But it's a mistake. That poor fellow isn't the rapist. He's that woman's friend. You can't be sure of that. And so what if he is? He got what was coming to him. Judge not lest, screw around not lest, somebody screw you around. These people have no morals. Let's go. But I can help. I know these people. No, you don't. Some nameless lout tries to decapitate you while his slut of a wife stands there watching with her you-know-what hanging open. You think that makes you boon companions? Smokey has started to walk in your direction. You slouch down further, causing Belford to inspect you with a perplexity that borders on suspicion. If there's a mix-up, you say, they'll sort it out soon enough. If you don't move us out of here, I'm going to get very angry. Unhappily, Belford shifts into reverse, backs into a driveway, and wheels the Lincoln around. As it pulls away, you bolt upright and blow a kiss at Smokey. You are uncertain if he recognizes you, but he continues to stare until you turn the corner, and that makes you giggle. Belford is not giggling, however. Puzzled and leery, he pouts all the way to his building. Here we are, he announces tersely. You still want to go up? Listen, I'm sorry I got uptight. I just don't understand why you think you have to hold the hand of every loser who stumbles down the pike. It's my Christian duty, Gwen. The weak deserve all the help those of us who are more blessed can give them. That's very tender of you, but I have a... I'm acquainted with a gentleman 
who claims that the extent to which a society focuses on the needs of its lowest common denominator is the extent to which that society will be mired in mediocrity. Whereas if we would aim the bulk of our support at the brightest, most talented, most virtuous instead, then they would have the wherewithal to solve a lot of our problems, to uplift the whole culture, enlighten it or something, so that eventually there wouldn't be so many losers and weaklings impeding evolution and dragging the whole species down. He claims martyrs like you just perpetuate human misery by catering to it. He believes individuals have to take responsibility for their own lives and accept the consequences of their choices. Belford snorts. Easy for him to say. Probably some privileged stockbroker who's never had to... He was an autistic child, and now he has cancer. Oh, dear me, I'm sorry to hear that. Hey, everybody has a hard luck story. The point is, he's never whined... Never given in to fate. He's... Well, that's commendable. It's good to be a fighter. Well, he's not really a fighter. He's an adventurer. There's a difference. He doesn't attack. He engages. He doesn't defend. He expands. He doesn't destroy. He transforms. He doesn't reject. He explores. He doesn't... Well, you get the picture. Where, Gwendolen, is this coming from? Belford studies you, his broad, honest face creased with doubt. Sounds like Mr. Adventure made quite an impression on you. <laughs> I'd enjoy meeting him. He's leaving the country in the morning on a six o'clock flight. Belford cannot conceal a breath of relief. Can't blame him, I guess. America certainly can't pretend any longer that it's got the best medical care in the world. But anyway, with all due respect, I'd have this to say to him. A great many people out there in the ghetto and the street are incapable of taking responsibility for their lives. Those who aren't actually incapacitated are suffering from a decay of the spirit. They can't explore options because they aren't aware that options exist. They've never been exposed to ideas like transformation and expansion. Worse than that, honey, they've never been exposed to love. You know? They have zero self-esteem because nobody's ever really loved them. That's where martyrs like me come in. You can love them till your well runs dry, Belford, but you can never love them enough, and you know it. No matter how much others might love you, you can't love yourself unless you're in charge of your own actions, and you'll never take charge as long as you can get away with blaming your shortcomings and misfortunes on your family or society or your race or gender or Satan or whatever. Sooner or later, a person... Patiently, he waits for you to resume... But having become keenly aware of how much you are sounding like Diamond, and dimly aware that in the eyes of some you yourself are less than a shining example of responsible behavior, you let the matter drop. I bet the monkey's awake, you say. It isn't, but when Belford goes to the kitchen for a glass of water, you kick its cage until it stirs. Ordinarily, it would screech in this situation, but tonight, uh, rather this morning... It gives you the Mona Lisa look instead. If the fact that there are 550 hairs in the average human eyebrow prompts you to feel superior to the macaque, which is 550 hairs short, you conceal it well. You smile at Andre, conspiratorially, as if to suggest that only he and you are reading the correct libretto. Wake up, Mona me. It's time to get cracking. The moon is out. And it's the color of that big topaz you snitched from the Marquise du What's-A-Name in Monte Carlo. You have to see it, Mon ami. It's as bright as a banana popsicle. 1.40 a.m. The fleet ready-to-use enema, manufactured by the CB Fleet Company of Lynchburg, Virginia, costs $1.25 is totally disposable and looks as if it could be used for caulking the planks in a rowboat, filling chinks in a fireplace, or decorating a cake. 
It consists of a soft, handheld plastic dispensary bottle with a one-way safety valve that controls flow and prevents reflux, containing 19 grams of monobasic sodium phosphate and 7 grams of dibasic sodium phosphate in several ounces of saline solution. The label contains the following caution. Remove orange protective shield from rectal tip before inserting. Which seems straightforward enough until you recall that 50% of the American population is semi-illiterate. Ouch! Fool, that'll teach you to drop out of school. The disposable squeeze bottle is the only type of enema sold in the only all-night pharmacy in greater Seattle. Belford predicted as much. He said that to obtain an old-fashioned rubber bag and tube enema apparatus nowadays, you would probably have to go to a hospital supply store. He also said that according to an article in Nature magazine, the enema was invented by South American Indians who sometimes employed the device to administer hallucinogenic mixtures through the rectum. Two days ago, such base and altogether useless information would have filled you with disgust. Now it brings Larry Diamond luridly to mind, and, well, to tell the truth, it still fills you with disgust. All the more so because it was passed along by Belford Dunn, whose tame Lutheran realtor's brain could scarcely be thought a repository of the grossly weird. Are there no innocents anymore? Could some magazine scanned in a barbershop somewhere also have acquainted Belford with the arcane practice of licking frogs? Frustrated by the drugstore, although you were hardly looking forward to the embarrassment of purchasing enema equipment, you pick up several items from the vitamin and school supplies departments and return to the Lincoln. Guess you'll just have to wait till morning, sweetness. I'm sorry. Gee, you know, I think the little rascal wants to eat again. I can't wait, you say, much to Belford's bewilderment, and Andre's just going to have to. Because he had been feeling guilty about confining him to his old cage again, Belford did not have to be persuaded to bring Andre along on your trip to the pharmacy. And now Monkey and Master are staring at you beseechingly, they in the front seat, you in the rear. You stare them down. Later, you say coldly, right now we're heading to Chinatown. 2.06 a.m. In other areas of the city, any city, neon is just so much electrified signage. But in Chinatown, neon is song, theme music, the visual soundtrack to the neighborhood. Tourists are yanked into Chinatown by shivering tentacles of unnatural color to be swallowed up by a radiant carp maw infected with exotica. Among China's many contributions to the world, from gunpowder to pasta, one cannot list neon lighting. Yet Chinatown without neon is as unthinkable as the South Seas without palm trees. How else can one be sure that one is there? If food is the holy grail of Chinatown, neon is the grail's aura, its halo, as well as the pendulous lodestone whose swaying luminescence hypnotizes each and every visitor, clouding their minds with illusions of forbidden pleasures and a romantic elsewhere. The neon of Chinatown is a neon of mystery, a neon of joy. Fong, says the neon. Fu, it says. Well, all right then, Fong Fu it is. Mysterious and joyful Fong Fu. The neon can also say Imperial Garden or Moon Temple. And while the words are ordinary English, the letters that form the words might have been blown out of a Shanghai opium pipe imitating calligraphy like small boys imitating their grandfathers. The letters are ridiculous, yet somehow charming, corny, yet entirely correct. There is an appropriateness even to those whose elements have been fashioned to resemble stalks of bamboo, and the neon gas that courses through them like a supernatural plasma, pumping life into images of dragons, pagodas, and rice bowls, this gas is the hue of barbecue sauce, the hue of pickled duck feet, the hue of opera, hue of hibiscus and ginseng, silkworm, and firecracker. Neon pushes its embroidery needle in and out of the sky above Chinatown, 
decorating the canopy that will both protect and advertise it, setting it apart from other parts of town. The profusion and the nature of its neon signs is the first indication that you and your companions have reached Seattle's Chinatown. The next indications are the deteriorating low-rise buildings, the Buddha shadows thrown against old brick walls, and the shamble of busted bok choy crates on every corner. The sidewalks of Chinatown are where the outer leaves of green vegetables come to die. In Seattle, Chinatown is officially referred to as the International District, a polite term that is accurate in one regard and dead wrong in another. Europeans neither reside nor keep businesses in the district, nor do people from Africa, South America, Australia, or the Middle East, so it is hardly international. On the other hand, the Chinese there have been joined by Japanese, Koreans, Vietnamese, Cambodians, and, yes, Filipinos. A more fitting name might be Asia Town. In any case, Freddie Matty does not live there in order to rub shoulders with other Asians. Freddie Matty lives in Chinatown because it is close to the clubs, because the police are paid to stay away, and primarily because it is cheap. Your father occupies the fourth and uppermost floor of a small building belonging to the Lipo Trading Company, an importer and wholesaler of convict-made bric-a-brac. His windows are lit, which does not surprise you, for Freddy seldom retires before dawn, and since the clubs are closed for the observance of Easter, he would have nowhere else to go. Belford thinks it is sweet that you are dropping in on your dad, although the hour is rather odd. He insists on accompanying you due to the fact that the stairs are steep and poorly lit, and also because he is eager to foster cordial relations with a prospective in-law. Freddy is slow to answer your knock, and you can smell marijuana smoke escaping through the jams. You don't know if Belford is ready for this. On the other hand, you don't know if Freddy is ready for the monkey that is bouncing up and down on his hind legs in the gloom. Squeak! shouts Freddy when he at last cracks the door. Far out! Hey! Although you rarely return your father's calls and visit him no more than once or twice a year, he never complains. And when you do see him, he is invariably grateful and glad. Under the circumstances, his cheerfulness is unsettling. You would almost prefer that he reproach you. My squeak baby, come in, squeak baby. Ah, who dealt with you? He notices Andre. Oh, wow! I can't believe I'm seeing this man. Obviously delighted by the sight of the macaque, Freddy begins to giggle and dance around. In fact, his antics and the monkeys are not dissimilar. Somebody juking me! Wow, man! This a true monkey or a robot? Hey, I think this monkey for real! He sure is, Mr. Matty. Real as you or me. Good evening. My name's Belford Dunn. If Belford is expecting Freddy to say, Oh, yes, my daughter has told me so much about you, he is destined to be disappointed. Even now, you are not inclined to help them get acquainted, although you suppose it no longer matters whether or not Belford learns that your father uses drugs. More than likely, it never would have mattered to Belford anyway. Belford despises drugs, but Freddy, financially disadvantaged and a member of an ethnic minority, would be the recipient of far more pity than scorn. In any case, they will have to work things out on their own. Barely have you crossed the threshold than you excuse yourself and druid through a stonehenge of cardboard boxes, record albums, tapes, compact discs, books, and drums, finding your way to the bathroom. You don't bother to pull the string that dangles like a strand of spaghetti from the meatball-sized overhead bulb. You know what you are looking for, and the neon gleam sputtering through the window from the signs outside is quite sufficient to illuminate it. In fact, it takes you only a moment to find it. There is an order to Freddy's untidiness, and you are well aware that despite Grandma Maddie's complaints, he has never thrown away anything that once belonged to your mother. For example, all those books on the loft floor, stacked, occasionally dusted, used as pedestals for bongos and wine bottles, but no longer read. It is not a book that you drop into your handbag, however, although there are books that are treated with no more dignity. 
As a subterfuge, you flush the toilet. Quite possibly a mistake since you hear it overflowing as you walk out the door. Your parents never shared this loft. Freddie having landed it during your freshman year in college when his wife was six years dead, yet signs of your mother are much in evidence. Not only does her old walnut desk occupy a prominent space in the sitting area, but her incense burner, ink bottles, rhyming dictionary, and collection of photographs of Dylan Thomas still sit atop it as if waiting her return. Despite your need to get on with a night's precarious enterprise, you pause there for a moment or two before rejoining Belford and Freddy. The men have scarcely advanced beyond the entranceway, but they appear to be enjoying each other's company, quickly establishing one of those relationships based on jocular disagreement, common among males and virtually non-existent among women. They have, in fact, traded propaganda. Freddy pressing a radical anarchist pamphlet upon Belford, who has countered with some sort of Lutheran tract. Squeak! You all in black, baby, looking fine. Make me happy to see you dressed so black. Yes, Papa, I guess we've taken to shopping in the same boutiques. He grins at this. Although, in truth, the belt that holds up your jeans cost more than Freddy's entire ensemble, turtleneck to sandals. Uh, there is a distinct possibility, however, that money is still owed on the belt. We hate to hit and run, Papa, but you're splitting already? We were passing by and saw your light and just ran up to say hi. Belford shoots you a puzzled, almost accusatory glance. It's pretty late. Night time to right time, Squeak. Course you gotta go your job in the morning. Yeah. Okay. But you remember this, baby. The flute invented before the wheel. Really, Mr. Matty, asks Belford. I wasn't aware of that. Freddy is intimating that art is fundamentally more necessary to humankind than commerce or industry, a recurrent theme with him. You're the musician, Papa, not me. That's right. I don't forget your singing lessons. You both laugh at the dumb memory. Anyway, you got your fingers on the frog skins. You freeze. The look you give your father is not unlike the look you received from Larry Diamond that evening three days ago when you naively called him a bozo. Bozo as in clown. What do you mean by that? You implore warily. Frog skins. Does the old man know something? Noticing the shift in your mood, Freddy hastens to explain that frog skins is a slang expression. That's street talk, he says. Street talk for money, dollar bills. He is pleased and Belford puzzled to see that you are relieved. The three of you are silent for a while. Andre is mostly silent as well. Then you consult your watch and nod in the direction of the door. Take care of yourself, Papa. Impulsively you hug him. I love you, you whisper. Ah, Gwendolyn, it has been years since you have said those words to your dad. To anyone. Perhaps you say them now because you are going away and are uncertain when or if you will return. You come back soon, Freddy says. Bring your Christian friend, huh? I introduce him to God's great gift, Saint Pot. <laughs> or bring that monkey with you, huh? That monkey a trip, man. You are a quarter of the way down the stairs when he calls. And hey, next weekend I be at that new Vietnamese joint, the Vomit Club, huh? <laughs> gigging with Electric Baby Moses and his golden helicopters, yeah. And also the Spanish flies. You don't want to miss that one. I leave your name at the door. They make them banana daiquiris, man. The monkey like that shit. <laughs> Belford stops and turns, most likely to explain that his monkey is a born-again monkey. But you nudge him on down the steps. 2.29 a.m. Standing in a lurid cloud of dragon breath, the combined neon exhalations of a half-dozen Chinatown facades, Belford looks confused and a tad leery. It's time to go home, he says in a flat tone. I'm tired. It's been an unusual weekend. Huh, you think. You don't know the half of it. 
Well, Belford, honey, the unusualness is not over yet, but it will be very soon, for you, at any rate. I can't understand what you're talking about. I'm wiped out. Here, I'll drive. You and Andre climb in the back. He does as he is told, and you race eastward on Jackson, wheel to the north on Boren. This isn't the way home, whines Belford, and stop at a convenience store on Broadway, where you purchase two popsicles and one of those crusty, sugar-frosted little pocket pies manufactured on the assembly lines of the hostess company. You deposit the bag of goodies on the floorboard by your left foot, whereupon Andre, smelling the treats, sets up a slobber-jabber. Why can't he have them now? asks Belford. Because he hasn't earned them yet. We've got enough welfare gigolos in this town. If Andre wants to eat, he has to pull his weight. Belford looks around. Ooh, where are you taking us, Gwen? To a nice hotel. Hotel? We can't. Of course we can. 2.47 a.m. Notorious crop raiders in their native land, Barbary apes are dexterous enough, opposably thumbed enough, to pluck grapes off the vine or pick up kernels of spilled corn. This species of macaque also possesses cheek pouches in which it may hoard a private stash of food. Andre's pouches seem ample, all right. They did once conceal the entire contents of the Sultana of Brunei's jewel box, yet you wonder if they can accommodate something as long and inflexible as the device you have just removed from your purse. Will you please tell me, Belford demands, what in God's dear name is going on here? You have parked the Lincoln on Terry Avenue across from the Sorrento Hotel, parked it, in fact, in the exact space where you and Larry Diamond earlier in the day had enjoyed full-fledged sexual congress in an automotive enclosure so small that no two circus clowns, those who fit thirty to a midget car, would so much as attempt it. Love makes the world go round, it's true, but lust stops the world in its tracks. Love renders bearable the passage of time. Lust causes time to stand still. Lust kills time, which is not to say that it wastes it or wiles it aimlessly away, but rather that it annihilates it, cancels it, extirpates it from the continuum, preventing, while it lasts, any lapse into the tense and shabby woes of temporal society. Lust is the thousand-pound odometer needle on the dashboard of the absolute. You wish you could invoke some of that carnal de-escalation right now, wish you could re-enter the funky cocoon that you and Diamond spun around each other, the sexually generated capsule that so effectively insulated you from the hungers of the clock. If your strategy stands any chance of working, then events are going to have to unfold with scrupulous dispatch, for a time factor is involved, closure imminent, and not a resin bead of lust left to embalm the minutes or slow the march. With the lime green felt tip marking pen that you bought at the pharmacy, you paint your mother's old white rubber enema nozzle. The result resembles jade to the approximate degree that recent presidents have resembled statesmen, and in this light, color is probably academic anyhow. But Congo Vandenboss is reported to have trained his simian assistant with visual aids, and considering that this caper is sketchy at best, you want to leave as little as possible to chance. Now what are you doing? asked Belford. Stealthily, you slip out of the car and open the rear door. Come on, Andre, come with Auntie Gwen, honey. We're going to have us some fun. You grasp the monkey's paw and draw him outside. His buggy orange eyes are on the goodie bag. Not yet, Andre. Quiet now. Belford, you come too. You told me once how Congo used to do this, but I'm not sure I have it right. You lead Andre across the deserted street. Flabbergasted, Belford hurries after you. He catches up with you at the foot of the fire escape, the last rung of which is a full yard above your head. What the heck? After showing Andre the newly decorated nozzle, you point up the fire escape. You remove a popsicle and the little apple pie from the bag, offer them to Andre, then when he reaches for them, snatch them back again. 
Again, you point up the fire escape. You press the nozzle into his tiny fingers. How alive they feel, how nimble and strong. Help me, Belford, we need to get him onto the fire escape. Belford is dumbfounded. Are you crazy? What do you think you're doing? Your voice is so tinkly and high and sweet, it could be the little pie talking. I'm sending Andre up to the penthouse to fetch me something. Oh, you're not. Are you out of your mind? Get back in the car. Easy. Take it easy. It's only a prank. What kind of prank? A funny, harmless prank. I want Andre to go up and bring down an enema nozzle. Once more, you jiggle the treats under the macaque's nose, draw them away, point toward the penthouse. You are counting on the fact that your alleged fiancé, having been occupied with a wild goose chase around San Francisco, is unaware of the nature of Motofusa Yamaguchi's cancer cure. Why? Why would you want... Is this some kind of silly scavenger hunt or something? Visibly shaken, Belford is trying desperately to give you the benefit of the doubt. It's a joke. On who? Um, an acquaintance of mine. Mr. Adventure? Well, yeah, if that's what you call him. He's leaving the country at 6 a.m., as I said, and I'm playing a little joke on him. Not with my Andre, you're not. Honey? If you want to play some smutty bathroom joke on your, your friend, just go right ahead. But you leave my Andre the heck out of it. He doesn't do this. Come on, Belford. It's nothing but a little piece of hard rubber. With one of your gnawed nails, you tap the enema nozzle, secure now in the monkey's paw. You point up the fire escape. It follows your gesture. No, it doesn't matter if it's an enema nozzle or the Hope Diamond. It's stealing either way. It took me years to correct the bad habits that evil criminal taught this innocent animal. I won't have you corrupt him again. I won't. Andre! Belford starts to reach out for his pet but his great padded hands have barely left his side before the monkey leaps up onto your shoulders, giving you an instant crick in your neck and catapults itself onto the fire escape. Stop, yells Belford. Andre, come down here. Hush, you'll wake up the whole damn hotel. Yeah, I will wake up the whole dang hotel. I'm gonna start yelling for the cops if you don't put a stop to this right now. Andre! The monkey stays put. You rub your aching neck. Belford is coming apart like a double wide in a tornado. I'm calling somebody! With the unconscious agility of a gunfighter, you flash your hand into your purse and yank out the canister of mace. Before your rational mind can get its pants on, you have positioned the spout nine inches from Belford's face. Your finger is on the trigger. One more sound out of you and I'll blast you into a goddamn amoeba. I'm serious, Belford. I'll turn you to jelly. The moon has set. Terry Avenue is as dark as a river. So still is the night you can hear your pulse pound, hear the breath stoppered in Belford's lungs. The two of you stand as if transfixed by a clap of psychic thunder. Slowly, the disbelief in Belford's eyes changes to pain and disappointment. Were it not for your pulse, you feel you could hear his heart breaking. He is a strong man who grew up roughly. It occurs to you that he could slap you dead, maybe even before you could fire the mace. This stuff can buckle a bear, you warn him. But he isn't going to hit you. His hands hang at his side like disenfranchised puppets. His breathing is as pent as home brew in a crock. He begins shaking his head from side to side. And with each cumbrous vacillation, the hurt in his face widens like an incision. Gradually, feebly, you relax your grip on the mace. You let the canister fall to the sidewalk. It clatters there and rolls into the gutter. You couldn't go through with it. No matter the stakes, you simply couldn't do it. Damn it all. Damn it to marginal hell. What's the matter with you, Squeak? Still an amateur? When the jumbo chips hit the table, you folded like a Mexican road map. What are you going to do now? 2.59 a.m. Tears are blistering your eyes like some chicken pox of failure. 
some herpes of rage and capitulation. Before the first sob rocks your sugar bowl titties, however, Belford spins on his heavy heels and walks away, and keeps walking. Walks right across Madison and on down Terry, walks southward away from the Sorrento Hotel, away from the hospital, walks into the neighborhood occupied by buildings belonging to the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Seattle, a leafy, sedate area even darker and quieter than where you stand now. Soon he is but a silhouette, a shadow receding into more ponderous shadows. There are no restaurants or service stations down those stodgy blocks, no telephone booths, no private homes even. Where is he going? Why is he going? Has he snapped? Have you broken him? You feel your sneakers starting to shuffle in his direction. For whatever reason, and it would be simple-minded to attempt to paste a single label on the emotions involved, you are about to run after him. But then, above the surf of your pulse, through the machinery of your sobs, you hear yourself being paged. It isn't your name that you hear. It isn't even a word, exactly. No, it's more of a cross between a grunt and a chirp, as if the bluebird of happiness were excreting a prune pit. The noise is originating over your head, and it is indisputably intended to get your attention. 3.02 a.m. In the discreet light that seeps from the Sorrento's hallways, you see Andre poised at a second-story window, an imploring look on his mug, the tip of your mother's enema nozzle protruding from his lips like one of Clint Eastwood's cigarillos. Unless you are terribly mistaken, he is requesting your instruction. You glance back down Terry Avenue. Belford's sorrowful shadow has merged with the night. You look up again at Andre. He is growing impatient and commencing to fidget. Suddenly your pulse changes tempo. Your sobs dissolve. The ache in your neck sprouts goosebumps. Okay, well, all right then. Making an upward motion with your hands, you direct the monkey to climb higher. It responds immediately. In the bat of a lash, it is at the third-story window, fully prepared to lift it open. So this is how Congo did it. Okay, all right then. You signal Entree to continue his ascent, and the next thing you know, he has stationed himself outside the fourth-floor fire exit. Geez, if monkeys were bellhops, it wouldn't take so long to get room service. This is a breeze. You signal him to keep climbing. Your spirits climb with him. The macaque is on the sixth level, and you are just raising your hands to wave him on up to the penthouse when you hear the siren. In the sky, you detect the reflected whirl of red lights. It is not your imagination. The siren squalls louder. The lights flash brighter. It's the cops. Damn that Belford. Damn his treacherous Lutheran soul to hell. They are bearing down on you, and there is no place to hide. This, on top of your tactless lapses at the disco, you, little woman, could end up having to do some very fancy talking to avoid wasting your peak earning years watching the paint peel on a jailhouse wall. You may have been vexed in the past, you may have been embarrassed, but that was a paler shade of zip compared to the vexation and embarrassment rising in you now. But it isn't the police. It's an ambulance. It red balls and wabas right on past you, freighting yet another package of damaged urban meat to the emergency room at Swedish Hospital. You pull the wooden stake out of your heart and kindle a fire with it to defrost your spine. Jesus Christo, Cesar Romero, that was a scare. It wouldn't surprise you to learn that your hair has turned completely gray. But something is protecting you, some guardian spirit. Your mother, maybe, who spied you grieving at her desk tonight, or Grandma Matty or Q. Joe Huffington, both of whom are on speaking terms with the spirit world, or Larry Diamond, who has managed to get himself face down in the saucer of otherness and who can jimmy the lock on your dreams. Or maybe it's just that bruised angel who plays goaltender on God's hockey squad. At any rate, kiddo, you are saved and back in business. Or are you? When you return your attention to the fire escape, Andre is nowhere to be seen. 3.06 a.m. 
nowhere. The monkey is gone. As near as you can ascertain in this dimness, the seventh floor window is shut. Did Andre open it? Then close it behind him? Could Congo Vandenboss have trained him that thoroughly? You have heard far fetched stories about his skills. Or did he simply climb on up to the roof? Perhaps he's up there now, scampering about, doing his Freddy Matty dance of life among the ventilation bonnets. Or there is the possibility, definitely not to be dismissed, that he has run off again, that, chasing the melody of his own bent trumpet, he is fleeing across the rooftops of Seattle, consulting the ancient constellations that will guide him back to the wilds of his birth. Over the years there have been such frequent, dramatic fluctuations in the Barbary ape population on the Rock of Gibraltar that a legend was spawned about an underground passageway between Gibraltar and North Africa, a hidden tunnel known only to the macaques. Still, other Gibraltarians postulated that the monkeys were secretly amphibian, and that on moonless nights, such as this one, they would slip into the sea and swim the nine or so miles across the strait. Is Diamond aware of this tale, you wonder? Has he stirred it into his nomo mix? Minutes pass. Your pulse speeds up its drumbeat. In your bladder, there is so much pressure that your legs feel as if they are wrapped in a rug. You glance around for a place to pee, just in case, but no spot looks promising, so you stand there in your black clothing, craning your sore neck to keep watch on the penthouse. Between the rich boys and the monkey, your neck has been turned into a bus stop on the random violence line. More minutes go by. You check your Rolex. Nervously, and with a urine damming up in you like a phantom pond, you walk to the corner near the hospital. Through the budding branches of a maple, you notice a fat star, the same star, you believe, that a gutter astronomer sold to you as Sirius, Sirius A. It seems bigger, hotter than it did a couple of nights ago. No telling where a star such as that might lead a wandering ape. A car door slams. You nearly jump out of your jeans. At the emergency room loading platform, an engine cranks. You perform a stiff pirouette and start back toward the hotel. The mailbox on the corner is laughing at you. Over your shoulder, you see the ambulance glide away from the receiving dock. You quicken your pace and cross the street. When the ambulance passes, you want to be out of view. You drop to one knee and let the Lincoln shield you from the street. The ambulance rolls by slowly its lamps and sirens as peaceful as drunks who have finally passed out or hyenas who have howled themselves to sleep. You hear it break at the Madison Street stop sign, shift gears, and continue on its way. When at last you stand, Andre is standing beside you. 3.28 a.m. So much for born again, unless it is another example of thrice-born, the sinner who finds Jesus, then due to boredom, embarrassment, education, or need, enthusiastically and without regret resumes his sinful ways. In any event, the manner in which Andre is clapping his paws together, bobbing his head and peeling his lips back to exhibit every last molar in a vulgar monkey grin, all this before you have awarded him his ices and pie, would indicate that he is thoroughly delighted to be thieving again and bombastically proud that he has thieved so well. You are proud and delighted yourself, scarcely believing that you have actually pulled it off. Perhaps your luck is changing, and the second and third phases of your program shall meet with similar success. All the way down I-5 and route to the airport, having decided against cruising the neighborhood for Belford on the grounds that the search would impede your progress and nothing positive would result from intercepting him, you pick up the nozzle, replace it on the seat beside you, pick it up again. You twirl it in your fingers, test its weight in your palm, hold it aloft so that the shine of oncoming headlamps simultaneously penetrates its crystalline tip and bounces off its jadeite stalk. Heavier than it looks, the nozzle is leaden with the ancient weight of idols. As slick as a bloody quill, as haughty as an unpaired chopstick as elemental as honeycomb. 
It has the character of molten ritual, cooled through the palpitating centuries into a frozen ray of primal function. Conduit of lotus-scented waters, hard little harpoon for an empress's gastric leviathans, polished root from a Chthonian garden, it has, when you hold it against the light, the distant dignity and grave passion of a pale green star. It is not until you consider more explicitly how and where it has spent the majority of its existence that you lay it down and leave it down and wipe your hand on your jeans. How chivalrous and gross of Andre to carry such a thing in his mouth. Monkey, you're incredible. I'm serious, honey, you're the best. We make quite a team, huh? You and Auntie Gwen are the hottest mergers since RJR and Nabisco, frankly speaking. <laughs> you in tone, imitating Diamond's mannered drawl. Mr. Dunn doesn't deserve the talents of you and me. Andre emits a mini-screech, prompting you to glance over your shoulder in a naive attempt to see if he is agreeing, objecting, or merely reacting to his master's name. Of course, Mr. Dunn doesn't care about us both very much. A wave of emotion precipitates an annoying cramp in your larynx. When you recover, you say, I'm sorry, but at the airport I'll have to shut you in the trunk again. Now don't get mad. It's a big, roomy trunk this time. And it's for your own good. I won't be long. Famous Last Words 4.39 a.m. Since higher physics regards time as relative, it might be possible to demonstrate to Einstein's satisfaction that the intervals between your entering the near-empty terminal, taking along overdue pee, and rousing proper assistance from dozing clerks at two separate ticket counters were actually short intervals. Time is relative to the motion of the observer, after all, and, as a dead man, Einstein is either in the ultimate stationary position or else has condensed into pure energy traveling at speeds near the limits of light. But from your own more vital perspective, events at the airport proceeded so slowly that you lost all of your temper and most of your mind. Diamond has a six o'clock flight, which means he must check in at this same airport at about 5.15, which means he must leave Thunderhouse not much later than 4.45. You had planned to call him on the Lincoln Cellular Unit on your way back into town, but now you dare not delay. A public phone in the terminal lobby will have to suffice. You punch in the number, hold your breath as it rings, and hold your ear when an explosion of static almost blows a receiver out of your fist. 4.40 a.m. The interference clears, and you catch up with Diamond in mid-sentence. Out behind the barn, just remember this, chums. The picture doesn't know who painted it. The story doesn't know who's telling it. And the economy has no idea who or what economists are, let alone bookies and bean counters. What you get is what you bring, and it's all a flying fuck at the moon. Don't bother to leave your name, number, or time that you call, because Uncle Larry is... Larry? Larry, please, pick up the phone. It's me. You're still home, aren't you? Larry, it's... Click. Pussy fricassee, yes. How genial of you to check in. Is he being sarcastic? Between the static on the line and his customary menacing intonations, it's difficult to tell. At least you reached him... Yeah, well, I thought I'd call to say goodbye. I guess you'll be heading out very soon? Indeed. Uh, is Twister driving you? Yes, and it should be interesting. I don't believe he's been behind the wheel in a year or more. If my scooter had held together another day, I wouldn't have to trouble him. I'm not troubling you, am I? What are you doing awake at this hour? Going to the disco? Old fire horse can't resist the ding-dong. Aching to run the gauntlet of crutches. Scour the wreckage for a sign of Father Tapeworm gaze one last time into the cash drawer of his eyes. Normally you might have been put off by his verbal excesses, as hypnotic as they can be, but through the crackle and sting of static, you can detect a fever in his voice. Something irregular, alien, 
His illness must have worsened in the night. I haven't been to sleep, you say rather weakly. Ah, my suspicions confirmed. When I couldn't reach you via the usual telecommunicative hardware, I labored in vain to intrude on your dreams. I'd either lost the knack or you weren't dreaming. I suppose I should be pleased it was the latter. You tried to call me? More times than I care to admit. Are you informing me you were in receipt of none of my bulletins? Uh, uh, no, I've uh, been out driving around, thinking. Your voice brightens. But listen, Larry, I have a present for you. A very good present. A very, very good present. I took it out to SeaTac and left it at the Delta ticket counter with your name on it. Please, please be sure to pick it up. It's important, okay? Certainly, I wouldn't miss a chance to be surprised. As slight as that chance might be. We'll see, won't we? But this surprise, Larry, you must not open it until you get to Africa. You must not. Promise? Very well, I suppose that's a treaty I can sign. In your mind's eye, you try to imagine the look on his face when he finds the jade nozzle in his possession. The vision prompts you to blush, although neither at the intrinsic nature of the instrument nor from the modesty at the extremity of your generosity. Rather, you are reliving the moment in the ladies' room here at SeaTac when you removed your underpants and swaddled the nozzle in them an exceedingly bold gesture. For you are convinced that sooner or later, once he has rebounded from the shock of their contents, he will bury his perverted nose in them. That will teach him to question your adventurousness. How could a woman, he had asked, be so prim about sex and still be so sexy? Prim? Ha <laughs> ha! Smell these. As for the nozzle itself, once he has made use of it, you included in the panty pack the jar of beta carotene that you purchased at the all-night pharmacy, the brown rice and coffee he can acquire in Africa, he is certain to mail it back to Dr. Yamaguchi. There is no chance that Diamond will keep it and try to profit from it. The possibility of ransom flittingly crossed your mind, you must confess, but hey, you aren't that kind of girl. Besides, you have other avenues now to financial recovery or one other avenue. So, Larry, I... I guess you're out of here. Pardon? A rips off static had chewed off the end of your remark. I said, I guess you aren't having any second thoughts about Timbuktu. Surely you jest. <laughs> Only a fool wouldn't have second thoughts about Timbuktu. In addition, I'm having second thoughts about deserting America at this particularly pandemoniacal moment. But things are a mess. Yes, yes, I believe I just indicated as much. <laughs> Isn't it grand? A gentleman named Horace Walpole once wrote that the world is a comedy to those who think, a tragedy to those who feel. Extrapolating, we can say then, that to the whole person, the person with a balanced view, the world is tragic comedy. Ah, uh, but virtually nobody in America thinks anymore, and nobody feels much either, beyond anger and resentment that they haven't been cut a wider slice of that prodigal pie that they've been deluded into believing not only exists, but is rightfully theirs to share, regardless of their talents or virtues. What can you say about a population to whom the world is neither comedy nor tragedy, but a sporting match in a seedy and extremely noisy arena, a littered rink where they might score if they're lucky or shrewd or ruthless enough, or go completely numb if they fail? Still, that's the roar. America has a roar, an edge you won't find in tired old Europe or fatalistic old Asia. Given a choice between our barbarism and their ennui, Uncle Larry will choose the barbarism every time. From what I hear, there's no shortage of barbarism in Africa. Well, you hear correctly. 
the average African today, for any number of regrettable reasons, is as far removed from the complex and glorious metaphysical systems of his or her ancestors as the average Greek hawking souvlaki on a polluted street corner is removed from the Eleusinian mysteries or the Oracle of Delphi. One difference, though, is that in Africa, for the quester, most of the major stones remain unturned. Right, and turns unstoned, frogs unlicked. Now, pussy friend Japani, don't try to trivialize my journey. I don't think it's trivial. I think it's insane. Diamond allows a barrage of electrical flatulence to run its course before he responds. Yes, some people calls it madness, if I may once again quote Mr. Calloway. But if the majority ignore the rip in the fabric of consensual reality, and a few recognize it, ponder it, take it into account, then might I be excused for wondering who's truly mad, the many or the few? Nothing will do for Uncle Larry but to part that rip. Mind you, he's not boasting that he's going to attempt to squeeze through it. Once he gets a better look into the breach, he may back off like a lecher with heartburn or spring for the hills like an eight-point buck on the first day of hunting season. But at least he'll know. My aim, if that's not too precise a term, is to relocate outside the bounds of control and definition. Even when one is on the pad, control and definition labor tirelessly to erect their cast-iron grids around you. The possibility exists that even a periodic peek through the hole in the curtain will be sufficient to ward off their constrictions. Then I can proceed to the next step, should it strike my fancy. And if the little monster in my rectum hasn't gobbled up my spark... I'm gladdened to inform you, Pussy Prosciutto, that I have a strong premonition that somehow I'm going to survive. Careful, Gwen. You would not want him to pick up anything about the nozzle on his annoying telepathic radar. In an effort to distract him, you go perhaps a bit too far. I hope with all my heart that's the case, you say. But don't forget you also had a premonition that you were going to see Kyujo. A weighty silence hangs on the line. You would figure that atmospheric interference had knocked out the connection, except that you can hear him breathing. You imagine that you can also hear him trembling, feel the heat of his fever through the phone. Did you have to discourage him quite so bluntly? You are searching for the phrases that will restore his hope without revealing the reason why such hope is entirely justified when he speaks again but in a voice that sounds as awestruck and wonderstruck as it is ravaged and frightened. I did see Kyujo. What? I've seen her. That's why I've been calling you all night. Where? When? For God's sake, Larry. Easy, Gwendolyn, easy now. You're going to have to brace yourself for this. Brace you do as if in preparation for a devastating punch, but there is nothing in this world that can prepare you for what Larry Diamond has to tell. Speaking as if in a twitch-ridden trance, he relates how, when he left you in the bowling alley parking lot last evening, he went directly to his bathroom inside Thunder House to apply more of the Native American herbs. He had just finished and was washing his hands when there was a flash, followed by a crack and a pop, like a paparazzo having his camera smashed by an irate celebrity. And the lights in Thunderhouse dimmed, blinked out, and, after a few seconds, came back on. The atmospheric interference of the past few days had already precipitated several brief power outages, so he gave the matter little thought until he realized that the slide projector in the living room had been on ever since his presentation to you yesterday morning. The projector was buzzing more insistently than usual, like a shipwrecked blow-dryer surrounded by hostile cicadas, is how he puts it, so he hastened in to check for damage and to switch it off. The machine itself was unharmed, he says, but when I looked at the screen, there she was. Who? What do you mean? Your friend. 
he whispers, and you can feel him shudder. Up there, on the screen, in the picture, in the slide, posing with the faculty. Larger than life, if in Cujo's case that's not redundant. I told you that nothing surprises me anymore, but I guess I lied. 4.44 a.m. If this is your idea of a joke, even as you speak, however, you know he is not kidding. Hardly, you're the only person I dare tell. I haven't even mentioned it to Twister. Diamond pauses. You're thinking it was the fever or the medicine that I was hallucinating? Momentarily, I considered that myself. I ran into the kitchen and threw cold water on my face. After collecting my wits, I went back. And there she was, standing there in the midst of the shamans and soothsayers, just beaming, by the way, as if she was in her element and couldn't be happier. I watched the screen for uh, uh, probably ten minutes. She was definitely there. It was not an illusion. His sincerity does nothing to temper your incredulity. I'll have to see it to believe it, you say. Again he pauses. You can't see it. There is anguish and regret in his tone. Why not, if Kyujo's really in... Not anymore. There was another power outage. You may have noticed it. No, you were in bed bawling Belford. The lights went dark for about five seconds, and when they came back on, she wasn't in the picture anymore. Gone. Completely. I've been observing this slide off and on throughout the night. She hasn't reappeared. Larry. There's something else of interest, however. I reversed to the previous slide the group picture of the visiting faculty, and they're gone as well. The whole lot of them. There's nothing in the slide now but an empty courtyard. And that, Gwendolyn, you can see. I show you immediately. Had I the time. Yeah, but it's late. You've got to get to see Tack. If Diamond isn't joking, you think, and if he hasn't been tricked by medicine or drugs, then maybe he really is insane. And if he's crazy, maybe he murdered Kujo after all. As much as it distresses you, you have to reconsider that possibility. Yes, indeed. Twister's already gone out to start the car. He doesn't want to stay away from Thunder House any longer than necessary. Well, Larry... Listen, darling, I know it's a brainful, but don't worry about it, all right? We'll make sense of it when we're in Africa. And that won't be long. I should warn you, Pussy Kimchi, that things are a trace raggedy Andy and Molly. Infrastructure leaves much to be desired. The Bamako airport is bedlam night and day, and arrivals and departure schedules are made out of rubber. So, if for some reason I fail to meet your flight, grab a taxi to the Hotel Lamitié. I'll be registered there under the name of Mookie Blaylock. I see. Very well. Twister's honking. Sirius C is calling. I think I love you. Bye-bye. Bye, Larry. I think I care for you, too. 4.58 a.m. Did they come from the little acorn spring? George Washington's mighty teeth? Or like much early American furniture, were they planed from the trunk of a maple tall after the sap had gone? Red-eyed maple? Slippery elm? Knotty pine? Perhaps they were made of quaking aspen so as to bring the music of the riverbank to the daily chew. When he belched, Martha might have heard the wind in the willows. A sycamore serenade. Consider walnuts cracked by walnut, cherries pulverized by cherry, ash in the mouth before the pipe. Washington eating wood pigeon with wood teeth. Unable to taste the forest for the trees. Every beer would have been a root beer. His bark always worse than his bite. If Kujo was actually in that African slide, which it goes without saying she wasn't, you couldn't even begin to think about it. 
And if Diamond in some deranged state only imagined that he saw her, well, you can't think about that either. You won't allow yourself to think of any of it. There is too little time and too much at stake. You must avoid confusion, assail doubt, and proceed courageously and efficiently with the next phase of your grand strategy. As the Lincoln purrs northbound up the I-5 corridor at twenty times the speed at which its namesake, condition of teeth unknown, trudged to school through the Illinois sleet, you soothe Andre with his favorite French nursery song. Your baby doll voice seems to captivate him. Blossom dearie, eat your heart out. Singing it over and over while you conjure up images of balsa dentures that could be sailed around the White House dining room like toy eagles. At some point, Diamond Southbound will be momentarily parallel with you. But since you haven't a clue what sort of car Twister might own, and since Diamond is unfamiliar with the Lincoln, you are destined to pass like ships in the night. Rather, the dawn, for already you can detect a pale yellow thread unraveling, or raveling, in the seam of the horizon. You take the Mercer Street exit and drive along the shore of Lake Union toward the base of Queen Anne Hill. Shortly after exiting, you meet a motorcade of three BMW sedans and a black Ferrari traveling at great speed. The rich boys returning to affluent suburbs after a night of harassing the down and out. You flush with fury at the memory of their yanking your pants off, if in fact it was them. One more subject you must postpone thinking about until you are in clover. Because Belford may have reported the Lincoln stolen, Unlikely, but you cannot risk it. You park his car at your building and transfer the monkey and your bag of supplies to the Porsche. Remember this nice car, mon ami? You screwed it up royally with your stupid vitamins, but don't worry. Auntie Gwen forgives you. You don't have to ride in that nasty old trunk. Immediately after starting the engine, you hear a shout, and in the rearview mirror see a shadowy male figure dashing toward you. Without a second thought, you pop the clutch. For a second or two, he appears to be gaining on you. But once you are in the street, the Porsche makes a noise high in its throat, like an enraged Prussian baron about to run through his wife's lover with a saber, lays down twin streaks of that acrid testosterone jam that teenage boys love to spread on their asphalt, and leaves the pursuer behind. Probably it was poor Belford, but it just as easily could have been the safe-sex rapist. A girl can't be too careful. Making the Porsche bray and sway, you drive as fast as you think you can get away with without attracting undue attention, and after stopping briefly at Thriftway for one final requisition of banana popsicles, zoom off to Ballard and the Thunderbird Bowl. 5.25 a.m. The stock market is scheduled to open in 55 minutes. You wonder if it will. Crossing the Ballard Bridge, you switch on radio news, but so annoying is the static that you switch it right back off. What do you care about the market anyway? This day there is to be no Sears, Philip Morris, Merck, General Electric, no Westinghouse, Walt Disney, Procter & Gamble, no I.B. Um... This day there is to be Van Gogh. 5.27 a.m. After circling the bowling alley once, you park in the rear, that being the west side of the building, adjacent to the long, narrow, ground-level window on Twister's teepee. Get a grip on yourself, Andre. Be patient. You get to have some more fun, but it'll take me a minute. The macaque is all a flutter, though whether in anticipation of another heist or because you are withholding his treats, you cannot know. With an exacto knife, you trim a piece of heavy poster board until it forms a rectangle approximately 15 inches by 11. Then you go to work with a thick black crayon. You have had no formal art training, but your brother is a professional sculptor in San Francisco, and your mother had a talent for rendering in ink the mutilated unicorns and crumbling gravestones with which she often illustrated her poems so your genes have provided you a facile touch with a sketch. Obviously, nothing is required here beyond the crudest approximation of the original, merely enough of a resemblance to inform the little thief what he is to snatch, 
yet you tax your memory, you have only seen the drawing once, to position the figures correctly. And once you have smeared the copy with fingertip and spit, you fancy that your cartoonish peasants possess some of the coarse dignity with which Van Gogh endowed his originals. Your appreciation may be enhanced by the light, or rather the lack of it. The sky is all huckleberry and nasturtium, the color of God's linoleum, but it is not yet bright enough to permit clear vision. Here we go, baby. Please hurry, okay? You lead Andre to twist his window, wag a popsicle under his nose, and hand him the drawing. This is what Auntie Gwen wants. It won't fit in your cheek pouch, but you can do it. And hey, I'll pay extra for a rush job. Express, okay? Go! Now go! To be sure, Twister's window is shut and locked, but this monkey is supposed to be a master of the break-in, an animal criminal genius. You have every faith. Yet it is strained when Andre, after fiddling with the window for a while, lies down beside it and begins to whimper. Good grief. 5.38 a.m. You could smash the window glass with a tire iron or something. Your desire, however, is to have this look like an inside job. When Twister returns from the airport to find his precious drawing gone, he and the investigators will have scant choice but to blame Larry Diamond. They'll straighten it out in a few days, so no harm will be done, and by then you should be well beyond easy reach. That was the plan. Now, as desperation mounts, you look around for an object to heave through the pane. Voila! What's this in the weeds? A bowling ball! My, my, some low-class oaf with a marginal existence must have logged such a pitiful score that he threw his ball away in a fit of proletarian pique. You pick it up. Yick! It's filthy. And heavier than you had supposed. It's the first time in your life that you have ever handled one of these moons that orbit Milwaukee, and you suspect that merely lifting it has compromised your dignity and reduced your IQ. Straining to hold it away from your body, you walk toward the window. Suddenly, however, as if he has been struck by an actual thought, the monkey springs to his feet and commences to shinny up a drain pipe. He is heading for the rooftop, perhaps in search of a ventilation shaft. Okay, marvelous. This is more like it. You knew you could count on the simian scourge of the Cote d'Azur. You drop the bowling ball in disgust, massage your pained neck, and return to your car for the nerve-wracking wait. 5.44 a.m. The time is 5.44. Since you cannot conceive of there having been a prolonged farewell at SeaTac, it is reasonable to expect Twister within the next five or six minutes. To steady your emotional wobble and to prevent further gnashing of your bitten-down nails, you examine once more your packet of airline tickets, the fresh tickets that you acquired in the SeaTac exchange. Seattle to New York. Good. The flight leaves in a couple of hours. New York to Amsterdam. Excellent. If the Dutch industrialist was offering two million and change for the Van Gogh drawing, you certainly ought to be able to get half that from one of his fellow collectors. A little research, a little of your celebrated salesmanship. Bingo. You have allotted yourself a week. Then, Amsterdam to Manila. Perfect. Grandma Maddie will shelter you for as long as you might wish. Even if something has gone wrong and the authorities are after you, there is no extradition treaty between the United States and the Philippines. And once there, things could go very well indeed. In her last letter, Grandma Maddie wrote that there are a number of ambitious young politicians maneuvering to fill a power vacuum in the Filipino government. A young Filipina, as well-educated, moneyed, your grandmother believes you are prosperous, sophisticated, and pretty as you, your unfortunate Anglo nose is a flaw they could persuade themselves to overlook, would be a catch, a definite boost to their political aspirations. You might very well, she wrote, become the new Imelda Marcos. Personally, you would rather become the new Gwendolyn Maddy, but hey, the new Imelda Marcos has a prosperous ring. 5.50 a.m. Jesus, jumping Mary. Andre is back. 
You neither heard him approach nor saw where he came from. Twister's window remains closed and intact, but here he is, perched on the bumper that wraps around the bulbous Porsche like a licorice whip curved around an ostrich egg. At first you fear he must have failed to gain entry, but when he bounds backward off the bumper and launches into his spastic victory dance, your heart soars. But wait a minute. That prize he is waving above his head, as if it were a championship trophy at Wimbledon or something, it's too small to be the Van Gogh drawing. Too small, too small. It is, in fact, not much larger than a tarot card. Andre, you stupid beast! You jump out of the car. He surrenders his loot and searches for his sugary reward. You brush aside his paw. What the... It is a tarot card. One of the oversized ones that taromancers usually reserve for special occasions. You turn it over. At this point, what else can you do? Somehow you are not surprised that it's the fool. What does surprise you is that something appears to be written on it, a message, scrawled across the upper right corner, across the sovereign and paternalistic sun, across the innocent white rose, across the hermetic hobo bag in which are concealed, awaiting his recognition, all the things the fool might require to facilitate his skip into the waters of the wild unknown. In the weak dawn light, and with your weak vision, the message is difficult to read. Nevertheless, you squint and strain at it, for you can make out, to your supreme astonishment, that it is wrought in Q. Joe Huffington's wispy script and with Q. Joe Huffington's favorite silver ink. When it comes into sharper focus, this is what it says. See you in Timbuktu. Author's Note Readers desiring more detailed and scholarly information about the Bozo Dogon serious connection should consult Le Renard Paul by Marcel Griol and Germaine Dieterlin. Ethnoastronomy, the newest, oldest science by Verzig Domer. African Worlds by Daryl Ford. And especially The Serious Mystery by Robert K. G. Temple. Exhaustive dental research has led me to conclude that George Washington's false teeth were actually carved from hippopotamus, elephant, and walrus tusks. The teeth were attached to plates made of gold upper and ivory lower by wooden pegs the diameter of toothpicks, and it is probably those pegs that gave rise to the notion that Washington had wooden choppers. I feel compelled to report the facts in this matter, although personally I much prefer the apocryphal. Tom Robbins We hope you've enjoyed listening to this unabridged audio edition of Half Asleep in Frog Pajamas. Phoenix Books Library of Audiobooks includes hundreds of timeless works read by legendary stars of film, stage, and screen. And we are proud to be the home of the complete Library of Dove Audio, the renowned pioneer of audiobook recordings. Please visit our website at phoenixbooksandaudio.com as we continue to produce both remastered and newly recorded audiobooks. A final message to our listeners. Our authors and employees work really hard to create the works we publish. And let's be honest, digital audiobooks have become quite affordable. While we agree that money doesn't grow on trees, it's just plain silly to think that anyone would pilfer our stuff to save a few pennies when they risk being slapped with a copyright infringement fine large enough to drain the average piggy bank. Translated for you old school listeners, neither this recording nor any excerpt therefrom may be further duplicated, transferred, stored on a retrieval system, or sold by any means in any form without the express prior written permission of Phoenix Books. We vehemently protect our rights under copyright and will prosecute violators to the full extent of the law. Permissions requests and all other queries may be directed to us at info at phoenixbooksinc.com. 
Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.